thank you for joining us. Today we have a, um, a packed agenda and an exciting agenda to discuss um, um, an issue um, at the frontiers of um, digital um, financial services and the digitalization of the global economy. Um, I am now going to thank you. My name is Ricardo James, um, officer in charge of the OECS Competitive Business Unit in Dominica. Um, so we have a short opening and let me just invite Mrs. Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood, who is the Director of the Economic Affairs and Regional Integration Division from the OECS Commission to make some welcome remarks. Um, Ms. Flood, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. James. Good morning to you. Dr. Didikas Jules, Director General of the OECS Commission. Mr. Trevor Braffitt, Deputy Governor of the ECCB. Representatives from our valued partner agencies, distinguished panelists, speakers, presenters, and participants. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the opening of this digital payments webinar and exposition. This event is the first fruit of sorts of a project component that seeks to increase access to digital financial services in the OECS. Today's event focuses on digital payment solutions, which allows transactions to be conducted without the exchange of physical cash between a buyer and a seller. The importance and need for this capability have become acutely evident during the ongoing global pandemic of COVID-19 and the demands and imperative of social distancing and contactless commercial engagements to curtail the spread of the virus. But even before COVID-19, the digital transformation of business activities through electronic commerce with online purchases and payments using credit cards and various peer-to-peer -peer payment solutions used in digital money and mobile wallets have already, was already sweeping the world. In this regard, in order to remain competitive, as more and more consumers become aware and demanding of cashless payment options, OECS my, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises need to adopt these new digital payment solutions as part of the business operations. A key goal of today's activity is therefore to disseminate and increase awareness among MSMEs of the various solutions that exist in the OECS business environment. This we hope will accelerate the adoption of digital payments and other digital financial services by our businesses and will keep the region in step with the development in this digital age. We also hope to increase our understanding of the state of digital financial services and payment solutions in the OECS and thus identify the challenges and gaps and areas for further work in policy, legislation, regulation, and institutions to strengthen the enabling environment and the supporting ecosystem. And so I welcome all the MSMEs in the audience, as well as the financial institutions, such as the banks and the credit unions and the FinTech companies who will be participating in the discussions and presenting their digital payment solutions today. We are glad to be co collaborating with Compete Caribbean Partnership Facility in this endeavor. We are also pleased to work with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, which is a major mover in the advancement of digital financial services in the OECS. And we are thankful for the input of the International Trade Center in supporting us with, this valuable, with their valuable insights and knowledge from the work that they are doing in developing countries around the world. On behalf, therefore, of all those who have collaborated to make this event possible, I again welcome each and every participant to this informative, innovative, and transformative digital payments webinar and expo. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Flood, for those welcome uh, opening remarks. Now I would like to invite to uh, the floor Mr. Trevor Brathwaite, who is the Deputy Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, to make some remarks. Mr. Brathwaite. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, Dr. Dedicus Jules, Director General of the OECS. Uh, all colleague participants on this webinar. Um, I want to welcome all of you to this 
this web webinar this morning and thank Jackie for her opening remarks. Um, timely, and, and I think we are really on the cusp of, of something that is going to really change the, the way that we do business in this um, currency union in the OECS. Uh, as we know, we are living within the what can be termed the, the fourth in the industrial revolution. And it has uh, indicated the way that, and changed the way that we work and communicate. Even the example of these, uh, this webinar is, is at the forefront since the, um, on, on, since the pandemic uh, started last March. That is the way that we have been working. Um, I don't know if you can see my background. I don't have an exciting background as Mr. James, but this is the background of my office at work. Not at work, sorry, at home. So I've been teleworking um, thanks to the, the treasures of, of Zoom and webinar and all of these other new um, means of communication since March last year. And that has been my modus operandi. So I think in today's um, today's seminar, you're going to and webinar, you're going to really focus. We're really going to focus on uh, the way that we do business. Uh, right now, we can see that there is a fusion of technologies that is blowing lines between physical, digital, and other spheres. And this activity today illustrated the power of technology for us to meet across borders, as I indicated, without leaving our geographic location. And that is, that's the way of the world now. And uh, if you follow the, the latest news, you'll notice that that is how everyone is communicating uh, across borders um, and having an opportunity to meet virtually is, is now the order of the day. So that in itself presents um, a new opportunity uh, for all our, um, our citizens, our business persons, our, indi our individuals uh, who, of course, as Jackie indicated, more and more we're trying to see that we can rely less on physical money uh, and get into um, digitization, digital means of, of transactions. And I think there's a promise for our MSMEs to really participate and see what are the new vistas that they can explore in, in, in these new arrangements. So just a little bit about the payment system in the ECCU, perhaps that um, it will introduce the, um, the rest of the day's activities. The central bank is responsible for the payment system. Uh, we have legal oversight in the ECCU. Uh, to help us along with that, we have established an Eastern Caribbean Payment Council and the council, uh, which I have the privilege to chair, comprises representatives from the ECCB, consumer protection agencies, information technology systems, credit unions, and banks. And um, our council meets every quarter where we have a discussion on uh, what's happening within the, the payment space. Um, actually, to, today, today is the eve of the launch of our central bank digital currency, the Dcash, which uh, we will want to invite you to participate. You'll get a lot more of this, um, this new development in the presentation from our chair of our FinTech group, Ms. Powell, who I believe will be presenting um, right after the opening remarks. And that, in, in a sense, opens up the new vistas that we are thinking about in digital payments. So recent developments in the space, uh, payment wallets. Uh, I believe you have Mr. Alex Schron on the program who has a, a, a very exciting payment wallet that he has introduced in St. Kitts. Uh, as part of our work in the, in the payment space, we have introduced electronic funds transfer, which now enables uh, individuals and companies to transfer money um, at you know, usually large sums of money um, through the banking system electronically across the space and throughout the ECCU. And settlement is usually the same day settlement. Uh, a lot of institutions are using this facility now. Governments are now paying salaries 
uh, using the EFT platform, uh, social security systems, uh, paying out pensions using the EFT platform, and individuals are um, having the opportunity to, to transact business and individual payments across the space. So a transaction can occur in, for someone in Grenada from originated from St. Kitts uh, across that space and be settled same day. Um, so we do have the CBDC that um, will be explained. Our one is the Dcash. Um, the Bahamas have introduced um, sand, sand dollar and Jamaica just announced uh, this week that they are now inviting a, an IT firm to participate in their sandbox develop, to develop their own CBDC. They haven't given a name yet. I don't know if they'll call it the reggae dollar. I'm not sure. But um, that, that is a new development. And then you have M money and, of course, cryptocurrency, which is, um, in a sense, not, uh, it's a product um, like any other commodity and is not usually ranked in the lines of, of digital currencies um, as, as we know it. So I want to wish everyone the, and give everyone the opportunity mm -hmm. to participate in this uh, webinar this, today. I think it, as I indicated, opens up um, exciting vistas for what we can do um, and we can push the envelope, so to speak, in the way that we transact business, not with only within countries, but across the space. This is very important because we are transcending, transcending and geographic boundaries when we do so and opening up the opportunities for business to uh, really have the, the, the ability to transact business to customers that they're not usually um, accustomed to uh, and develop a customer base right across the region, which is excited for MSME. So thank you very much. And I wish all the best to the participants. To the, and I want to thank the OECS Commission for organizing this timely webinar and all, our, all the supporting institutions who have facilitated the, the, the webinar. And I want to wish everyone all the best for today's uh, deliberations. Thank you, Mr. James. Thank you very much, Mr. Brathwaite, for this um, comprehensive um, opening remarks. You really set the stage. You gave us a teaser of the work that ECCB is doing. Um, and I think as we go through the day, um, our MSMEs, um, as well as, you know, the financial institutions, the fintech companies, and the um, individual consumers and BSOs will, you know, get more information, would learn more about what is actually happening on the ground, what is soon to be happening, and where we can go forward with digital payment solutions and digital um, financial services um, on the whole. So thank you very much for your, for your remarks. Um, well, and my pleasure now is to invite the Director General of the OECS Commission, Dr. Lucas Jules, to give his welcome remarks. Dr. Jules. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Mr. Trevor Braffitt, Deputy Governor of the ECCB. Ms. Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood, our Director of Economic Affairs. Colleagues of Compete Caribbean, uh, the con our consultants, all old friends with new ideas. It really is a pleasure for me to offer these remarks at such a timely activity. Um, I, as you have heard from Mr. Braffitt today is the, the day before the launch of the Dcash by our central bank. And I really have to express our extreme pride, our deep pride with the work being done by the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank in the launch of that digital dollar. I, I had to react with some anger on LinkedIn the other day when I saw someone indicating that um, some other bank was the first to launch a, a, a digital currency. And I was very proud to indicate to them actually that the first central bank in the world to launch a digital currency of its own was is in fact the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. So this is going to be a huge game changer for us in the, particularly in the small business space. And um, it's, today's, today's activity is a small but very important step 
you know, our efforts at becoming more resilient, more adaptable and agile economies and societies in an increasingly disruptive and evolving environment and climate. Now, for us in the OECS, um, expositions is nothing new. For us in OECS, and in particular, our competitive business unit. However, this exposition is somewhat different because it focuses on an area that is still a new frontier for the OECS, as we are lagging behind other developed nations and we do need to catch up. In that sense, the Digital Ex Payments Expo is critical and timely because whether we like it or not, our economies are caught up in an increasingly disruptive and transformative global economy. And the only way that we can respond effectively is to adapt and in some cases to reinvent and in all cases become more agile in the process. The World Economic Forum has popularized the term that many of us are familiar with, the fourth industrial revolution, to describe this modern era where technological change is really driving advances in artificial intelligence, in robotics, in 3D printing, nanotechnology, quantum computing, to radically change the economic landscape for all human endeavors. The, one of the key aspects of these changes is digitization and the digital transformation of processes, networks, systems, and frameworks is in fact creating a new business landscape where buyers, suppliers, producers, and consumers can be connected over greater geographic locations and industries. So for example, small businesses in any of our member states can now access markets in any part of the world through digital platforms and deliver goods and services and deliver goods and services once they meet the requirements of the market. Digital finance and services play a major role in these developments. And I think all of us are familiar with Amazon. Uh, again, it's instructive because, you know, in this pandemic, Amazon profits have, you know, exponentially increased and um, more, more now than ever, people are using that Amazon platform in order to conduct business and purchase goods. So globally, digital payment solutions have been an important enabler of that type of commerce and trade. And emerging economies like India leading economies on, uh, in Africa have long realized the benefits of digital financial services. And there is increasingly widespread use of digital payment solutions. Some of these services include traditional credit and debit cards, as Trevor has mentioned, mobile wallets, mobile point of sale technology, internet banking, many of which you will see presented here today. In fact, I, I had the pleasure of being in um, Kenya just prior to the, the COVID lockdown. And it, I deliberately went out to the marketplaces, you know, the, the, the fruit market, the supermarkets, the mall, the shopping mall, to get a sense for myself of how M-Pesa, which is a widely used digital um, uh, platform for current, for payments, is being used in, um, in Kenya. And it was amazing to see farmers, people of all socioeconomic status, all professions using M-Pesa as a preferred um, uh, platform for transactions. The, the less, the, these tools have placed the power of commerce therefore in the hands of ordinary citizens. And the lessons of these emerging economies have showed us that the inclusive and equalizing power that digital trans technology can provide to ordinary citizens. We must learn from the successes of these emerging economies and therefore it is imperative that the OECS accelerate its thrust towards the digitization of our economies so as to accrue benefits to small businesses. And some of these benefits, as you've heard, include reductions in transaction costs, improved security, since people will be required to carry less cash and improve business efficiencies that will transform the lives of citizens throughout the member states. One of the strategic priorities of the OECS for the next six years is the reinvention of the regional economy. 
We believe that applying the advances in the technology of this era of Industry 4.0 include the digital transformation of the region, including the digital transformation of the region, is a key pillar of this goal, and it provides significant opportunities for, for, um, for, the, for the citizens of the region to improve their lives. In that regard, um, again, we, we congratulate ECCB for the milestone of in launching the digital currency pilot and the rollout of the, the, the DXCD tomorrow. This is an essential step to providing a framework that will propel the advancement of digital finance services in the OECS. The revised Treaty of Baste establishes the economic union as a single economic and financial space. And therefore we can see the development of regional frameworks for digital payments as a way to deepen the interaction and trade and foster participation in that regional economy. In fact, in many ways we can consider this digital, these digital payments to be the, 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 the roadway to movement and progress in the single economic space. The commission is happy for its partnership with the IADB through the Compete Caribbean Partnership Facility in this activity today. The specific objective being to increase the uptake of digital financial technology and services among OECS, MSMEs particularly, and in consumers in general. We really hope that the discussions and presentations from the banks and the fintech companies on their digital payment solutions today will showcase the power of digital payments and how to unlock the potential of these technologies for the growth and competitiveness of OECS businesses and our economies as a whole. In closing, I want to stress that we also recognize the importance of creating the enabling environment uh, through areas that have been often overlooked, the policy, the legislative, the regulatory, and the institutional reforms to support the adoption of the new industry 4.0 technologies and to ensure the security and safety of citizens and their information against the emerging threats and challenges of this era. Um, um, I wish everyone uh, every success in this workshop today, in, in these presentations. It is going to be a real eye-opener for us to see how we are able to utilize these platforms for the advancement of the economic union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, DG, for those, um, for those remarks. We really thank you very much for being here today. And I think also, um, along with Mr. Um, Brathwaite, um, have really yes, sir. the scope of yes, sir. the issues that we are going to be discussing, the challenges that we face, but the opportunities also that um, you know, are before us um, in utilizing um, digital payment solutions and digital financial services. That brings us to the end of the opening, this brief opening of today's um, event. And we are now going to transition. And again, let me just welcome all who have joined us since we started. Um, we see the numbers growing and we just want to thank you for being here um, today. Um, we have a number of um, exciting um, and important presentations for you. Um, discussions, interactive discussions, as well as um, a peek into an exposition by some of the digital um, payment solution providers that are operating in the OCS, what are they offering um, to you as consumers, both MSMEs and individual consumers alike. But right now, it would be- uh, Mr. James, before you before you move in to the other presentation, I noticed some, some um, questions came up in the Q&A, uh, particularly about legislative- um, uh, Yes, I saw those. Um, do you want to address- So I know, I just want, yeah, I just want to, um, assure uh, colleagues that uh, right now there is what we call the, East, the Eastern Caribbean Payment Systems Act, which is existing. It's old, but it's still there. It was one that started uh, when we were moving into the automated clearinghouse. 
Uh, under the um, Caribbean Digital Transformation Project, um, we have now, I think, uh, approved or about approving a legislative draft person to uh, modernize that piece of legislation. Um, and so we hope that that would enable the legislation to capture some of the more modern or the recent developments um, in, in the digital payment space. Um, so that is one thing to look out for. And what we try to do at the, at the ECCB is to have uniform legislation. So um, our experience is that with uniform legislation um, and in recognition of the single financial space that we are in and the single economic space that we are in, that we needed to have legislation that is um, you know, agnostic to borders. So we are moving in that direction uh, with a regional approach to um, legislation in the payment system. And then we have drafted, and there should be um, pretty soon, a um, approval at, in our parliament of a virtual assets bill, um, which now will take care of the Bitcoins, the, the, um, all, all the other products that um, persons have been pushing in, in, in this part of the world. Our, our, um, our effort is not to stifle innovation, but to have a legislative environment that protects, as the DG said, to protect the interests of our citizens uh, in the space. Um, so you need to have the legislative backbone in order to have certain protections in the space. So these are um, the developments that are on their way. Um, I believe in most of our countries, uh, the draft virtual access bill is with our attorney general, um, attorney general chambers for consideration and for um, putting them in parliament. Um, St. Kitts, I believe, have already passed this 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 version of the of the virtual assets bill, and we hope that um, all our other eight ter territories can um, push these legislations through the parliament. So I just wanted to. I indicate that yes, there is a consideration for um, legislation uh, to support the efforts within the space. Thank you, Mr. James. No, thank you, uh, Mr. Bracket, very much for for those um, those responses. And just to note um, to all those um, in attendance, um, we have a question and answer um, box where you can place your questions, and we will do our best to. Um, transmit that to the, the moderator um, so that we can get some answers to those questions um, during the panel discussions and also from the presenters that we're going to receive presentations from at this stage. So right now, as I said, we're going to get um, three presentations that really are going to set the stage for our discussions today. Um, we will have a presentation, and these presentations will give um, information on um, digital financial services and digital payment solutions as they are operating, or the state of that in the OECS and the CARICOM, the Caribbean um, region wide. We'll also get a perspective of um, work that has been done um, globally among developing countries um, from the International Trade Center. And we're going to start off with a presentation from the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, um, who's going to present, as we heard already, um, tomorrow is a big day for the ECCB, um, where they're going to be launching the DXCD or the DCASH. And so Ms. Charmaine Powell um, is going to make this presentation now. So I will now invite um, Ms. Shamin Powell. Our presentations will be 10 minutes, after which we will have um, question and answer. So we will take questions. So as the presentations are going, please do place your questions in the Q&A box, um, um, and we will transmit that to the, um, to the presenters um, for response. Of course, we have limited time, so we may not be able to answer all your questions. But we will record those questions and do our best to find a way to provide those responses to you. So now I invite um, Ms. Powell to the floor from the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Good morning, Mr. James, and thanks for the invitation to present at this forum. Allow me to share my screen, please. 
you see you see my screen yeah. okay so good morning this morning i'm going to be providing an update on the bank's um dcash project which mr james indicated we launched tomorrow and basically um the dcash is what we call a safer faster and cheaper way to make easy payments and transfers and so in terms of what was the motivation behind this, this particular project and the objective of the project. So the, the, one of the objectives of the Dcash pilot project is for an improvement in the efficiency of our payment system. There are some um, frictions that we have recognized in the payment system um, in the ECCU in terms of speed, costs, um, even some in, in some instances safety as it relates to the use of cash. And so therefore our intention in, in terms of introducing the Dcash is to uh, address these fi frictions and prevent, present an alternative to the ECC citizens for greater payment system efficiency. We also want to um, improve the cross-border transactions. Right now, there are significant costs associated with the making payments from one ECC country to the, to the other. And so we are hoping that a Dcash, our intention is that a Dcash solution would, he would help to reduce, um, significantly reduce these costs but for the purpose of the pilot, it's not it's free, but even post pilot, that the cost associated with the cash will be significantly lower. And so cross border transaction will be much easier. And ultimately, we're looking to see a at least a 50% reduction in the use of cash by the year 2025. Another key objective of this project is the whole issue of digital in, uh, financial inclusion, sorry, by digital enablement. So we recognize that across the ECCU, there are persons who may not have bank accounts or even persons who do have bank accounts are unable to enjoy the, the benefits of digital payments. And so we wanted to ensure that every single citizen in the ECCU is able to be part of that digital sphere, the digital space that we're trying to create as we move to digital transformation in the region. We want to make sure that all citizens have, have full access to financial services, and particularly those that are in the digital realm. Um, things as simple as paying your bills online. There are a number of persons who still have to stand in, la in long lines in the establishment because they don't have a debit card or credit card or some other digital form of payment. Uh, we, the Dcash offers that facility where once the merchant offers that online payment facility, and persons have Dcash, they can actually use the Dcash to make online payments and avoid having the long lines in the establishment. And thirdly, we want to promote innovation and competitiveness. So by having this Dcash where you have easier payments, your, your, your marketplace automatically becomes bigger. You can, you, can have, you can have transactions across the ECCU. And you, that also helps to enhance regional coordination and ultimately in, increase economic economic activity across the ECCU. So these are some of the key objectives that we had in mind when we actually launched the Dcash project um, towards the overall development of the ECCU and the advancement of the ECCU um, population. So what are some of the key considerations in actually the design of the Dcash? Data privacy was one of our key concerns. As we did our early um, consultations with various focus groups, we recognized that persons had a very we're very concerned about the privacy of the data, particularly in this um, digital era where the whole issue of cybersecurity, cyber attacks, hacking, etc., have become the no seem to have become the norm. Persons were concerned: how secure is my information? How secure is my data? And so, in developing the Dcash solution, that was one of our key considerations, both in terms of the information that is stored on the blockchain, it is encrypted end to end, and there are certain other controls we've put in place. We've gone to great lengths to make sure that the security features of our Dcash solution is such that persons can have the confidence that their data is private and secure. Um, network security um, is twinned with the data privacy. So, if this network is secure, then the data will be secure. So. Basically, we would have um, thought about these things and made sure that we, we have even redundancies in place. We've had um, industry best practices as we sought to um, secure the network. And that was one of the, um, the, the reasons behind our choices for using the um, hyperledger fabric. And we have a permissioned um, solution where everybody on the network is known. And that adds to the security of the network. So you know who all the players are in the event that there's a dispute, in the event that you need to um, there's a query, you know who, and they have to be authorized to use the network. So that's part of the security that we've added to the whole solution. 
the availability of Dcash is another key consideration, recognizing that we were trying to, you know, objective for financial inclusion. Part of the of that consideration was that the Dcash had to be readily available. So whereas persons who may have um, registered based wallets or have accounts with financial institutions and on board with their financial institution, those persons who didn't have those accounts or didn't have a financial institution with which to register and use a value based um, solution, they had to have ready access to the Dcash. So that it didn't make any sense having a wallet and can't fund your wallet. So having the availability of Dcash was a, another key consideration, which is why we're building out a network of tellers to ensure that persons can cash in and cash out their Dcash um, as necessary. Building a strong merchant database. That is one of the, I think, one of the key considerations or main considerations for this um, pilot to work. It's, um, persons can have Dcash in their wallets, but if there's no way to spend it, then it, it defeats the purpose. And so it is important across all the pilot countries that we have a, a wide range of merchants where persons would normally spend, and so they would have some way to actually spend their Dcash once they've acquired it. So building up a merchant database, understanding the peculiarities of persons spending, where they spend their cash, you know, where they, where they, where they frequently, where they frequent, that is important. So that when persons actually have the Dcash, they have some way to spend it. And then importantly, ease of use. Um, if persons can't use the Dcash app easily, it'll be a turn off and they will not be encouraged. So therefore we had to make sure that the Dcap, Dcash app was user friendly, and even in terms of our help, help, help desk, etc., it had to, our, our websites, it had to be that persons found it easy to use, and that would encourage continued use of the Dcash. In terms of some key features of the Dcash, now I'll just go through a few of them. There are quite a few features, but just to go through a few of them. Um, it is transmitted via smart devices, so it's an app downloaded to your smart device through which you access your Dcash, so your, your app. It becomes your wallet and you access your Dcash through that app. Um, the Dcash is issued by the ECCB and distributed by financial institutions. So similar to the physical cash, it is distributed by the ECCB, so it's minted and distributed by the, issued by the ECCB, sorry, and then distributed by the financial institutions across the member countries. The exchange rate remains fixed as with the physical loans, 2.7 to one US dollar. There is no change in exchange rate and the parity so the physical notes and coins is one to one. So the cash can easily be exchanged for physical notes or, and coins or bank deposits. So it's a, a one to one parity. You don't lose any value having the cash versus physical cash or ba bank balances. The, the it's a one to one parity. Um, so and it's easily convertible from from one form to the other. The D cash it is all a close circuit with easy notes, and that was a concern that persons had whether or not the D cash. Um, was going to replace physical cash. And we do recognize that physical cash will always be around. Persons will always have need for physical cash. So digital cash will co-circulate. We will not replace physical cash, but we'll co-circulate with physical cash. Um, one of the key features of the Dcash is the peer-to-peer -peer architecture, which allow persons to transfer funds um, among each other. So you can send funds from one pilot country to the other um, in, in a matter of seconds. And so there is less friction uh, as you may find with a wire transfer or even check payments using the Dcash. Importantly, in the event of a um, lost wallet, so if you lose your smart device, if, it, if it's stolen, if it's lost, um, if it's destroyed for whatever reason, there is a way you can recover your Dcash. So the loss of your, your wallet does not mean that your Dcash is lost. Um, as I mentioned before, privacy of transactions. So we ensure that person's transactions are private and information is not readily available. And it, it can only be um, divulged if legally required to do so. So the same uh, arrangement that currently exists with bank individuals and their bankers in terms of the security, the privacy of the information maintain, is maintained for the Dcash. And for the purpose of the pilot, there is no cost for use of Dcash for the, for the pilot. So merchants, financial institutions, and users, there is no cost. And we anticipate that even beyond the pilot, if you go to a commercial, a commercial deployment, the any cost associated with Dcash will be significantly lower, significant lower than what currently exists for other payment um, methods. And of course, importantly, which we've underscored throughout our engagements for the Dcash, that Dcash is not a cryptocurrency. So it does not carry with it the um, uncertainties and the risks associated with cryptocurrencies. It is backed by the ECCB reserves. 
similar to how the EC notes and coins are backed by the reserve. So that is very important. The value is guaranteed by the ECCB. In terms of accessing the Dcash, there are two options. There's a registered-based wallet and a value-based wallet. The registered-based wallet is applicable to those persons who have a bank account and whose financial institution is in the, in the pilot. So that way they can actually onboard through their financial institution and, and then they can, they can fund their wallet by transferring funds from their account at the bank or the credit union to their wallet and vice versa. And in this instance, the, the bank, the financial institution would leverage the current, the current existing relationship with the individual. And so the whole KYC will be done by the financial institution as well as the AML and CFT monitoring. Because it's important, we did not relax any reg requirements, um, regulatory requirements for this pilot. So the AML CFT monitoring requirements remain in place for the pilot. And so the financial institutions will carry out that role as they would normally do for their customers as it relates to the Dcash. For those persons who don't have a bank account or whose financial institution may not be in the pilot, we have the value-based wallet option. Now the limits for this particular option are significantly lower given the higher risk, um, but it, it allows all persons to be able to access the Dcash. Onboarding for the value-based wallet is done through agencies which are licensed non-bank financial institutions. And the, the KYC requirements are low, but there are some requirements for accessing the value-based wallets. And then the spending limits, of course, are significantly lower than the registered base. In this instance as well, funding your Dcash wallet means taking physical cash to an agent or merchant teller and exchanging it for digital cash. So in these instances, it's not transfer from a bank account, but rather taking physical cash and converting to digital cash. In terms of the rollouts, um, in, as we went through the process for the rollout, of course, we were impacted by the effects of COVID-19. However, that allowed us to enhance features in response to feedback in our, in our various consultations. And as we went through um, fine tuning the product, we were able to add, add certain functionalities that were not previously um, contemplated and also improve on those that were there. We, we for, the, for the actual launch of the project, of the pilot, we adopted a phased implementation so we had a closed pilot prior to the public launch and the closed pilot was really an opportunity for the key players being the financial institutions and the agencies and some of the merchants to get a good understanding of the, of the software, of the solution. And so that when we go to the public launch that they will have a good end user experience. So we had a closed pilot running for the last month and a half. And that is how we ensured that persons were, the financial institutions were comfortable to onboard merchants, onboard end users. And then so when we actually launch the pilot tomorrow and persons start to send in the applications, the financial institutions are more comfortable to actually go through the process. And then some of the merchants who have onboarded during the closed pilot as well, they are ready and willing to serve the public come tomorrow when we launch. And that goes into the Dcash public launch, which is tomorrow, 31st of March at 2 p.m., We'll have the official public launch of Dcash. What that means that from tomorrow, all members of the public can actually submit the applications, whether it's a value based or registered based wallet, and they can start spending Dcash. And fourthly, we originally we had um, the pilot for the four for four of the eight countries. However, we have decided to extend the pilot for, to twelve months from six months and include all eight. ECC member countries. So at the end of the pilot, all eight countries would have had Dcash rolled out. And just the final slide um, to give a sense as to what we um, envisage. So we're hoping that by the year 2025, there will be a 50% reduction in the use of um, cash in the ECCU and a 80% reduction in the use of checks. And we expect that, that whatever the reduction in the use of cash and checks uh, uh, is, sorry, that that will be acquired by the Dcash. So that is what our vision is for the, for the next five, well, the next four years to have significant reduction in the physical and, and see more digital payments in the ECC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Powell, for this um, comprehensive presentation. I think you've given us quite a lot. Um, hopefully, I don't know if the presentation can be made available. 
Yes, I can send it. To okay. us and whether or not we can share it with. Um, yes, uh, you can. With you the can. attendees. So thank you very much. Um, maybe we can, there are some questions that have come in on Ms. Powell. You may see it on the question and answer in the chat. Um, I would just pause, put one to you, if you may want to respond. There was a question. How does the DCASH or the ECACH and the ACH affect credit unions within the region? Um, that person noted um, to the updating of legislation, but what is the timeline? I think that was when Mr. Brathwick was probably speaking. And how can credit unions be a part of the digital platforms? So I do not know if you can provide any information on that. The credit unions are actually part of the DCASH pilot. So credit unions actually can onboard their, their customers to have registered based wallets. So we, have, we do have credit unions participating in the pilot. So um, they are, so we, we issue the DCASH directly to the credit unions and they in turn can onboard the customers, have registered based wallet with their customers and fund the DCASH wallet. So they are included in the solution. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I noticed another question also, um, and maybe during the panel that can come up, but um, how much you already are our banks to provide and facilitate such a service um, in your view, based on your interactions during the pilot? What efforts have been made to ensure appropriate or futuristic legislation are available um, in the respective trial countries to determine the true impact and experience by all stakeholders? Well, in terms of, of, of digital, digital solutions, I know we are currently reviewing our payment system legislation to take into consideration the different fintech um, developments, because legislation as it is currently does not, does not specifically relate to those. But in terms of the banks currently, there isn't much um, required um, in terms of leg legislation for using the Dcash. The, the key for the banks is about onboarding clients. And as I mentioned before, because they're leveraging current KYC information. So they're only onboarding their customers. So for a person to onboard with a financial institution, they have to be a customer of financial institution. And basically what they're doing, they're um, leveraging that KYC information. They're continuing the AML CFT monitoring that they're currently doing for their bank accounts. And basically it's, it's using a, it's a transfer from their bank account to the Dcash wallet. It's, it's, it's almost like a, a, a one account to another transfer and using the same um, online messaging platform, whether it's internet banking, mobile banking, so they can use those same existing channels. So there isn't that much a significant difference from what currently obtains with multiple accounts at the bank. It's almost like there's another account that the bank is transferring funds. The only difference is that once the funds are transferred from your existing account to the wallet, it's no longer on the bank's books because it's, it's almost like a withdrawal. From, it's just, just transferring from your bank account to your digital wallet. One of the things though, I must highlight that for the purpose of the pilot, the systems are not integrated because it's a test and we have not proven the, um, the efficiency or the efficacy of the DCAS solution is not integrated. However, if we move into a commercial deployment, we expect that the need would be for integration and that will be tested through, um, during the pilot. How do we integrate the DCAS solution with the core banking solution? Because it will be difficult for banks to navigate two um, separate systems in the long term. So that is, that is something that's been contemplated for testing during the pilot. Okay, thank you very much. And we're getting quite a lot of questions, um, but we, we don't have time, but we will take note of all the questions because we, and I hope Ms. Powell, you are able to be around for a little bit of a while so that um, if questions are posed, you can also answer for the next um, half an hour to an hour or so. But thank you very much for your presentation. You're uh, welcome. And to the ECCB. Right now, we will now move uh, because we did have a slight change in the program, but we are now Miss Annie Bertrand, um, who is the coordinator of Pillar One um, Productivity and Innovation in the private sector from the Compit Caribbean Partnership Facility, who's going to give a presentation on a study based on a study that had been done financed by Compit Caribbean on fintech um, in the Caribbean. Um, region. So Annie, you have the floor. Annie? Yes, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, now I put it on the slideshow. Excellent. So thank you very much. So before I start, I would just like to say a disclaimer. So the information that I will be sharing today 
is actually uh, coming from research and interviews that were conducted in 2018. So as you know, lots of things have changed since 2019. So if you find that some information is no longer relevant in your country, don't be angry and please do share this information so that we can foster knowledge sharing and build a conversation. So let me start by telling you about uh, what is Compete Caribbean. Uh, Compete Caribbean is a technical assistance program for private sector development established by a consortium of donors. So donors are IDB, UK, uh, Canadian government and the Caribbean Central Bank. So the first phase of the Compete Caribbean program uh, was completed in 2017 and was a huge success. So therefore, the donors came back together again for a second phase, which started a few years later and is now underway. So how is the program executed? So we have two pillars. The first one focused on productivity and innovation in the private sector, which is the one I lead. And then the second one is focused on public business climate reforms, uh, which is uh, involved different types of instruments. So today we're here uh, for one project that is uh, under the second instrument focused on entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem with the OACS Commission. Um, and why is the Compete Caribbean program established in the first place? So this slide explains uh, means a lot, right? So in the in the early 70s, the real GDP per capita was four times higher in the Caribbean than that of the rest of small uh, economies of the world. And if you look at this image, uh, um, fast forward, uh, I'm just gonna get a pointer, a uh, laser pointer. So here, the rest of small economies of the world have uh, grown tremendously over 44 years, but very little grow growth has been observed in the Caribbean. So why is that? What is happening in the Caribbean? So we have lower uh, total factor productivities for different reasons that you are all, most of you are familiar with. But what most interesting for us today is that the Caribbean private sector has more difficulty in accessing finance. And we used to always, the literature always refers to lack of access to finance, but it's not in our days uh, important to just have access to finance, but it's also important to have access to a wide range of financial services, given the new ways that businesses are conducted. So we launched uh, we launched a study uh, uh, called the under understanding the role of fintech companies and regulations in enabling Caribbean MSMEs to innovate and grow. This research was published in 2019, and what was interesting was that we found that like, essentially, like pretty much more than half of Caribbean MSMEs are underbanked. So what do we really mean by underbanked? So that they, it refers underbanked means that businesses or individuals do not have sufficient access to mainstream financial services. So that can include loans, but also other things like credit cards, overdraft, wire transfers, mobile banking, and so on. Why is that? So the first issue is obviously cost. The um, cost of having a, a, a merchant account or a bank account tends to be higher in the Caribbean than it is in other countries in the world. Another issue is the onboarding requirements. So uh, Ms. Powell uh, talked about uh, the onboarding requirements, the fact that the financial institutions must comply with international laws referring to AML, KTF, and KYC. So what are those laws exactly? So these are international laws that require that all financial institutions have procedures in place to know their customers. So what it means essentially is they have to make sure that who you, that you are, who you say you are. So how do you determine that as a financial institution? Each financial institution would, would interpret those, uh, will have different procedures on how do they make sure that they know who you are. So what we found in this research that is interesting is that some financial institutions require different things than others, right? And some in the in financial institutions, the Caribbean have more rigorous uh, procedures and more documents are required for MSMEs to onboard. And why is this a problem really? Well, it's a problem because the, um, the SMEs don't have, uh, many of the SMEs don't have the document that the, it is required to onboard. That's the first minor issue, for first important issue in fact. And another issue is that MSMEs sometimes, micro, small and medium enterprises, 
do not trust the financial institution. So they do not want to provide all this information, if, even if they had that information, because there is a lack of trust. This is something that needs to be fixed. And then uh, another important issue that is often dismissed is that MSMEs, and that is true all over the world, MSMEs need convenience. You know, they, they are very, um, they, when, the issue, when the process for achieving or, or obtaining something is very complex, well, they will find a way around and they will not necessarily, um, they will not necessarily move forward with it. They'll deal with it, right? So um, it the process has to be convenient. So what are the different solutions for that? Well, there are different solutions. Digital identity is one idea, is one option. Digital identity actually in countries where the identity card can easily be falsified will increase the risk assessment for the financial institution. So therefore more information or more documents will be required to ensure the validity of an identity. So in the case of a dig digital identity, which is the new way forward, then you have your information encrypted and it's, uh, it's perhaps easier for financial institutions to validate identity. Uh, a digital identity is one option, but there's also others like business support organizations in the ecosystem can get involved in helping MSMEs to onboard with the financial institutions, uh, but as well as regulation. You know, I, here at the bottom of this slide, you have an example of a central bank uh, in the Bahamas that have proposed a reform to facilitate onboarding uh, from financial institutions. Uh, and then the ECCB also discussed regulatory reforms that will be taking place in the EC, um, uh, in the uh, OECS countries that would perhaps also facilitate this process. Now, other issues affect the digital payment ecosystem in the OECS. We have a low penetration of credit cards among consumers, which result in low demand for digital transactions. Here's an example in Jamaica, because that came from a, a research that was done by the World Bank. Only 12% of Jamaican adults own money transfer accounts, checking accounts, and credit cards. This is very, very low compared to other countries. And um, uh, at, at the same time, the process for obtaining the point of sale terminals, you know, this is the little machine that you use in the store to, to swipe uh, the, the credit cards. These, these machines are actually, these terminals are difficult to obtain for many MSMEs in the region. So therefore you have a vicious cycle, right? You have a low demand for processing credit cards and you have also difficulties in having access to the technology to process credit cards. But thankfully this will be changing because obviously with the, with the COVID-19, more and more consumers are interested in paying digitally and uh, more and more businesses are interested in processing payment digitally. And uh, another issue is the small fragmented markets, you know, like obviously financial institutions are for profit entities that need to have a uh, return on investment and the technology that needs to be purchased and the amount of, uh, uh, of investment that is required to make sure that this technology is secure um, is, is very high. And when you have a very small market, then it's very difficult. It takes a longer period of time in order to have a return on investment. And that is true also for the international payment service providers that would also be looking at a market when they want to expand their market. They will also be looking at the size of the market before they, they make the necessary investment in terms of uh, money, but also time in establishing themselves in different uh, countries. Uh, we also have a lack of capacity and resources. As I said before, you know, the, the, the investment in technology is high, but also the level of complexity is high. So it requires a lot of technical uh, knowledge in order to make sure that all this technology for processing payment is effective. And really I applaud the central banks, the ECCB and the OECS, which is the, one of the most innovative in the world and has really spent a lot of effort and resources over the past year or so, uh, investing in uh, establishing the right digital uh, uh, currency. Now, uh, in the OECS, we also have many indigenous banks that do not still offer online payment gateways for the same reasons that I've mentioned before. And those, what's also interesting, and those financial institutions that we've been in discussion with that do offer online payment gateways for digital payment processing struggle to onboard MSMEs. Those that really want to make, make it accessible, uh, they are struggling as well. 
this is the next point is about the uh, what uh, uh, was mentioned before also uh, the Eastern Caribbean Automated Clearing House, ECACH, this for wire transfers. This was established only in 2014, you know, uh, it's quite interesting for me because in 2001, I was working in New York helping a large financial institution analyzing their costs associated with these processing these kind of transactions where in the ECCB or in the, or in the Caribbean in general, this has made, made been available much, much later. And what's unfortunate is even though it came later, it is still underutilized. Many other financial institutions could be using it and the OECS and many businesses should be using it. And uh, uh, I, I guess this is a final comment here, final issue, the size of the informal sector in some Caribbean countries represents 35 to 40% of GDP. Uh, obviously, when you have a large proportion of the informal sector, it's a lot harder to onboard uh, businesses. But, that, well, actually not but, but in fact, this is why the, the, ECC, the D cash is fantastic because they found a way to make it accessible to the informal sector as well. And oh, that's a final point here, final issue on my side, the resistance to change. You know, some people are saying to me, well, you know, this is an issue of culture. People like to stand in line in the bank and they have, they need this human interaction and they want to get their money uh, going to the bank physically. Well, it, it, I don't think it's really true because in fact, nobody likes to wait in line. And now uh, with COVID, um, the human interaction is no longer really there. So people are increasingly interested. It's just that they are uncomfortable using digital means of payment or digital transactions. So what we need to do is to make the process easier and we have to help people become more comfortable with it. And then the, res the resistance to change will perhaps drop. And then there's the final issue of knowledge. Knowledge, MSMEs in general don't necessarily know that there are so many different processes, uh, digital process, digital payment procedures and um, uh, uh, solutions that are already available. So this is about digital light literacy. And this is precisely why we have this event today is to help MSMEs learn about what already exists. Now we need to move forward into e-commerce, right? E-commerce, which has been growing tremendously in other countries around the world, but very limited in the Caribbean. So let's look at this issue in the US. You know, payment processors like PayPal is an easy checkout uh, option for businesses. They just can have it on the website and then they pay a small transaction fees. Well, in the Caribbean, it is not so easy, as many of you know already. PayPal will charge higher fees. There are some holding period that is required and uh, other issues exist. Like, for example, if you are a business that, let's say, for example, you have a jewelry business and you sell online to visit to people in the U.S., so you receive your US dollars, but then when you actually get the money after the holding period and your bank account and the uh, OECS, you get your money into the, into the local currency. So you have to pay for an exchange uh, fees, but then you have to pay your suppliers. Some of your suppliers may be coming from the US as well. So you have to transfer back into US dollars, which is really not uh, cost effective for MSMEs in the Caribbean region. And um, some other uh, service providers like Stripe, for example, require that um, vendors uh, have a bank account in the US. And that is not necessarily something easy to do for, uh, for, for uh, OECS citizens. And it's not necessarily the right thing to do either because it exposes risks to US tax legislation and it also prevents the, uh, uh, perhaps uh, um, reduces the lack of information that we keep within the region. So the next point is the lack of, of Caribbean-based payment processors uh, in the Caribbean, um, which can aggregate payments from websites to a payment gateway, uh, have, requires MSMEs to shop around for financial institutions that offer online payment gateways. Some do, some don't. And, and, and um, sometimes the cost of having access to these online payment gateways is really high. And I'm hoping that today we have some financial institutions that will be presenting their solutions. And I'm hoping that we will discover new and cheaper methods of having access to online payment gateway. I have two more slides, one Ricardo. One minute, exactly. Okay. So, I mean, I just wanted to also mention that the, the new, the, the good news, right? So the mobile banking, uh, not the mobile banking, but the mobile wallet 
to process payments using a mobile phone is actually a much cheaper way of making financial transactions. And we have many that are coming up in the region, and I think that we have many more. So this slide here is, um, is just a quick overview of what other speakers before me have discussed. So you, you can see that you have, um, you have the traditional banking products that includes you know, the credit card processing at the point of sale. You have the online payment gateways we've talked about. We also talked about wire transfer. And then you have the FinTech solution that includes the digital currency. These are like, like the Bitcoins and, and other kind of cryptocurrencies. And then you have digital fiat currencies that are backed by the central bank that are completely different from the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And then you have the intersection between the two, right? Mobile banking and mobile money that use mobile wallets. So uh, what are the consequences of all these uh, issues that I've been talking about? Uh, the consequences have been that we have a, a cash-based economy, which is very costly for, for businesses, for government, and for consumers. You know, the businesses that, uh, uh, that are, are stuck into a cash economy struggle to have access to their consumers. They cannot take advantage for the willingness to pay. Like in the economy, like the OECS, which you know, right now we don't have many visitors coming up, but when they come back after the vaccinations has been completed in most countries, then they have a high willingness to pay. We did conduct a research to better understand the willingness to pay of visitors for products, for products and services that are offered by Caribbean MSMEs. And we discovered that there's huge untapped opportunities, but visitors don't like to carry cash around. So you have uh, using digital payment like mobile wallets and Dcash, the MSMEs will then eventually be able to leverage the willingness to pay of the visitors. Uh, and the government will now be able to start tracking uh, information, even if the information is private. The data point about you know, the trends of what things are purchased when can help to facilitate, to manage an economy and to foster export opportunities as well. And then perhaps uh, for the consumer's perspective, which apparently has uh, um, a resistance to change, they eventually will now start realizing that the process is less, is more convenient, it's safer, um, and also uh, help to save time. So I will stop here and will obviously Ricardo remain available for questions. And I also have a consultant that um, is available with me today who can help to answer some of the more technical questions related to digital payment. And um, I will stop here, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annie, for, for this presentation. Um, I think it was also very comprehensive. We had some questions about making the presentations available. So, Annie, I would um, hope that we can do so and share your presentation with the, uh, with the participants. Um, I think one question um, that came up, and it just has to do with your last comment, Annie, and that has to do with the fact that um, no matter how effective public education is on you know, digital cash and other digital payment solutions, there are some consumers who are just unwilling to buy into the concept. Um, and often, for very good reasons, um, some of them might be elderly who are not tech savvy. Um, and at risk people who simply, you know, need to be able to use cash. So the question I get, the question the person is asking, how will this be addressed? Um, do you have any insights or perspective from, from where you sit? Yeah, well, today, later on, Kwesi from the OECS Commission will talk about uh, exciting opportunities that are coming up via our technical cooperation. So yes, the, definitely more webinars and more activities must be done to increase uh, digital literacy. Uh, financial institutions, must also help with uh, their customer service, obviously to help uh, provide more information to the MSMEs so that they better understand you know, how they, the, the technology works, how do you get the information and so on. Um, and then the business support organizations, you know, Complete Caribbean has been also working with business support organizations across the region. So there's, a, there's also uh, better linkages that should be made between business support organizations like Export Saint.
Lucia, San Center for Enterprise Development in, in St. Vincent, uh, Dexia in Dominica. So these business support organizations can play a greater role also in helping MSMEs to better understand how, what are the options available, what do they need to do, where do they need to go, and make greater linkages with the financial institutions. So Ricardo will rely on that to do that yeah. Thanks. over the next few years. <laughs> Thanks very much, Annie. Um, we sort of, um, again, because of all the information I'm running behind time, so let us press on. So thank you, Annie, for the presentation. And you, and Mr. Michael Tudin, I know will be around um, to possibly answer any questions that will come up later. So now we would want to turn to Mr. James Howe, who is a senior advisor and program manager for ITC's, that is the International Trade Center, um, which is based in Geneva. He Connect. Um, the ITC is a, an organization um, parented by the World Trade Organization and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, um, and their role really is uh, private sector development, particularly in developing countries. So Mr. Howe, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but please forgive me if I'm not. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, Ten minutes. Thanks very much. Yes, you pronounced my name. Uh, right, thank you, Ricardo. Um, right, so actually, there's a kind of a link with uh, Annie's uh, uh, presentation that she's just given you because I mean, I'll be talking about online payment solutions and in particular applications in e commerce and um, some of our learning about that and the relevance to your topic, hopefully. So, this is a little bit of background. You'll be having more technical uh, presentations and insights. But this is a little bit some of our perspective as we uh, work with small firms around the world, generally in developing and least developed countries, and try and help them understand the issues. So we're coming from uh, a point of view of helping small companies sell online. And uh, there are many things that you have to be good at to be able to sell online. And uh, one of them, but it turns out to be a key issue, is uh, getting paid. Um, is having online payment solutions. So I'm going to just give you uh, a few insights about what, what we do there um, and what some of our learning has been. Okay, so, you know, first of all, um, the, the, there's many of you that will be intimately familiar with this and some a bit less so. Um, but the, the question is, what, what's the importance of this? What's the importance of the issue of payment solutions? Uh, at the moment, what do what do SMEs need to understand, and uh, or how do we how do we go about that? Um, and some of, some of the issues that we've encountered as we work in different uh, regions of the world. So, the first thing, you know, why why is this important? You know, this is just a little bit of a video to say to give an example of work that we're doing in Central America, where we're working with two hundred women-owned, women-managed businesses in the handicrafts area. And we've had a lot of learning about that in the uh, um, six countries involved, including Costa Rica, um, about stepping through the understanding. And this can be, this can unlock a lot of opportunities. This is an example of a company called Nica Hat in Nicaragua that makes traditional uh, hats. And luckily enough, they had set up their own e-commerce platform at the beginning of the year um, with work that we've been doing with them. And that was a bit timely with the COVID happening. And they were able to carry on. In fact, they said that they in 2019, they'd done no sales online. In 2020, they actually managed to do more sales than they'd done the previous year, despite the, the, despite the pandemic. So that, you know, it's a little story reminding us of the importance and what's happened to these small businesses finding opportunities and being able to sell. So behind that, online payment solutions uh, is very important for unlocking e-commerce. In fact, in the early days of Alibaba, they made a tough decision to move away from cash. And of course, there was a big uh, strategic decision made to invest in Alipay at the same time as Alibaba on the domestic platforms. And now, of course, that's one of the biggest payment solution, uh, solutions in the world, the amount of money moving through Alipay. So we see that that's considered important. Um, you know, we see uh, uh, obviously e-commerce is taking off in different parts of the world for various reasons. And this is uh, a projection uh, into 2021 numbers from the 
last year, we can see a growth everywhere. Obviously, in the region, Latin, uh, Latin America, Caribbean, there are certain big and dominant markets like Brazil and Mexico. And on, measured on that same scale, of course, the Caribbean is quite small, uh, but growing. So digital payments themselves is a big business, as I'm sure you'll be discussing. The graph uh, is from Statista, um, recent numbers and projections, uh, 7 trillion business at the current time are made up of uh, mobile point of sale payments and digital commerce. Um, both are expected to grow 14%. Um, so again, bit bit older numbers are on the um, percent of population receiving digital payments. So again, apologize, I couldn't find more easily more recent numbers, but anyway, it shows you that Latin America uh, Caribbean is some way behind. I don't think that surprises or shocks anybody, uh, but uh, there, there was a, a trend with, with quite a high growth rate to be expected in the region, but still be interesting to know the latest figures, but only about 50% of the population uh, receiving payments digitally. Um, so again, with that background, uh, this is important. It unlocks uh, the potential for e-commerce. Um, and what do SMEs need to understand? Well, they need to understand a number of things. They need to understand what is an online payment solution and typically be brief on how they work and what the different components are. Um, the, a big topic about understanding payment preferences of customers and how these change around the world. And it's necessary to understand where you're selling to and make the payment solution available that customers expect to pay in. Uh, the regulatory environment can be relatively complex. So it's just trying to boil down some of the briefing to companies that make sense. Um, opening a payment, account, payment solution account can be challenging uh, in terms of the compliance for some of the reasons that we heard about. Integration of the website can be risky, um, costly, again, as Annie mentioned. Um, uh, but there are also important issues about chargebacks um, when customers don't pay or there are other issues that mean that the liability comes back to the merchant holding the account. And uh, also necessary to understand how currencies are managed on payments. So that's a little bit overview of our curriculum of what we would go into. And of course, we discuss the difference between card payments, bank transfers, instant bank transfers, digital wallets, as we've heard about the example of, uh, of, of Dcash and uh, cryptocurrencies coming up. Of course, if you look at how pay preferences for these different solutions around the world, you'll see that credit cards are considering the whole world are uh, a very uh, dominant preference of customers. Uh, but you'll find in different markets, so Africa is of course another extreme, countries like Egypt, which would be you know, 50, 60% cash, uh, and other uh, developing, least developed country markets have a very strong presence of cash, as we heard see, is somewhat prevalent in the Caribbean. And e-wallet solutions and other things are like M-Pesa, jumping up in countries like um, Kenya. But even in countries that you might consider very similar, and here between the UK and Germany, there are local preferences. Germany, by the way, is a very strong market segment for instant payment, you know, with instant transfers, uh, which is very different than, than the UK, even though I should point out this blue bar is PayPal that we mentioned. The PayPal is an important one. We'll come back to it in a moment. A very important gateway to other markets. So that's typically, you know, an issue that we find um, you know, very important for the kind of businesses that we're in, small handicraft businesses, they're not selling on Amazon very often or, or Alibaba, they're selling on accounts through eBay or Etsy. And uh, PayPal is very often a gatekeeper. Not only is it dominant in this market, but very often uh, to be on eBay, you have to open a PayPal account. So in effect, they do the compliance, if you like, for eBay. Uh, that's a problem um, because it's not available everywhere. It dominates. Um, in most developing countries, the choice is between PayPal and to, to check out. Uh, the availability of other solutions is, is, um, is very mixed. So uh, the, uh, PayPal would claim to be in many countries, but it confuses many observers because they're available as a payment solution, but not necessarily as a merchant uh, solution. 
So um, sometimes they're available and we can coach on what needs to be done in terms of compliance and getting on. But even in many countries that apparently it, where it's available, there can be an issue of getting the money out, of linking a bank account, a local bank account, in which case we are looking at, uh, at workarounds um, um, to, to get the money out. And that can be by using uh, uh, things like uh, Payoneer. Here's a sort of mapping of available in, in Caribbean uh, about PayPal business. That's the ability to receive money as a merchant's account is not everywhere open. So as I say, we, we'd used Payoneer, certainly in, in Central America countries to try and help companies get money out of uh, PayPal or look at alternatives like to check out and uh, building them into websites, but to check out is not available, integrated into marketplaces. And in many cases, neither is Stripe. And there are, but there are other ways around, like building foreign representative structures. And there last year, we published a report and some research on that, on how to build a foreign entity and register in different markets for, for, for banking um, and solutions to, to, to make that possible. Big issue of understanding why money, why accounts get frozen. And so this is a thing we need to do to try and make sure that it doesn't happen. Uh, but very often it is the situation. Again, I will just speed through this in the interest of time. Uh, but, you know, uh, this, this, this often traps some of our small vendors who find that their account is frozen. And, and very often the explanations are not clear. And we see it's the other side of anti-money laundering if they receive an abnormal large amount of money someone's filed a complaint, chargebacks have occurred, and so on. Um, so we, we systematically try and understand on this and train and help SMEs to, um, to overcome this. So, you know, a few words of conclusions, you know, payment solutions offer a world of possibilities uh, when they're available. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are limited and, and require special help sometimes uh, to, to comply, to have the documentation necessary. Training is an important part about this for companies to understand and prepare. PayPal is a gatekeeper is a particular case, but solutions are available to work around and the good preparation and discipline on a number of issues is necessary for SMEs, even those who have access to maintain their accounts open uh, and uh, easily and cost effectively get the money out. So just a word, we, we run a program, we have a network, uh, a, um, uh, a community, um, where we uh, connect uh, entrepreneurs and experts from developing and least developed countries. You can join econconnect.org, drop, drop us uh, and my team um, an email or check us out what we're, what we're doing. And I'll be deaf to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hall, for your presentation. Again, I hope we can make it available to I think it contains some very important information. Sorry, my camera is off. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you for your for your presentation. Um, as I said, we hope we can make it available to our um, participants um, to this. What I'm going to do now is we are now going to have the um, panel discussion on the fireside chat. And I, we are taking note of all of the questions. Um, but because of time, I'm going to um, hand over now to Chodi Udu, um, who's going to take us through. Um, and this um, um, panel discussion fireside chat is going to be an interactive, this interactive discussion, question driven. And so we are going to pull questions um, from the chat and pose it um, to the panelists um, who may be best placed to answer. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you all who are, are uh, online. Um, we noticed that a number of you are raising your hands. Um, if you have questions and comments, please post them in the Q&A box um, and we will try to um, bring this to the, to the moderator. Um, and questions also post in the chat, we will also take note of them. So thank you very much. So Jody, I hand over to you to um, moderate us um, from, from there. Mr. Budu. Thank you, Ricardo. And welcome to everyone um, who ch who's chatting in. Welcome. I'd like to say thanks to the ECCB for putting this on. It's very of now. Um, uh, Ms. Emmanuel Flood, Ricardo, James, Quisi, the whole team. We will move this as efficiently as possible. 
Um, I would like to just do a, a brief introduction of the panelists. We have Mr. Francis Fontenelle, who's a senior banking specialist at the ECCB. Mr. Alex Tron, who's the CEO of Dad Cash. Ms. Renee Thomas, who's the co-founder and operations director of Carib Caribites. Mr. Quincy Prentice, who's the chief information officer of St. Kitts, Nevis, Anguilla National Bank. Mr. James Ho, who's the senior advisor and program manager for ITC's e-commerce connect. And Mr. Chris Burns, who's the CEO of First Atlantic Commerce. So we have uh, a list of questions which will be directed based on jump into, as Ricardo had alluded to, jump into some of the questions from the audience. So the first question is, what is the state of digital financial services and digital payments in the OECS? And there are actually four parts to this question. So we need to address the legislative, regulatory, and institutional framework, the financial and digital infrastructure, data governance and privacy, and the risks of digital payments, which is cybersecurity and fraud. So this first part of the question, what is the state of digital financial services and digital payments in the OECS? This is directed towards the ECCB representative, specifically regarding the legislative, regulatory, and institutional framework. So Mr. Fontenelle, if you could just speak on the legislative, regulatory, and institutional framework for about three minutes. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jody. And thank you to the other panelists and the, the, the other members of the audience. Um, as it relates to the, 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 the legislative infrastructure, as I think the Deputy Governor would have indicated earlier on, um, one of the principal legislative tenants governing the payment system is the Payment Systems Act. And that has been you know, around for like 10 years. But we have seen movements, we have seen developments in the payment system that is, that is you know, one can consider it a meteoric in terms, in, in terms of the development. Um, we are moving, technology is very much influencing the payment system now. And whereas the payment system was pretty much bank-centric 10 years ago, I mean, we're looking for an efficient payment system that not only encompasses banks, but other institutions. So right now, as we speak, we are working on a revised payment system and services act. So this act will also address the issue of digital transformations, will address the issue of digital payments. Our current payment systems act does not have regulation, it doesn't have, it does not speak to a, a, a licensing, a licensing regime for the payment system. And so in the new payment systems act, we have regulation that will speak to electronic retail payments and how the, the manner in which it, it, it should be it should be governed, it should, be, it, it, it should take place. So currently, the, as, as you would have indicated, the Payment Systems Act is, is obsolete, and we do agree. However, we are getting assistance from the World Bank under the Digital Economy Project to transform the Payment Systems Act and to bring with it um, regulations, and those regulations and the Payment Systems Act I think Mr. Fontanella has, has frozen. Is this currently? Is this the case, or is it just on my end? Okay, you're back. You're back. You're back, Francis. You fr you froze for about ten. Sorry. Seconds. Yes. Oh, okay. As it relates to the, the regulatory approach for the payment system, um, the, 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 the legislation will address this because the payment systems. What we have seen happening is that electronic wallet providers wanting to come into the space not sure of what the, 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 legal, the, the, the legal infrastructures, how does it address them? Um, and so therefore, the, you know, the central bank would have had to work in tandem with the Financial Services Regulatory Authority to see how best we can address, you know, those entities. Because not every transfer is a payment, but all payments are transfers. If you, um, in that, speaking in that way. So sometimes the, the activity of a particular wallet provider, it, it, it transcends the Money Services Business Act and the Payment Systems Act. So what we have had to, just to look at those, those, those issues and to make it abundantly clear in the new legislation, what, what, where the legislation lies with respect to 
regulating those entities. The central bank, uh, I, I, as I said, we, we, we play a multifaceted role, which is a user, which is a, a developer, it's a catalyst, as you want to call it, or also an oversight function. So the legal function is what we call on the oversight, but we also want to encourage innovation, we want to encourage development. And so that is why the, the, the legislation would be so focused to address those issues. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Fontenelle. The second part to this question, what is the state of digital financial services and digital payments in the OECS? We need to answer the financial and the digital infrastructure. And I believe regarding the financial and digital infrastructure, to get a, a, as more practical an answer as possible, I would direct that part to Mr. Chris Burns, who's the CEO of, of First Atlantic Commerce, I believe he is actually doing some, some business in the region. Mr. Burns? Is Mr. Burns on or is he on? No, it doesn't look like he's on at the moment. Okay, no problem. This, I, I think um, Mr. Strong will be well suited to answer this question as well. <laughs> Take it away, Mr. Strong. Uh, pleasant good day, everyone. And uh, thank you also to the facilitators and collaborators for hosting and organizing this session. Um, what is the state of the digital infrastructure? It just, just, just wanted to make sure, um, could you just echo the question for me? Yes. What is the state of digital financial services and digital payments in the OECS, particularly the financial and digital infrastructure? Okay. Um, to, to sum it up, I would say disparate, meaning that um, Mr. Fontenelle, uh, when he spoke earlier, would have spoken and the deputy governor, when he spoke earlier this morning, would have given an overview of the, 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 the payment system architecture. And so Fonty in his, his, his discussion a few minutes ago would have alluded to that the, we are coming from a system that is highly bank centric. And um, we are coming from a region where everything was any nature or legislation all infrastructure surrounds the commercial banks, no matter what. So it's like a hub and spokes with the central bank in the middle, the, the commercial banks and the outside of that, and everyone else fighting um, um, outside of that. There is no access to the payment system, then therefore without going through the commercial banks. So you may have innovators and several um, developers starting wallets, starting a few things, but it is still the retail sector in terms of payment is still principally dictated by what the commercial banks offered and offer and what they're able to support, even if a third party, a credit union, a, dig a mobile digital wallet um, offer a solution, it still has to have the blessing and some access to the payment system, which invariably has to go through a bank. It is then therefore also dominated by um, those bank products such as mobile banking, um, online banking, the credit card, the debit card. And, and then we have the remittance services and the remittance services then provide that cross border third party alternative in terms of the, the commercial banks. But here you have the, the, the payment system being basically managed sort of as an adjunct and an extension of what the commercial banks will facilitate and or offer. I don't know if that gives you an, a, a pretty direct overview. It does, it does. Thanks a lot, Mr. Strand. Thank you. We will move to the third part of the question. What is the state of digital financial services and digital payments in the OECS? This part speaking directly to data governance and privacy. And for, for this part of the question, I would like to call on Mr. Quincy Prentice, Chief Information Officer of St. Kitts, Nevis, Anguilla National Bank. If you could just speak about data governance and privacy in the digital financial services and digital payments market in the OECS. Thank you. Uh, first off, I'd like to congratulate the OECS for putting uh, this event together. I think it's, it's quite timely. 
Um, before I, I'll answer the, the, the question in respect of uh, data governance and privacy, um, I'd like to add to, to what Alex mentioned previously. Uh, I think, um, the, well, the question wasn't posed to me directly, but I think we are, we are uniquely poised at this point in time, I'd say uniquely poised for takeoff as it you know, relates to uh, digital financial services and digital payments in the OECS. Um, we, clearly, we have a number of players uh, such as JAD. Uh, we have the DXCB that's now coming online. Uh, we also have other existing products such as the electronic funds transfer uh, that has been out there. Uh, we also have uh, platforms such as peer-to-peer -peer tra uh, transfers via our, our mobile banking uh, applications. Uh, but as Alex would have mentioned, you know, clearly um, there's a lack of, of cohesiveness to a certain extent in terms of one, having a single platform that uh, is available across the entire region. And I think, uh, you know, certainly this is something that, that would assist in, in the overall adoption of digital payments uh, on a regional scale. Um, in terms of, you know, what we've seen uh, coming out of COVID, um, we've seen customers and businesses that are uh, more really ready and willing uh, than ever to accept and adopt uh, digital payments. Um, and I think it's, it's therefore imperative uh, that, we, that we provide um, these services uh, to, to these, to these um, customers. Um, just to provide some numbers, uh, you know, just to, to provide some context in terms of what we've seen uh, as it relates to the adoption of, of these sort of channels, especially in, in the post uh, COVID environment. Uh, over the past year, we've seen a 52% increase in terms of the 30-day usage rate on our mobile banking platform. Uh, we were seeing uh, an excess of 30% increase in terms of the number of persons utilizing uh, that similar platform. In terms of cards, uh, we've seen uh, a 12% increase uh, in year on year with regards to the number of, of transactions uh, comparing January 2021 to January 2020. This is in spite of uh, the fact that uh, to a certain extent our, our borders are still closed uh, we, the cruise industry is down. Um, so in spite of all of those uh, negative impacts uh, from an economic perspective, uh, certainly we've seen that um, the effects of COVID have certainly caused uh, customer behavior uh, to shift uh, dramatically uh, towards uh, the adoption of, of uh, more electronic uh, So I think it's incumbent on us to provide an environment uh, whereby uh, consumers are able to, to adopt uh, these, these uh, payment uh, channels uh, as seamlessly and as friction-free as, as possible. Uh, now to get to your question as it relates to data governance and privacy, I think that is an area of, of um, it is a sole point, I think. Um, we are still, I would dare say, in the, in the infancy, infancy stages as it relates to data governance and privacy. Um, within our own, um, you know, respective jurisdictions, um, there is an abject lack, I would say, of, of uh, data, data uh, privacy acts. Um, quite often, uh, what we would see, uh, speaking from the, the financial um, institution standpoint, uh, we would refer to uh, frameworks such as the GDPR um, and look externally uh, to provide uh, some guidance in terms of, you know, things that we, we would need to be wary of, um, uh, whatever compliance issues that, that may exist. These essentially are being driven uh, more by external forces um, than, than by internal forces. And I think as we seek to adopt, um, adopt uh, more digital payments uh, and, 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 and embark uh, more on, uh, I would say, process of digital transformation, even outside of the financial services industry, uh, it behooves us to uh, strengthen uh, the data governance and privacy uh, frameworks uh, uh, that we have within our respective uh, jurisdictions. Thank you. Just to jump in, um, Jody, um, as it relates to data protection, um, we are also working with the, the World Bank to have a data protection legislation for the entire o, the, o, the ECCU region mm -hmm. as we speak. Um, the, the Monetary Council would have approved the policy framework for that, because as you would have indicated, you couldn't develop 
your payment systems legislation and ignore data protection, given that payment system is moving in a digital environment. So as we speak, we are moving, we are moving ahead with data protection legislation in tandem with the Payment Systems Act as well. Just to indicate. Right, thanks. I think it's fitting um, to take a very important question because uh, um, it relates directly to this topic. Um, a compatriot, Jared Berger, is from St. Lucia. He is asked in the Q&A, um, what I believe is a very important question, which is who owns the data related to a decash transaction? And further to this question, um, can you tell us what the data usage limitations are, if any? I think that's a very important question. So who owns the data related to decash transactions? And how can this data, what are the limitations? I couldn't speak I don't mean to I don't mean to stump you there, but <laughs> yeah, you are yeah, the yeah, ECCB I, I couldn't speak authoritatively on it. I'm not sure if Ms. Powell, I know that discussion came up. Um I am aware that um I, I couldn't speak authoritatively on it, but so I would prefer to to, to pass that question on to somebody who could who, who could be who could be definitive. So I don't know if Ms. Powell is still in the in the, in, in, in the audience and she can she can jump in. But while, while we get Mrs. Powell, if I could just request some clarification, though, in, in the question has been posed in terms of who owns the data. Is this in the context of an FI uh, to the central bank as a, as a partner? And certainly the other third third party players that are involved in the overall uh, decash transaction process. Uh, you know, what what aspect are we looking at with regards to the data ownership? Because um, certainly, you well, know, well, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Bergas is actually a businessman in St. Lucia. So I think I'm not going to speak for him, but I'm also a businessman here. And if I'm running transactions over Dcash, um, people are making purchases through my business over Dcash. Um, from my perspective, you know, that is information data people are getting on what is being purchased at my establishment, how much they're paying, what whatever the trends are um, through Dcash. So I think all the players, this, 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 this pertains to all the players, the FIs who are distributing the wallets, um, people who are the B2Cs. I think it's a, it's a very general question that pertains to all players. Jody, you muted. Oh. Yeah, sorry, did you get the last part? No, you, you muted um, saying the last uh, three, four seconds. Okay, no, I was saying that I think it pertains generally to all players within a Dcash transaction, whether it be an FI um, interfacing with the ECCB or whether it be a customer with an FI or a customer with a business. I mean, if, if there's no one on right now who can attack that question, I, I think it's something that we should note and perhaps um, via email or, 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 or some other correspondence, the ECB can speak to that. Yes, I've sent I've sent a question to Ms. Powell, alternatively, so we, we will certainly take note of it and respond. Yes, but I think I mean clearly there would be there would be I I'm, I sort of approach the question with some level of hesitancy because when one speaks of data ownership, um, I think that's that's. That's one issue uh, versus access to the actual data. I mean, one can have access to data um, without actually owning it. Um, so I'm just curious to get a better understanding if the, the question is more relating to who has access to the data in terms of, let's say, the ability to run an analytics on uh, a transaction that has been done, transactions that have been done by a, by a specific customer, or are those transactions being anonymized so that Notwithstanding, let's say an ECCB, as a, from a regulatory perspective, may have uh, some interest in getting some insight into what types of transactions are being done, uh, how much the platform has been adopted uh, by by consumers. Uh, they may not necessarily have an interest in in specific transactions, but certainly from a macro level, they would they would have an interest in in, in gaining you know some further insight into into. Uh, you know what's going on on, on the platform. I'm, I'm just curious to get an understanding if it's more question relating pertaining to access to the data 
uh, versus who actually owns mm -hmm. the data. Well, if I right. may well, jump I think, in here, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, Jody, I was just saying, if I may jump in here too, I think um, you also mentioned the users, I mean, the, the individuals, the consumers, um, especially in the context of GDPR where they can actually request um, of the payment provider a record or um, a, a sort of transaction details of what data is held on their behalf and request that that data be removed if they if they want to exit the system. So in the context of that too, I think one has to really address it holistically in terms of not just only who has access, who controls, and then ultimately how can that information be destructed and destroyed if necessary. Yes, because I think the owners of particular bits of data, um, they would have some say as to access and control of that data. So I think that's a very important topic that would merit um, a further discussion. But we have to, unfortunately, we have to move on. And the last part of this question, Alex, since you're on, um, I would ask if you take up this part of the question because it speaks to the risks of digital payments, cybersecurity and fraud. So if, you've, if you have any experience um, on your platform dealing with cybersecurity and fraud. Thank you. Um, cybersecurity, as Quincy would have spoken to earlier, alluded to earlier, is a very, very, very core element of any digital solution because that is, that is the confidence that gives the system credibility, et cetera. And it is, and most of us digital providers, that's the one thing that will keep us up at, at, at night. And so the, the, the issue is to prevent information. The key elements, for example, and if I were to allude to something like PCI DSS, the key element to complete a transaction, the question would be, can even if you were to have a secure, um, let's say someone were to get into your system, can they know enough to do any particular damage or do anything? And so there are multiple layers and approach um, um, in terms of security and cybersecurity as it relates to consumer data. And is, there's no one says that fit all, but there are some very, very, very prudent standards. And one of the things we adapt from, from our perspective is only we take and only take what we need. And even the information that we need, for instance, how we encrypt, anonymize, dis, um, distribute that data, it makes it near to impossible, out, um, near to impossible to basically reconstruct and then basically uh, for anyone to use that um, information for malicious purposes. So that has been our approach because uh, especially given the fact that we're in the Caribbean, we are, there's a lag between us and developed countries. There is the credibility frontier that we need to transcend. So we have to be twice as uh, 10 times, for instance, more cautious as it relates to um, person's data because any slips, um, we, can, we are not as big as PayPal, as, as Cash App and a number. We don't have the, 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 the backing of say the ECCB, et cetera. So what we cannot afford to do is to make mistakes. And so we have taken um, some innovative ways of just basically um, just making sure that even the data that is transmitted is so anonymized that you would have had to expect the transaction, et cetera, to be able to, 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 to use it, so to speak. So I, I hope that that answers um, um, Kiliman's your question without me saying specific um, things. Yes, yes. Thank you for that, Mr. Strong. We will take a question, sorry, we will pose a question to the ITC. In 2018, the theme of the ITC's flagship publication, SME Competitiveness Outlook, was business ecosystems for the digital age. In your presentation, you highlighted the importance and challenges of the last mile. In your experience, researching and working with MSMEs in developing countries across the world, what are some of the best practices, tools, lessons, and innovations which can aid in the development and efficiency of the last mile? And if you could just speak to the definition and meaning of the last mile first. Okay, well, you know, uh, when, when I hear last mile, I 
think of um, logistics that we're talking delivery here. Um, okay, so not that this is a bit out of context for payment uh, solutions. Clearly, uh, that's an expensive part of e-commerce, uh, putting a package in a customer's hand. So, um, you know, best best practices. Uh, we we have many. Uh, we've seen many uh, uh, companies converting along the uh, the model of Uber, but Uber package delivery companies have sprung up just about everywhere where we have projects. People that are local companies, you know, I'm thinking of one in, in, in Uganda, as an example, that's, that was ferrying people around on motorcycles during COVID has turned into a package delivery company. Um, a particular interesting example was uh, Grasshoppers, uh, which was set up in Sri Lanka, uh, which was set up by the largest na uh, native e-commerce platform and managed to set up a kind of um, franchised hub and spoke network where it set up drop uh, shipping places around small merchants who managed then to collect self-employed motorcycle drivers. They developed an app uh, so that they had across Sri Lanka people who were delivering. So, you know, that there are many examples of, of best practice in last uh, last mile is that is that on topic? I feel that this is a little bit out of side of payment solutions. I mean, but of course that supposes. Well, that according. Now. Yeah, sorry. According to your report, uh, um, when we on the last mile topic, as I read, mm. um, apart from logistics, it spoke about access to internet in a lot of rural areas using balloons. You look at, um, for instance, you look at what Tesla is doing now with Stalling. It gives an ability to beam internet, which which makes it makes makes make, it gives access to payment processing, e-commerce, um, so, digital payment solution. Okay. So it, it was sort of from from that. Yeah. Okay, sure. So, so next, there are there are the, so for instance, the balloon uh, business was 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 with Google uh, in in Africa. I think after a, a few years of piloting. Uh, they've recently dropped that. Uh, they've not made a case for it, which is a little bit upsetting. I think they're, you know, they're regrouping and considering uh, the lessons learned. So I'll, I think it, the project is, is paused. Uh, we were talking to Microsoft uh, recently about what they were doing on, on white space, uh, on TV white spaces. So to reutilize uh, Spectrum, which is not used by uh, television, uh, to set up uh, low cost, uh, connectivity with Wi-Fi uh, between communities. So that's that's an interesting development. Yeah. Right. And what penetration rate do you see for in terms of internet access in the rural communities? In terms of a percentage value? Very, very a very wide uh, variance depending on where we're talking about. I mean, a country like Kenya, which has its much vaunted uh, solutions with with, with, with M-Pesa. Uh, there we have, you, you, you have huge, uh, M-Pesa is dominating cash now as a form of payment. So in terms of a, you know, low technology, even a 2G uh, uh, device can be used for uh, payment solutions. But um, we see very rapid, soon out of, of, of built up urban areas, uh, digital penetration, digital connectivity falls off very quickly, even in somewhere relatively developed like Kenya. So if you pass to countries like uh, DRC or uh, uh, you know more out of the way uh, places, um, uh, you know you, you're looking in in rural areas, 10, 15 percent uh, uh, connectivity is is not uncommon. So there's a big push. Uh, we know uh, that half of the world is unconnected, but that half that's unconnected is very often in rural places, it's LDCs. So this is exactly the community that there's a lot of work got to go on to, to think about how those solutions can be put in place. Yeah, so suffice it to say that at once we are able to get more connectivity, um, there is still, if we think it's a huge market now, it's going to be even that much bigger once we press our local governments and our regional institutions to push for more connectivity. Well, and, and cost is, you know, the, the, the thing that we find also, there is 
connectivity in a lot of areas. If you look at a country like Rwanda, you know, sorry to pick on African examples, but you probably want to know about with pretty much 100% connectivity, but that doesn't mean 100% of people are connected because there's a problem of affordability. And, you know, there's a big push about affordability of devices and, uh, you know, uh, 3, 3G. Uh, and I know that that's, a, that's also an issue in Caribbean where some of the data rates are very high. So uh, take up requires effort to be made on reducing costs of connectivity. Thank you for that, Mr. Ho. We pose a question to Mr. Prentice, latest ARK investment reports. Um, it's a hedge fund in the US um, and they have a FinTech fund. One of the reports on the FinTech sector in the US shows that the cost of customer acquisition for a traditional bank is approximately $1,000 per customer versus $20 for a fintech, what does your bank does your bank have a strategy and a policy for partnering and fostering fintechs, and what does this entail? Uh, Jody, I think you're posing that question to me. I think I, I, you dropped out there a bit. Yeah, I'm posing the question to you. Would you like me oh, to repeat it? Yes. Yes, sure, sure. That would be good. Thanks. Yeah. So one of the latest ARK investment reports on the fintech sector in the U.S shows that the cost of customer acquisition for a traditional bank in the US is approximately 1,000 US per customer versus $20 per customer for a FinTech. Does your bank have a strategy and policy for partnering and fostering FinTechs? And what does this entail if you do have a strategy? Yes. Because surely I think it's a, it's a very efficient means and a very cost-effective means um, for you guys to make money. Of course. I think we, we, we're definitely uh, in agreement with you. Uh, and I see Alex smiling. I'm not sure why he's smiling. <laughs> but um, that has been identified by the bank uh, as one of its key strategic objectives in our, in our ongoing uh, strategic plan in terms of uh, collaborating and, and coordinating with fintechs uh, in, in uh, enha overall enhancing the, the fin financial services industry uh, locally and regionally as well. Um, I can't speak too much in terms of the, the specifics of, of the, uh, the specific strategic objectives that we are currently pursuing, uh, but suffice to say, uh, we do see a uh, component of our strategy uh, going forward. And we will continue to work. Uh, we do have uh, you know, a, an extensive array of services, uh, e-commerce uh, services, that can be leveraged uh, by fintechs uh, to uh, enhance their service offers, offerings uh, to customers and to their own merchants as well. Um, you know, that certainly we, we think uh, puts us in a good position to, to be able to deliver on that, uh, that uh, objective going forward. Thank you. Um, Jody? Um, yes. Um, I just wanted to um, to just piggyback on Quincy's answer, just to, to point out that even for us as a developing uh, fintech, I wanted to to speak to the effect that na that Quincy's bank, the Sinkis Nevis Angola National Bank, um, they uh, compared to other institutions that we would have um, spoken to, they were not um, they facilitated the discussion. They were welcoming. They gave us advice, and they have been. We see them as a partner throughout the very process of of developing our fintech wallet because they they did not. You know, some persons we just basically said, "Oh, we don't understand it. Go away." Um, they basically they were they were willing to sit down with us at the table to pursue to 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 rip it apart to understand it and advise us even in terms of the risk and participating in, in the the payment system on a whole. So I would echo um, Quincy's sentiment in saying it, in that they have a strong um, the favor fintech development um, strongly. And I just wanted to publicly just say um, thanks to the Sinki Nevis Angola National Bank for their facilitation. Thanks, Alex. We will take a, a question from the Q&A section. 
And this one comes from someone who sells souvenirs and craft items on the sidewalk to cruise ship tourists. We're gonna to get a lot of this. So the question is, I live in St. Vincent, so cannot receive payments through PayPal. What platform can I use to collect payments from those tourists who prefer not to use cash? If anyone can chime in here and answer that question. So this is a practical MSME issue. So this should be a question to one of the banks or one of the... If, if you permit me, Jody, um, and this is not necessarily to just uh, put a plug, but um, our wallet um, is one a designed to be multi-currency and facilitates uh, onboarding for these very specific environment. Once we can, um, ahead of time or with sufficient due diligence um, on board a tourist, they can use their credit card or debit card as the case may be. It doesn't need to be credit or debit card to load their wallet and make payment to a vendor. So for example, we could work in tandem with a vendor in a situation like that where the vendor takes um, the person's ID was, the person could be put into a credit card transaction and once the, the vendor simultaneously of taking the payment validates that the person is who they say they are, etc. with the credit card, we can facilitate that vendor and within 24 hours to 48 hours have the funds in that vendor's bank account if that vendor needs to cash out of our digital wallet. So that's just to say these are some of the initiatives that we have. Um, we recognize that fintechs can't just develop just on a basis of, okay, your yeah, digitization, et cetera. We have to meet our clients where they are. And so what we would always do is work in tandem with our commercial banks or, or, or bank partner. And once we can adequately warrant um, validate that the, 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 the tourists is who they say they are, the nature of the transaction to a point to, such that we could negate any possibility of chargebacks, then we could always facilitate such payments on behalf of a street side vendor. And I'll, I'd also add- um, Thanks that, Alex. Uh, while, while we do not offer services in, in St. Vincent, um, certainly there would be uh, vendors uh, such as the person who posed a question within our own borders in St. Kitts and Nevis. And for, for those types of vendors, we do offer uh, a service. It's a mobile uh, POS, uh, doesn't require uh, power. Uh, it's come um, and it works wirelessly so that you, you would through Wi-Fi connection or through a, a built-in SIM card. Um, there are solutions out there uh, that would facilitate uh, you know, businesses such as that, uh, that would want to, to accept uh, transactions from, from tourists. And this would most typically be in the form of credit, credit or debit card uh, transaction. And certainly if, if there is such a merchant that is looking to uh, spread their wings even further, uh, because I don't think that all merchants should limit themselves uh, to just the borders of their, their specific jurisdiction. Um, there is, uh, the, the world is essentially your oyster and we do offer a wide array of, of e-commerce uh, services that would allow a merchant to even uh, venture beyond the shores of, of their respective ju jurisdictions in terms of being able to uh, set up an, an online platform you know, that would allow them to accept transactions online uh, and, and you know, those, those sort of things. So I think there, there are a wide array of, um, of, of services that are available that could facilitate um, trade by merchants such as those. Um, of course, I think, you know, as financial institutions, we perhaps could do a better job of packaging these solutions uh, in, in a way uh, that makes it easier uh, for these uh, small and micro businesses to actually access, access these, uh, these types of services as well. And that is something that we, that we're certainly working on in terms of uh, bringing a package uh, that you know, that would be more readily accessible uh, by these small and, and micro businesses. Yeah. Thanks. I think this is a, a great time to hear from Ms. Renee Thomas, who is the co-founder and operations director of Carabytes. If Renee could speak about some of the challenges she's faced 
um, in terms of doing business, in terms of accepting payments, and what she would like to see. Are you hearing me right now? Yes, okay, we are. Okay, great. Yeah, I can definitely step in. Um, so just to give you some background, I'm from Carabites, which is an online food delivery service, and we operate in Grenada. And we also operate in Antigua, St. Vincent, and we're hoping to launch in St. Lucia soon. It's been a challenge. There are lots of ups and downs in terms of we're grateful for the ACH facility, which allows us to send payments regionally. So that's a bonus. And it's very helpful in terms of sending funds to and from banks in the Eastern Caribbean. However, it can become expensive in terms of the amount of transactions that you're doing. And we are a high volume business and it makes it a little bit costly for any small business coming up to take on such an, an expense to begin with. But then we do have some hiccups when it comes to reach, getting funds from your partners. So let's say you have a partner in another island and they don't have ACH set up in their bank account or they're not necessarily familiar with some of the technology available. There's some hiccups because when you head to a bank, even though it's the same name, so to speak, of the same financial institution in those countries, there's sometimes some hiccup in terms of depositing funds from one, even though it's the same bank in another jurisdiction. So we do have some hiccups when it comes to receiving funds, but dispersing it is not a challenge for us, despite the um, cost. Other than that, it was a bit of a challenge in terms of getting people familiar with the idea. Not everyone was keen or open to the thought of, I can send you money that, that digitally, I guess it was just a foreign concept and not everyone has bank accounts set up. So ACH worked really well for us for bank to bank transactions. But when it comes to some partners having credit unions, there's a little bit of a hiccup there because credit unions now bank at a bank. And so then you have to send the money to their financial institution, which is a bank, and then they need to redirect the funds to the credit union to their respective person's account. So that is a little bit of a hiccup. I do think there's opportunities for improvement. I would love to see greater connection with regional banks, at least in the ECCB, banks that are from the same country. So if I go to another bank in, let's say, St. Vincent's, just as if I go to Chase in New York and I go to Chase in you know, California, I can do the same things. I would love to see something like that coming up so that it, it improves the transaction for small businesses in particular because it can become expensive to do a wire to Barbados, even though it's outside of the ECCB or even other transaction that may pop up. So the cost really makes it challenging for small, micro and small businesses, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you happy with the current means of accepting your payments now? Is this something else that you'd like to see? Yes, um, currently most of our transactions are actually digital so like people um we partner with a bank and then they have we use a gateway provider so that allows people to promise process payments directly on our website and even local customers not just tourists love that because now they could just pull out their debit card put in the information even though credit card usage may be low i can't see that information from our end but i remember earlier someone said credit union um, credit card utilization is low debit card users get that benefit just as well and people love it because now you go in you put in your information and then you're you're free to go and you get your funds um so from that respect it is but it, as i said it gets costly because now you have to pay the gateway provider you also have to pay the local bank and it, and then on top of that you want to ensure your service is affordable or attractive to your audience because if it, if it comes the fees are too high then it's a deterrent i do think in terms of financial institutions I'm aware of some of the challenges that they face in terms of being able to, for security reasons and measures, it can be costly for them, but it took about six months to set up our, our gateway provider platform in the first instance. And that's a really long time. Um, if a small business is trying to, to get set up, if you're in the US or other countries, you could get started in minutes. Now, I'm not saying we should be there right away, but I do think there's a lot of opportunities to make that process faster and smoother, especially for um, MSMEs, because it can be a deterrent. Okay, thanks for that. No, um, no Ricardo, problem. how are we How are we on time, Ricardo? 
Um, we are ahead of time. Um, the next session is supposed to start in about um, 20, oh no, sorry, about 15 minutes. Okay, great. So we can take some more questions um, from Q&A as well. Yes. Th this question um, is, it, I think it would be fitting for both the ECCB and possibly, um, again, one of the FinTech players. We, 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 we'll, we've heard some of the pain points in the region regarding um, from both the, the processing side, from both the, the, the MSME side. Um, Renee just spoke about, you know, getting, taking six months to, um, for her to set up, um, you know, being able to accept payments. This question is for, I'd like the ECCB to, to comment on this. How soon or how far are we from interoperability and integration between Dcash and existing fintechs? And how deep should we expect interoperability and integration to be? So if the ECCB could speak to that, because I think it's a very important question. Um, the fintechs are the innovators. If you look at the sand dollar, for, exist, for, for example, I believe in the Bahamas, the sand dollar has brought in local fintechs into the ecosystem from very early. Um, I think that is the state of play in the Bahamas. So how far are we from interoperability and integration between Dcash and existing fintechs? And how deep should we expect interoperability and integration to be? Yeah. Well, the interoperability question is, as you would appreciate, it is, it is forefront in the discussion. And um, how far are we? I couldn't say definitively, but um, the pilot is for one year. And in that pilot, that one year pilot, what we anticipate, what we expect is for people to get acclimatized with the infrastructure. As you um, would have put in previous discussions, there may be a resistance to change. People, people like to, you know, see they had cash in, the, in, in, in their hands, in their in the pockets. So the, 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 the pilot is able to pretty much move, you know, deal with the cultural aspect of it. But we're also speaking with, with, with I want to call it the, the National Cooperation Payments of India. And they, 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 had a, a, they have a spectacular model, if I may say so myself, on the UPI, in which what, what, what they currently have is, well, they have something like, 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 like a decash. However, all the commercial banks, all the commercial banks that are, that are, that are licensed by the central bank Will have access to that particular infrastructure and what goes on afterwards is that all the the regulated e-wallets would have access to the upi and so therefore we see interoperability seamless and that is what they're pushing they, 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 have, they, they have shown us so we're having a discussion with them and 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 and, and, and we can see from that that perspective how we can bring in interoperability into the payment space with the cash. But like I say, in the pilot stage, we're not focused on interoperability per se. We're focusing on changing the culture. We're focusing on getting people used to the idea of, of, of using a wallet, we're trying to move them away from cash. And oh, after that, 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 that period, then we move full force into the, the interoperability segment. However, in the interim, we're speaking to countries that have addressed the interoperability issue. Thanks. Um, it would be thanks for that, um, Francis. It would be great to hear from um, an existing wallet provider um, in response to to the response from the ECCB. So, if we if I call on Mr. Strong again, um, you are a fintech in the region. Do you think? You know, what are your comments on this approach? Do you think interoperability should have run side by side? Um, during the pilot phase, or should it have been part of the pilot phase? What are your thoughts? Um, I would endorse, well, okay. Um, at the risk of being flogged by Mr. Um, uh, Fontenelle, I believe that interoperability should have been um, uh, upfront consideration. 
Why so? Because I believe that having in, in myself looked at the DXCD right now, I believe that in order to consider interoperability, they would have to break the system somewhat to even factor that in um, because it was developed around a wallet rather than around a system, the rather than the, it being developed around a system in terms of the, the, the currency and the blockchain, I don't think how it was, it was designed so spe specific around a wallet and putting this wallet in the hands of the users that I, um, even in terms of the transmitting of transactions, that consideration would mean now that they have to revisit the entire blockchain. So it is my view that if interoperability was high on the agenda, that it, it, from, it would have been instructive to the entire design process. And so therefore we would be able to have faster take up, faster, in fact, the central bank would have, to, would have had to do less work. Um, instead of going it alo alone, they would have had the, the buy-in and from every wallet and they would have had a framework, whether that framework would have had minimum criteria for participation, et cetera, and whether they, they would have still had the wallet running simultaneously to that for countries that didn't have FinTech operators. I believe that they missed the, 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 there's some element of missing the mark by not involving um, or scoping or factoring interoperability upfront. And so the pilot would run for a year, but I think it's going to be a hurdle now um, because the Dcash is going to be running basically as a independent wallet, but to get into operability for that, I don't think there is any markers on that blockchain, for example, for identifying different wallets or sub wallets, et cetera. So interoperability is going to be a hard um, um, hill to climb even after the pilot. So I believe the approach of Bahamas was, was more inclusive, but also more to the benefit of the consumer, because it means that not only was the, the, the virtual currency being rolled out, but you had uh, um, not, no duplication of resources. You didn't have to duplicate value added. You didn't have to duplicate. Ex, um, and so existing customers wouldn't have to migrate from, say, a wallet in St. Vincent to do the DXD, a wallet in St. Vincent to do the, the DXD, a wallet in, in, in St. Sinkets to do the DXD. And so right now you would have to some extent a duplication of resources and persons then trying to, to weigh which wallet or which, uh, um, which approach to take to benefit from some of the initiatives rolling out. So I, personally believe that um, interoperability um, from an infrastructure perspective, the DXD is an awesome project for infrastructure, but I think interoperability should have been upfront and on the table. Okay, thanks, Alex. Um, there have been some comments posted in the Q&A and these comments uh, with respect to the ECCB's response and Jad Cash's response on this interoperability issue, um, adoption rates. Um, so the, I believe the sentiment is in the, in the Q and A chat box is that adoption could be more widespread and quicker if you if you actually launch with interoperability. And I can see where that is coming from because the existing fintechs they already have thousands of customers and it would be very easy. Um, it would be easier to onboard people onto Dcash once you have proper integration and interoperability. So it's something for the ECCB to consider. I, I wanna echo that sentiment as well, Jody, because I think uh, what we see with a lot of these platforms, uh, it's the, the, the classical uh, two-sided market problem. Uh, whereas uh, you may have merchants that are onboarding but without uh, a willing uh, pool of customers who are actually really interested in, in utilizing the platform, it sort of limits the, the, the growth and, and almost stunts the growth of, of, the, of the payment platform. So I do think that there would, would have been some benefit in, in sort of opening it up uh, 
in the initial stages. I, I also uh, can appreciate, uh, you know, the, the approach that has been taken by the central bank in terms of perhaps taking a, a slightly more conservative approach in terms of having it closed, whereby they can have a, a good understanding of, of the platform in the early stages uh, with the expectation that it would be opened up through APIs and the like uh, later on. Uh, but I do think um, typically what you see with these types of payment platforms, it's a two-sided uh, market uh, system. So there's no point in having merchants that are, are on the system. And indeed, having merchants on the system is almost predicated on, on having uh, consumers on the system. And to a certain extent, having consumers on the system, because as a consumer, uh, I am not really going to be interested in having a wallet if there's no place for me to, to utilize that wallet. So they both go hand in hand. And I think uh, uh, this sort of feeds into something that was pointed out earlier in terms of being able to collaborate and, and form partnerships in terms of driving uh, the overall adoption of, of digital payment systems throughout the region. Thank you, Tony. I, 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 I just want to add yeah, here. Go ahead, Francis. There, there's, there's no really, there's not, we don't have a, a current governance framework to onboard wallet providers. So we have to put this thing in place first. You see? Because, you know, I mean, a lot of persons want to come in with a wallet. They want to be a, a wallet provider. But do you have the, the various, um, do, do you meet the requirement of being a wallet provider? You know, so these things have to be ironed out first. You know, so everything is yes. happening together. It's happening in tandem. And that is why the central bank said, is saying, okay, we're going to bring out the wallet. We're going to make people get accustomed to the wallet. Because as you said, as, you, as we, have, we would have heard previously, many persons are not confident about a wallet unless they know that there is a strong entity behind that wallet. And we think we can address that issue as a central bank. To, 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 to remove that fear for persons using an, a, 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 a wallet. And that we think that can be addressed within the coming year. But the APIs, when that wallet is, was configured, it was configured with the APIs, you know, to be added on later on in the project. I, I, I appreciate the point that Alex is making. I do, I must confess, but there are different ways to skin a cat. Point taken. Um, and Jody, if I may jump in here again, um, and I want a second, we are not saying that the ECCB shouldn't have grounds to be conservative, um, but the interoperability is more than an API. So for example, um, if interoperability is to work, and if you look at the design of the DXD, you notice the, the, the wallet centric focus. Now, if you look also in terms of how persons are onboarded, you note that the user ID is on the 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 blockchain itself uh, on the that single wallet um, um, infrastructure blockchain, which means no matter what um, is going to happen, no matter each the members of every wallet has to be a member of the DXCD wallets blockchain. So interoperability from the from this in the strictest sense will not happen what um what because it, the design of it is is predicated on you being a member of the dxd now interoperability from this say, say sand dollar perspective meant that there are some information that's going to interchange so an existing user may not necessarily need to sign up on the, in the DXCD wallet, but that information can interchange between the two of them. So I can actually spend DXCD and receive DXCD into my wallet without first signing up in the DXCD. So that is a whole interoperability is not just APIs. And which is why I alluded to the fact that outside of the classic two side story, um, the design, if the, the, there were no discussions per se, along the lines of interoperability. And so it, to put it in as an, after, uh, as an afterthought, I believe would be a tremendous, it would require a tremendous effort. And so I think there was some capital or some opportunities lost on that perspective. The API is going to be interesting to see how that could be integrated, but I still think that interoperability will not be as, as, as 
effective and as efficient as what would happen in the sand dollar experience. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Fontenelle. And Mr. Fontenelle's point is very well taken. Um, both points are very well taken from um, the bank side, from the FinTech side, from the ECCB side. Um, and what is very important as well is for there to be some sort of a uniform governance structure that uh, FinTechs need to dial into. For instance, from KYC, setup requirements, technical capabilities, et cetera. Um, so the interoperability issue hinges on a number of factors. So all points are very well taken. I will fire off a question now for, let's get back to the role of banks in this market. What are some of the steps that can, that can be taken to make it easier for MSMEs to access and utilize FinTech solutions? And for this answer, I will lean again on Mr. Prentice. So, so we're talking, we're speaking about making it easier. What are some of the steps that can be taken to make it easier for MSMEs to access and utilize FinTech solutions? Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there are a number of things that, that could be done uh, to, to make it easier for MSMEs to access these types of solutions. I think it's not just on the FinTech side though. Uh, there's a certain element of education that I think is, is needed. Um, that would sort of enable uh, the MSMEs to really and truly understand the value of uh, the inherent value of having access to these types of, of services. I think there, we, we tend to get hung up on the cost, uh, the upfront cost, whether it's of purchasing the POS, is it the uh, cost of the transaction in terms of the merchant discount rate? I think we get hung up on, on those sorts of things without uh, really truly stepping back and, and getting an understanding of, okay, what is my true cost of doing a transaction that utilizes cash? Uh, what are the inherent risks of utilizing, uh, or doing transactions uh, utilizing cash? Um, so I think uh, there's certainly an element of education that would assist um, MSMEs in really truly understanding uh, the, the value of adopting these types of services. Uh, we, we also can look at uh, the inherent barriers to entry uh, in terms of adopting uh, some of these solutions. Um, finding solutions that uh, are more uh, tailored uh, to MSMEs, whether it's uh, in terms of the capital investment that might be required upfront uh, to deploy a point of sale uh, solution and working, uh, working with our various partners to develop solutions uh, to the past businesses. Um, all, uh, perhaps outside of the financial sphere would be the infrastructure requirements. Uh, working, uh, and this would be more on the regulatory and the government side, in terms of working with the various uh, ISPs and, and various service provider to ensure that uh, the requisite infrastructure is where it needs to be uh, with regards to things such as quality of service, uh, bandwidth, um, that uh, is essentially a pre prerequisite to, to many of these businesses uh, being able to, to adopt uh, these types of solutions, all right? Um, and then uh, finally, in terms of some of the legal and regulatory requirements, um, it's, I mean, it, it can be very challenging to, to get beyond these uh, hurdles in some respects, but I think uh, partnerships uh, with fintechs and between fintechs and, and uh, financial institutions, um, I think uh, can work and, and provide synergies to allow uh, MSMEs to ultimately benefit um, fintechs have a unique ability uh, to be nimble. Uh, in some respects, they have a better understanding and uh, they have a better capacity to, to deploy technology uh, than traditional banks do. And I think uh, it's, it's in, um, incumbent on all parties related to understand um, the various uh, strategic advantages of a bank versus a fintech and a fintech uh, versus a bank and work together uh, to form those partnerships so that the, the MSMEs uh, ultimately uh, would be, and everyone, I think everyone would, would essentially benefit 
Um, I think that those are some of the key areas that, that uh, could, could be worked on to, to ultimately uh, realize some benefits uh, for, for MSMEs and all, all concerned. Thank you very much, Quincy. Um, I think the takeaway here, because we're running short on, on time, I believe, Ricardo, if we do a time check, it might be time to move on. Um, yeah, we have just passed um, the, the time that we have slotted, so maybe we can just do for five more minutes um, to... Right. Yeah. Right. Mr. Um, Howe had a question. Leave... Mr. No, Howe Mr. Howe had, had to leave. He had to leave. Yeah, he had to leave. So I think one of the takeaways from this discussion is that I don't want to say banks have gotten, they haven't gotten a free pass. Banks have invested a tremendous amount of money in the region. Um, however, if you look at the, the, the uh, what, what you term traditional R&D budgets, um, they've been benefiting from the risks that, that, that fintechs have been taking. Um, fintechs and startups are the innovators. And what we'd like to see in this region is a, a framework, and I know we're working towards it, a framework for more support assistance um, in terms of FinTech innovation and a deeper partnership between the banks, the banking architecture, the ECCB, and the innovators in the region. Um, I really believe that they, and, and this is something that I'm thinking about introducing for St. Lucia in my capacity as Deputy Chairman of Invest St. Lucia, to set up St. Lucia as a sort of a regional fintech hub. So to give, you know, battle for government for all the concessions, um, great policy for setup, for establishment of fintechs. I think it's needed. We need something akin to a Silicon Valley um, in the region regarding fintech solutions, because we quite frankly develop things in this region, such as what Alex has done, such as what um, Hannah has done with um, Penny Pinch. These are things that can be exported globally. Um, very nimble, very great solutions. Um, I would solicit um, some final comments from Francis Fontenelle on behalf of the ECCB regarding the state of play of um, you know digital payments for MSME growth in the OECS. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I mean, there's no, I mean, I don't. We have heard this morning individuals expose the the, the the benefits of, of, of digital payments, digital technology. And digital payments is just part of the digital technology because we're moving in that particular direction. So we, we couldn't move without incorporating digital payments. And the central bank, certainly as a, as a facilitator, as a regulator, as a user, is conscious of all the efforts that, 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 that needs to take place in that regard. The, the, the central bank doesn't want to stifle innovation. It's one thing the governor has said, and he continues to say all the time. We don't want to stifle innovation. But at the same time, the central bank is responsible for the financial stability of the region. So there's that trade-off. <laughs> you know, there's that playing that, that that role of not stifling innovation, of developing the region as far as payments are concerned in other areas, but at the same time maintaining the financial integrity. And this is how we want to proceed. And we would have, we would have done this by initiating the legislative framework. There are three pieces of legislation that we are currently working on: the data protection. Development of the Payment Systems Act and the regulation for electronic retail payments and digital technology, which would include um, the e-wallets and, and, and the like. So, I can foresee within the not too distant future the, the, the infrastructure that, that 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 foundation that is necessary to develop the, the, the region from a technical a digital perspective being laid down, which will augur well for the other for the, for the takeoff of the region as far as digital payments and digital technology is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. And with that, with those points and comments, we will end off the fireside chat. Um, so please remember the role of the ECCB. The ECCB wants to ensure as much and, and as best as possible 
the viability and the stability of the financial system. So they're taking uh, a measured approach because the ECCB is not in this for the next three years or the next 10 years. Um, this is for the future of the region. So fintechs must bear a little patience as well with the ECB's approach to um, you know, harnessing the, the value of digital payments in the OECS region. So Ricardo, thank you for all the fireside chat panelists and I will hand it over now to Ricardo James. Um, well, thank you, Jody. Well, we are now going on to the next segment, um, which Jody you will also be um, um, moderating. This is the segment where we are actually going to hear what is on the ground um, with um, digital payment solutions. So we're going to hear from a number of the financial institutions like the banks and the fintech companies who are going to present their digital payment solutions. So this is, um, I mean, the discussions we have had so far have been very useful. They have given us a sense of where we are in the region. They've given us a sense of the framework, the ecosystem, where the gaps um, might be. Um, and the work that needs to be done. And I think the discussion was very enlightening and um, the OECS and the ECCB and the other institutions and the work that um, we are doing with Complete Caribbean, that information will help us in charting the way forward. Um, but now we're going to hear from the um, FinTech companies and the financial institutions. Um, there will be short presentations of 10 minutes each and after each presentation, there will be question and answers. Those in the um, audience, um, please um, listen to these presentations. And if you have questions, please post them in the chat. You might have questions about how the um, solutions being presented, how they operate. You need some clarity, you need some information. So please put them. And when you're doing so, you may want to identify um, which, um, which um, presentation you're referring to, because we're going to deal with each of the, we're going to take the questions after each presentation. Okay, so I will now then hand over to, to Jody again, um, and we will go up till lunchtime, then we will have a break um, for about 40 minutes, um, and then we will come back after lunch. Um, we will have a different moderator. I will take it from, from there on in terms of the rest of the presentations from the banks and the financial institutions. So um, thanks to the panelists from the, uh, who participated in the um, fireside chat. Um, so, Jody? Thanks, Ricardo. So this is part is the digital payments exposition. And as Ricardo had stated, um, each presenter would please keep the presentation to 10 minutes and they will be afforded a five minutes for Q&A. So the first presenter will be Mr. Richard Medford, who is the manager of electronic services and retail operations at Grenada Cooperative Bank. Mr. Medford, please take yeah, it away. Yes, just, um, just one, one correction. Um, mm -hmm. Duncan. Correct. Roger Duncan, he has been replaced. He was replaced, sorry about that. Oh, okay, no problem. So Roger Duncan has replaced Mr. Richard Medford. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Dunn. All right, just sharing my screen now. Uh, right, can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much um, to the OECS Competitive Business Unit. Good morning to um, panelists and our viewing and listening audience. Uh, my name is Roger Duncan. Uh, thanks for the correction, Manager of Customer Care. Um, our Manager Electronic Services Unit, Mr. Richard Medford was unable to be here, but I'm able to take you through this presentation. Uh, digital payments. Uh, first, uh, let me tell you briefly about us. Grenada Cooperative Bank is the sole indigenous commercial bank on the island of, of Grenada and the first indigenous bank uh, in the region. Uh, we commenced operations in 1932 
The bank currently has a uh, asset size of in excess of 1 billion EC dollars. And uh, our customer centricity is a core uh, of our service delivery. And of course, technology uh, is the main vehicle um, behind SIEM. Let's look at uh, our digital payment solutions. Uh, first, uh, e-merchant services via our e-banking platform. This is targeted to corporations, uh, firms, and individuals uh, who has agreed to accept online bill payments via our e-banking service. Uh, merchants can, of course, receive from their customers uh, who are users of our electronic banking services payments, uh, such like utility uh, payments, as well as higher purchase payments, and the list goes on. Um, in Grenada, we have quite a number of um, uh, e-merchant um, customers on, uh, such as higher purchase firms, national insurance scheme, insurance companies. Uh, uh, you, you have uh, you, all the utility um, companies, light, telephone, water, and, um, and then you have a, a, a real interest, growing interest, and sign up now from a number of um, insurance as well as private um, um, education, um, school, private uh, institutions. Of course, the, there are some requirements for onboarding. Uh, cost to merchants is two EC dollars per transaction. Let's look at the typical transaction flow. What happens that the customer signs on to uh, the e-banking and uh, will choose the will choose the e-merchant on the platform as uh, the desires of making a payment to. Um, the bank approves the transaction and that, uh, that amount gets credited to or deposited to the customer's uh, business account held with us. And daily we provide to the merchant um, via email a report of the payments uh, made through the e-banking platform. The requirements for setting up the e-merchant service, of course, you are required to have a deposit um, account with us. And, and of course, internet access within your organization. So you are able to get on to um, the, the e-banking as well as uh, your, uh, monitor your payments and so on. Um, you, you require also, in order to identify the payment, a sort of a billing and invoice um, um, statement or unique uh, document or code for each customer um, so that the payment is, um, is identifiable to a particular account or customer. And of course, a valid email address uh, which um, the bank will provide your daily reports to. Another payment solution, which is um, nothing new, um, our point of sale terminals. Um, requirements uh, for having point of sale terminals, uh, of course, is it, it, Ethernet connection, wired connection, uh, as, as well as um, um, having a business account with the bank, of course, is primary. The, the service, we provide both wired and wireless terminals. And these terminals are EMV, as European MasterCard, Visa, chip card ready. Um, contactless cards are also compatible with um, our systems. And we accept payments using the Visa, MasterCard, and American Express as well. The fees and charges, um, merchant discount rates on the point of sale terminal range from 3.35 to 4.5% of the transaction value charge um, to the merchant. Um, the four credit cards, it's 3.35% uh, on each transaction. The annual fee for the wired point of sale terminal is $250 per annum. And the wireless point of sale terminal is 450 EC dollars per annum. Of course, the wireless um, would just require a data chip card that a customer, the merchant, um, would provide 
to us uh, from any one of the service providers. Um, our preference here in Grenada is through the digital um, service provider. And at, at that cost, that cost uh, or the data chip is uh, to the merchant. And of course, the wireless uh, will allow you to process um, uh, card transactions at, at, at any location on island. Our international debit card um, connects uh, um, debit card. These allow customers to, of course, access your funds online and can be used any part of, of this world um, where Visa and MasterCards are accepted, both at ATMs and point of sale terminals. The fees for our debit card um, are as follows. So any transaction con conducted at a uh, Connex ATM, and just to uh, emphasize, um, the Connex is a a branded um, uh, solution. And it's a partnership between Grenada Cooperative Bank and a number of credit unions on the island, where we share the the license services of the um, debit card platform. Um, and any of the cards used at the, at, co at Cooperative Bank, as well as the credit unions, ATMs, on any POS um, that is Connex, um, the fees are as indicated here. So for ATM Connex transactions, it's 84 cents per transaction, which is really 73 cents plus the 15% um, fact. Uh, those transactions that are not on us, so if you're using an ATM um, card, on a non-connex um, institution, um, or, or it, it's going to be nine dollars and five cents. That's fat inclusive. And if it's a you're using it on a point of sale terminal that is non-connex, eighty four cents. The annual fee for the debit card is twenty four dollars and fifty six cents, and all of these charges here are fat inclusive. The replacement charge uh, for the debit card. Um, uh, if lost or stolen, $37.95. Um, there's a chargeback fee of $22.41. And uh, the use of the card online will attract a $0.84 cents, um, charge. And this is, of course, an EC currency. Credit card fees and charges um, or annual um, cardholder fee is $100 for the principal cardholder, um, of course. You have companies that uh, use credit cards and, and it, it's shared by approved um, holders. Additional card holder would be $50 for each uh, secondary card. Um, annual card fee, that's for the corporate card specifically, is $400 for the first employee for the first year and $200 thereafter. It's also $200 for each additional employee. So just for, the, for clear distinction, the first two charges speak primarily to um, individuals, and then you have the corporate card, um, which is several explanatory here. The cash advances, 2% of the amount of the advance is subject to a minimum of $10. Um, late payment fees on your credit card will attract 1.5% uh, of the minimum due for any billing period subject to a minimum of $15. And the replacement card is 25 EC dollars. If the card is in US currency, then the, the rate is applied in, in US uh, or the equivalent, the EC equivalent here to the US dollar at, uh, exchange rate of 2.7. Wire transfers. Of course, customers can use our wire transfer um, facility um, to transfer funds from the bank to account um, of that of a family or business um, through our correspondence bank, through our SWIFT address. Uh, this is a, a very convenient and highly secured means of transferring um, especially large amount of uh, funds. 
the while this is no new um, financial solution, um, what the bank has been engaged in in recent times is is making the use of some of these very um, well-known solutions, uh, making it much much more convenient and easier to use. So uh, within a very short time, and short, short time I speak to about two months, these wire transfer, the wire, your capability of using um, our wire transfer service would be extended uh, to any part of your location, at your office, at your home, on your mobile phone, uh, it doesn't matter where you are, uh, you will be able to log in and effect a wire transfer from whatever location you are, whether you are in your country, outside your country, wherever. The fees and charges for going wire transfers, as you would see here, uh, US uh, outgoing transfers with a tracker fee of $114.26. Um, Canadian 95, uh, sterling and euro 105. Royal Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, um, if it's TT, right, would be 45 EC dollars plus uh, 0 0.3125% of the EC equivalent. Uh, Barbados 45 EC dollars and St. Kitts Nevis, if it's an EC wire transfer. Uh, will attract a 45 EC dollars. Just one correction, the outgoing wires um, for US wires, it's $114.26 EC, not uh, US. For electronic funds uh, transfer, uh, which has been, um, been, is being used quite frequently by a number of merchants um, here with us. Um, as you know, customers within the ECC who can transfer funds from uh, their bank uh, to any other within the currency union. Uh, of course, like the wire transfer, uh, SWIFT address is used and large amounts of funds can be sent securely and quickly. And what you find is how you use um, the various payment solutions within the ecosystem will depend on um, um, the, the, the payment, um, the amounts, and what is much more uh, convenient. So while it, 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 while wire transfers is just as secure, um, if you are transferring funds within the region, ECCU, your best option will want to be uh, through EFT. Uh, it probably get there uh, much quicker than if it's a, a EC wire transfer. So for the EFT, um, third party or going um, transaction, that is uh, um, if you are making um, a transfer to another bank or such, will attract a fee of $10.50 EC. Uh, if you are a merchant that um, is using it for payroll, such that um, um, your list of employees uh, may be at, very, at different um, financial institutions, uh, one payroll request will be $19.55 EC. And then for each um, entry um, on the payroll list will attract a fee of uh, 30 cents. The benefits of the digital payment services, of course, uh, to merchants will definitely reduce your operational costs, uh, better record keeping, increase your efficiency in business operations. Uh, create a modern and customer-centric image uh, for, for you as a merchant. Um, provide swifter and more convenient ways to collect your payments. And, and in that, also um, increasing demand for, for consumer, um, as well as uh, enable your, enables uh, your competitive edge in the market. And of course, um, greater leverage that you have in receiving payments uh, from different channels uh, is much better for you and increase security in handling of funds. Uh, coming soon. Two, as two minutes, Roger. Two minutes, Roger. Right. Coming soon, as indicated before, um, is our EFT electric funds transfer and wire transfer available on our e-banking platform. 
And of course, you can log into our e-banking platform um, anywhere, any part of this world, and make um, um, a transfer via EFT within the ECCU, as well as effect wire transfers um, any part of this world. Also, coming soon is our ACH salary processing, um, uh, which merchants will find very useful and convenient. And Dcash, which will be launched tomorrow, um, will be our bank will be um, ready for for public application um, by next week. How to sign up for any of our products and services? Uh, you can log on to our website www.grenadacorebank.com, or you can visit any of our retail unit um, in person. Um, requirements, terms and conditions, and so on can be found on the very same website. Alternatively, um, you can contact us via the same website help desk or by sending us an email to info at grenadacorebank.com. With respect to compliance, standard KYC and AML CTF uh, procedures uh, apply. You can contact us at these numbers here and email us um, at any of these uh, addresses and uh, we would respond uh, within 24 hours. Thank you and uh, take your questions at this time. Thank you very much, Roger Duncan. He is from the Grenada Cooperative Bank. I will open up the floor for any questions for Mr. Duncan on his presentation. Yes, Jody, uh, there are two questions related to the fees. Um, uh, there's one that aren't these purely digital. Um, and thank you, Mr. Duncan, for this great presentation. On these purely digital transactions, why are the fees so high? And another one, why is the cost to send to Barbados the same as to send to St. Kitts? So the question is, the EFT, um, they thought was to provide a lower cost for transfers in the EC territories. OK, so. With respect to the fees, our fees and charges, um, uh, we pride ourselves by, if not being par, with what's available um, on the market, definitely lower. Um, in fact, we, our customer care charter specifically commit that, um, that our fee structure will be the lowest. So we actually review our fees uh, monthly or as we obtain feedback um, through market intelligence and through customer, uh, our, our quarterly uh, customer perception um, survey feedback and so on. And um, those feedback actually inform um, how we reschedule. So while it is at this now, um, there's no telling, um, given the market intelligence and what's happening, that we will revise. Our fees are constantly um, revisited so that we remain competitive um, in our fee structure. There was another question, I believe. Um, yeah, the question, if I remember clearly, the question was why the cost to send wire to Barbados is the same as sending to St. Kitts. The thinking was that um, one of the advantages of EFT was to lower the cost of sending within EC territories. So Barbados and St. Kitts, according to your fee structure, seems to be the same for sending wires. Okay, those are the wire transfer fees. Right. Um, well, I can't speak to the reason as to why it is currently the same, but I can tell you off the bat, in terms of uh, transfers within the ECCU, um, the solution we provide customers is the use of the EFT as opposed to the um, SWIFT wire transfer. And of course, the EFT uh, fees is uh, much lower um, in that context. In fact, EFT would be um, third party would go in $10.50 as opposed to if you use the SWIFT wire transfer that charges that 
that attracts a $45 fee. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, Ricardo, from the Q&A um, that you want to address? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Duncan, for your presentation. Much appreciated. If you have any final remark, um, you have an opportunity to please let us know now before we move on to the next presentation. Well, just to say that um, the, the, the bank um, um, service is driven by its own customer-centric strategy and uh, uh, frequent customer feedback informs um, every time um, new positions or altered positions that we take. Um, so it's not a static position with anything. Uh, we, we move the goalposts based on um, our customers' uh, needs and their responses. Thank you very much. The next, pre the next presentation will be delivered by Mr. Quincy Prentice, who's the, the CIO of St. Kitts, Nevis, Anguilla National Bank Limited. He was part of the fireside chat. So I gather Mr. Prentice is revved up to deliver his presentation. Mr. Prentice. I don't see Mr. Prentice, so maybe we can then proceed then to Mr. Alex Strong, who is, who is here. Okay. So we will defer Mr. Prentice's presentation for lower down the order if he comes back in. And we'll move up to Jad Cash presentation delivered by Mr. Alex Strong, who's the CEO of Jad Strong. Okay, uh, pleasant good day and um, thank you everyone. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, yes, yes so, we can. Okay, so excellent. Yes, um, again, thank you for the opportunity. And I'd just like to share with you this brief um, presentation while I'll go through it as quickly as possible. And now I am, um, well, just to start off, I just want to just highlight that JAD is a very customer centric um, solution derived and developed specifically from the pain points that we have experienced and from the interaction with our customers. So we tend to be very responsive and um, as it relates to customer and everything we do um, it revolves around the customer. So you will note that our tag says more than just payments, uh, we deliver solutions beyond the box. So we consider ourselves a solution oriented company. I wouldn't rehash, I mean, the presentation and DX did this morning really highlighted some of the objectives of why digital solutions are necessary, um, including the increased care, the efficiencies, high fees, and just the ability to move beyond the, 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 the typical status quo. And so what we are introducing to you here today is what we call JAD. And persons might ask why JAD? Because JAD speaks to the very ethos of why we exist. It means working together. And um, everything we do, there's no one size fit all. We have developed a platform that revolves around the customer needs. And it, sees, it starts here, it says no cash, no card, no problem. Um, no bank account required no equipment or software to install, just use what you have. In fact, you could take a sticker or business card, just stick it on the side of a building and get paid. Um, and that's the sort of solution that we have developed and we would continue to ensure that our customers, we meet them where they are. So if a customer have, don't have a smartphone, the question we would ask is, how do we get payment to a customer who don't have a smartphone or a ghetto razor, as we call it, and make sure that even with their business care that they can get paid. And so you see, um, whether it's via text, email, sticker, paper, a poster, consumer to consu uh, consumer instant funds transfer, um, consumer to business, business to consumer, and business to business. 
No, this just gives you an overview. I wouldn't spend much time on some of these screens on the wallet. And in fact, we continuously um, upgrade our wallets. So this would look different in a few. But what is JAD? JAD is a multifunction wallet solution developed with a Caribbean perspective, meaning also that it is not just the EC, it is not, it is not just EC dollar, that it is designed to be multi-currency. Um, it simplifies modernizing, it simplifies and modernizes the financial life of a business by making it easier for persons to pay and receive pay payments. Um, you access it from any web-enabled device and you don't have to, like even if your customer don't have to register with you to be able to use it. Registration on our wallet is necessary, but not registration as a customer. This is just a little video that I wanted to just share. Oh, sorry. We officially launched in February 2018 and the solution have over 9,000 users at over 650 micro business. We are working with other financial institutions, et cetera, to give even persons who don't have access to a debit or credit card access to being able to, to make payments at retail uh, outlets. The key features within the wallet is, as, as I indicated earlier, um, it's available on all platform and it covers all payments model, not just typical um, consumer to business, but it goes consumer to consumer and business to business. Um, Multi-function wallet setup and multi-channel um, and multi-user, meaning therefore, unlike having multiple devices, you could have a sticker at each of your cashiers and persons would be able to make payments from either of those stickers. You could have channels, you could have a different contract to collect payments online. Once a sticker stuck on your vehicle, you could get payments via just the mobile app. Um, and so there are no one channel that it is restricted to. So you could be up and running as a little as, I would say 10 minutes, but for conservative reasons, we said 15, and we have solutions that, you, that are available to you right outside of the box. Um, again, we do remote and immediate payment. So for example, you could get your bill in the mail and you could just scan your bill and pay it. Um, even if you're on the uh, on thing, you could get an email with your bill and you could just, um, just tap the bill and you would be able to pay it. Um, we could set up branded quick links, micro pages, et cetera, so that we could facilitate e-commerce and or um, physical interactions if needs to be. We also facilitate bulk payment. Just to demonstrate uh, quickly, you could see here via the application where you could do an NHC um, payment. And this is just one channel where you could find NHC. But that same entity could have a quick pay link and that quick pay link is just a simple a matter of going to any web browser. Um, you could use your JAD balance where you would, if you have cash, um, you could log on, you could just simply roll over, use your credit card, et cetera, and, and make a payment to the entity. It's the same principle within the wallet also that you can, same principle within the wallet that you can actually um, use if when you scroll down you will see you are able to use either your credit card or your debit card immediately um, from within the wallet. Now we could also develop um, customized pages. So like this is the cable company here in Sinkits and they have a micro they have microsites etc. And we develop the solution whether you're paying a single bill and you don't need to and you don't need to first register with the comp the cable company. You could just simply go pull in the, your bill information your account number pay and use, choose whether you pay with the wallet or with a credit or debit card. 
you could also pay multiple bills one time. So you could pay the bill for your mom, your brother, your sister, et cetera. Or someone overseas could actually pay the bill for um, all the entities. You just simply uh, put in the information and add each of the bills online. Now the cable here, for example, have even launched a platinum um, loyalty card, which our solution have been able to facilitate them to be able to, to have those things, have it topped up. So this just gives you a quick overview of how our e-commerce could have you up and running in as little as 10 minutes, whether you just use the quick pay link or a little longer where we actually do customize micros microsites for you to be able to receive payments. Now on premises, um, you could have as many of these and each of these could represent as a very specific function. So for example, you have one stuck on your door. And so even if I showed up at the business in the afternoon and um, I wanted to make a payment, once I know my bill number, I could just scan it and pay. But this don't even need to be on premises. This could have been on your utility bill itself. So there was no need to come there. But in the event I do come to your premise because premises because of the fact that there maybe were a query or something that I, were, that I needed to fix physically interact with, I can literally just simply scan the QR code and make payment. We could also do bulk processing so businesses can basically use an Excel spreadsheet, upload the details for all of their um, employees and make payments. Electronic invoicing. Right out of the box, you have tools such as electronic invoicing, where you could actually, um, you want to bill someone for something as a business, you basically just log in set up an invoice, email the invoice to someone, and they're able to make that payment quickly. We have out of the box e-commerce space. So if we were to go to judge shops, for example, you would note, you would note that businesses can literally configure and set up their own shops and function in this small space so that they can out of the box, be able to deliver services. And this looks sweet on a phone. And this just gives you an idea of the versatility in which the application straight up out of the box that we, you, we can do for you. Um, sorry, I was clicking too fast. Um, churches. Churches throughout the OECS have been able to use our platform, have been able to use our platform to be able to get funding. So for example, uh, a simple matter of here, you could have the Ebenezer Estridge Church and people from overseas are able and notice you could go into details in terms of tithes, offering, the different trust funds, et cetera, for the churches. Now, this is a tool directly available to churches so they can configure how much, how many of these or how little of these they would like to utilize. Um, we could also do like a GoFundMe page, et cetera, for you right out of the box in terms of tools. We are also able to facilitate persons like gyms, et cetera, in terms of subscriptions, where um, persons will put through the transaction and it will check both their JAD wallet and or their both their JAD wallet and or their credit card in terms of being able to make regular payments without first having to um, each time go in and re-enter the information. One of the key features of our wallet, and again, this evolved around um, dealing with um, our customers and their demand, is that the wallet could be used as an event management system where Persons could set up an event, you have event management consoles, you have guest lists, we could process the tickets, we have done football matches, we have done um, catered events, we have done for the sponsors, VIPs, complimentary events, etc. And all these are available within the wallet itself. Um, in, in tandem with us, we, you, you can just simply, we, we work in tandem with you. These are some of the events that are currently um, upcoming right now. Um, we have several of them. Um, on the 5th of April coming up. So that just gives you a real interesting view of how powerful our solution is, but we aim to meet our customers where they are and get them up and running in minutes. Um, persons could fund their wallets through our network of authorized agents, through a commercial bank, they could come to our office or they could use their credit or debit card to fund their wallet directly, or they could beg a friend. You could just send a request to a friend and say, sponsor me lunch. And whether the friend pays for the lunch remotely or simply transfers the, 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 the money to you, it's their story. But, and you can see all of your transactions um, easily. So you don't have to light a lamp. You could download your transaction. 
everything is transparent and readily for you. Throughout the OACS, we could have the money in your bank account if you so need, need be through the ACH, through EF3, um, within 24 to 48 hours, depending on what time in the day you make um, the request or if it's on a weekend. Um, but you could spend the money directly from within the wallet. So you don't need to actually cash out. You could actually go buy gas, buy different, go at different vendors and spend the money as you got paid. But if you need the money to move to your bank account, you can, we have entities which, where you have a direct link where we could, you could just automatically transfer the funds to your account and, or you could cash out. We could do it by check. We could do it by EACH. We could do it by mobile banking. And you could choose the frequency in which you wish to access your money. And 24 to 48 hours after that, or even, and we use those numbers as worst case scenario. So, so for example, if we uploaded ACH transactions this morning, you have the money by some in, in an hour or so. But if we uploaded transaction this evening, you may not have the funds until tomorrow. But we just use um, wide worst case scenarios um, to just brief you. There no, there's no cost to set up with the exception of like events, et cetera. Um, if they are complicated and you require our help, then, but outside of that, there are no costs to set up. You could be up and running in minutes. Um, it requires us knowing some KYCs about you, but the sign up process is pretty, pretty easy, straightforward. You just go to our website and you do sign up. Our fees are either flat mm -hmm. fees, but they generally range in the range, they are generally range from one to 3%. There's no minimum fees, no standing fees. You don't have to pay for any annual fee. You don't have to pay for any equipment to maintain. You use your own event your own device and even for the shops we offer subscription services depending on how complicated you want the shop as low as ten dollars ec a month for your shops um, and that is not in proportion to your transaction and depending on the complexity which you want us to develop for you you we could have um a, a increased shop service um our features are pretty uh, are tiered our security features are tiered. So it's, it, there's PIN, password, remote account locking, encrypted transmission and storage redundant systems and backups. And we have a number of other things that I um, anonymized data, um, um, separation of uh, um, church and state, so to speak, in terms of the data. Now, we are regulated by the FSRC here in Sinkits and, and regulated by the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Uh, we've been designated since 2017 security and risk is, is, is paramount to us. And so we have what we call a stored value wallet. And for a small person who just wanted to just pay bus fee, et cetera, you know, we could maintain a small wallet of about $300 a day where you could cash in in these range. Uh, with a piece of ID, et cetera, we, that could bump up in the range of um, 540 to 1,000. But the more we know about you, the more power and options we give you, the more we are able to verify your KYC AML ATF data, the more power and privilege we give you, including that if you wanted to collect your rent um, and we have copies of the lease, et cetera, we could actually actively, once we know the funding source, increase your wallet size proportionately. Um, our main banker is the Sinkis Navis um, National Bank. And we have the first federal cooperative credit union here in terms of our operations, but we maintain relationships with other credit unions. Our this advantage, one, one I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just wrap up here. Our advantage, rapid deployment, adaptable, instant access to earnings, and it is incentivized um, for your thing. Um, just to say, if you need to sign up, um, you could sign up at jad.cash. Um, you could send us an email, you could contact us here, you could follow us on um, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And again, if you need any information, just send us an email. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, I will open the floor for any questions for Mr. Strong and Jad Cash. There are two questions. Um, uh, one asked, um, can I collect a credit card payment from a tourist using JAD? And oh, I think it's, yeah, uh, so the second question, so the first question is, can, um, you may have explained it, he said, and you may have done, I think, um, can he collect a credit card payment from a tourist using JAD? 
And which markets are you available currently in the OCS? Yes, so yes, so there are two questions about which countries in the Caribbean is, is it available. So Mr. Strong. Okay, um, thank you for those questions. The we, taking funds from a tourist um, via JAD is easy. Um, I think in the fireside chat, I did allude to it, that once you actually make sure you get a copy of the tourist's um, ID, et cetera, we would facilitate such payment. But yes, um, we have had persons overseas, um, pay persons here locally also. So the short answer is that yes, you can use JAD. We are, we have done business in St. Vincent, Grenada, Antigua, and Anguilla, and St. Kitts. Um, we are able to support um, throughout the OECS using our e-commerce solution, um, and we can get the money into your bank within 24 to 48 um, hours, as I was alluding to. So you have a faster turnaround time than PayPal, and so we've been able to support um, our, our clients in these countries um, quite easily. Um, and that we have not had any issues. Uh, we have, if we are to physically go into any other market, we prefer to partner with existing persons in that market um, in terms of physical. Um, again, in the concept of interoperability and in the context of um, not necessarily trying to cannibalize the uh, 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 forcing people to choose between wallets, et cetera. But from an e-commerce perspective, we can operate across the OECS seamlessly right now. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, there's, um, Chair, there's a question. When will you come to Dominica? It's being asked. Uh, but there's also a question about risk exposure to the merchant. Is it protected or backed by any financial institution? And okay. can merchants be based outside of St. Kitts? So I think you probably answered that last part. So what about coming to Dominica when is, someone is interested in knowing and the risk exposure to the merchants? Um, the risk exposure to the merchants, uh, one of the reasons why we sometimes, why we, we said 24 to 48 hours is that we would want and why we ask you to know the customers in whom you are dealing with, whom you're dealing with, is that once credit card or debit cards become involved, there's a risk of chargeback and fraud. And so we, 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 as much as possible, if you're doing business with only people who you know, KYC, then the risk of chargeback and fraud is, 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 is okay. There was a presentation earlier today when it alluded to the fact that the reasons why, say, for instance, PayPal may freeze your account, et cetera. Now, so far, so good, and all people tend to say knock wood. Um, We've been able to um, to to have to have minimal chargebacks because we know our customers, etc., and we we try to onboard them. So we can, in terms of physically being in Dominica, um, we would need to we would want to work with the local credit unions and our entities rather than just simply just coming to Dominica. But if you need e-commerce support, we can provide that for you immediately. And we will just simply, once you have a bank account, we can move the money to your bank account um, within 24, 48 hours. As I said, the 24 to 48 hours has to do with protecting you. Um, if we would want to make sure that there's nothing wrong with the credit card transaction, that the money, there's no chargeback associated with it, et cetera. Of course, the merchant is going to be liable if he is doing fraudulent transactions, but outside of that, no. The money is backed and held in segregated account at our financial partners, so it is not commingled. And as I indicated, we are regulated by the FSRC here and the central bank, which requires us to, um, operate on very high standards as and reporting standards as it relates to our JAD wallet. Thanks, Alex. If there are no more questions, we will move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Alex. And you heard it from Alex Strun, who's the CEO of JAD Cash. We will now move on to the next presentation which will be delivered by Mr. Martin Hanna, who's the CEO and founder of Penny Pinch, which is a digital wallet based in St. Lucia. Mr. Hanna, you could please begin your presentation. Good day to all. Can everyone see me clearly? Yes, yes we can.
Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Good day to all. My name is Martin Hanna, and I'm the CEO and founder of Penny Pinch. And we are a St. Lucian fintech company that provides um, a mobile wallet. So we are St. Lucia's first and only licensed digital wallet operator at the moment, a fintech company providing digital payments, money transfer services, loyalty solution, bill payments, and more. So the problem that we're trying to solve is, you know, everyone, especially during a pandemic, wants the most efficient ways of paying their bills, buying goods, transferring money, without having to wait in long lines or leaving their homes. Customers prefer an all-in-one mobile solution that works whether you're local, abroad, or regional. Current solutions are simply quite expensive, inefficient, and not optimized for a mobile experience. And most importantly, not optimized for the merchants at hand. Customers do enjoy Customers do enjoy cashback and rewards with their purchases that allow them to really you know, enjoy the benefits of going digital. So our mission as a fintech company in, in, in St. Lucia and hopefully to scale within the region is to provide a central platform for making payments, sending and receiving money, and providing a unique shopping experience via loyalty solutions. So we enable businesses of any size, whether it be a small mom and pop shop to a large corporation to engage customers with loyalty products, payment products, and really understand more on the customer via you know, data and analytics. So our partners involve First National Bank, which is based in St. Lucia, and they provide us with access to the Caribbean financial infrastructure, as mentioned previously, the clearing house and card processing. So Digital also has been a key partner with us in terms of allowing us or zero rating the penny pinch app. So customers on an active data connection can well, don't um, consume data fees when using the Penny Pinch app. We've also partnered with Quick Delivery to provide customers with access to delivery services island wide. And you know, previously, Quick Delivery did not accept um, card payments. So, using Penny Pinch, it has evolved their, their business model, especially during the pandemic for quarantine individuals. Um, I'm being told that my background is reversed. Is, should I, should I uh, mirror it? Yeah, the, 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 the background does look, I don't know if everybody else can see it, but the fonts actually look reversed. Um, It's um, your yeah, mirroring. There's a there's a thing called whether you're mirroring your background. Let me just quickly fix it up. Is it better now? No. Not I wouldn't no. worry too much about it, Martin. Yeah. You can just come with the presentation. Sure. No problem. Right, so yeah, with Quick Delivery Day, it allows customers to simply get delivery services anywhere on the island. So let's go through the, the digital onboarding process. So as a customer, you download our mobile app on the Google Play Store or Apple App Store, and you create a free account, either using your email address or favorite social media channels, which include Facebook, Google, or your Apple ID, if you're on iOS. 
So as part of KYC and AML compliance, we do have a fully digital KYC verification. We've partnered with a, a company that specializes in KYC and AML compliance. And in as little as three minutes, a customer could get verified. So this includes uh, a video selfie, which we call a liveness test, you know, ensuring that the customer behind the phone is actually the one on the ID. So the customer will take a small video selfie and then scan the ID. So it's not an upload of an image, but an actual OCR scan of the ID, which allows for you know, validating um, if the ID is authentic. We also do global watch list checks, PEP checks lists, and we also check against any adverse media. Um, you know, if people are involved on social media and any negative um, postings or whatnot. So we do check for our service provider for all these things, you know, ensuring that as much as we're in the Caribbean, we do comply with international standards. So once you've verified your account, you simply fund it. And there are four ways to currently fund your penny pinch account. So one being your debit or credit card, and that would be you know, any Visa or MasterCard um, in the Caribbean or in, in internationally that you could use to fund your, your penny pinch wallet. We also have bank transfers that you could do, which takes one business day, and then you get your funds credited to your wallet, as well as your salary. If you'd like your salary paid directly to your penny pinch wallet, you could let your employer know that you'd like to get paid to penny pinch, and then they would make the, the necessary changes. And apart from that, you could also receive funds from friends or family who have a penny pinch account and have verified and funded it as well. So it's instant money transfer service directly to your account. So what can you do with those funds? So as part of our value added services, you can of course pay a business and that's either in store or online. So if you're in store, you present your QR code and the, the merchant would scan your QR code, or let's say you're online or away from the merchant, you could simply fill in a payment form which includes you know, the invoice number, the branch, what you're buying, as well as a tip if, if you're feeling generous to, to the merchant. And what really stands out is our loyalty solutions. So merchants can partake in cashback promotions that are instantly credited to the customer's accounts. And we also offer a fleet of marketing tools such as discounts. So any business that wants to promote their, their discounts, you know, they usually do it for social media, radio, TV, and now we allow them to, to, to leverage the penny pinch network to, to blast their promotions, send out notifications to customers who have favorited their stores and receive notifications when new promotions are coming out, when it's are about to expire, and you know, just general messages that they, like, they, they can use to engage with their customers. We've, all, we've also built out a rewards program so on customers' birthdays, uh, businesses can you know, engage their customers through discounts or free items, or let us say a customer is a loyal customer and they repeatedly spend using the Penny Pinch wallet, they earn additional discounts, or let us say a customer has not come back to your business. You could use um, a reward to retain those customers and basically reactivate them with those promotions and discounts. You can also pay your bills, you know, all in one place. Nobody wants five different apps to pay their bills. You simply link your account number to the biller and you can make instant payments without leaving your homes. And we're also looking at, you know, cashback incentives with every nature of service that we offer. So loyalty has, has really been our, our core perspective on building a fintech company. We try to incorporate it in everything we do. As part of our money transfer service, you could instantly send funds to a penny pinch account, whether it be via QR code scanning, or if you're away from each other, you can simply use their email address. Now, let's say you need access to cash. You could link your local bank account and penny pinch will withdraw to your, to your local bank account within one business day. And that's through EFT via the ACH platform. So this allows for you know a really quick and and really in, um, ex inexpensive fundings directly to your your bank accounts. 
Now, we know that customer support is a, a major thing, uh, especially with you know digital payments, customers need help sometimes. So we've taken it to the next level and provided many mediums of support, which includes in-app live chat, video tutorials, in-app tutorials, the ability to call us, email us on social media. So we, we, we took customer support as a focus for adoption as they really, they need their hands being held. So we provide those levels of support. So as a merchant, you simply visit our website and we're currently based in St. Lucia. So we're only um, on board in St. Lucian merchants right now. So you could visit mypennypinch.com slash sign up and you begin your fully digital application. You know, you don't need to come into an office. So once, you're, once you've, your application has been approved, a representative will get in touch and you'll know, provide you with the necessary resources to start accepting payments. You know, and reconciliation is, is a major thing for businesses of any size, really. So we, we're providing you with a, a web-based dashboard that tells you or get, provides you with summary reports on your day-to-day -day, um, transaction activity, allowing you to export to CSV files for uploading to, let's say, QuickBooks or your accounting software. And we do payouts on a daily basis. So one business day, we're able to do payouts directly to your local bank account. And for more technical ad advanced merchants, we're able to you know, directly integrate via API or FTP to applying funds to orders made. So let's say you have an e-commerce platform and you want to integrate with Penny Pinch. We we're able to flexibly do so if you're more of a tech savvy merchant. We also provide you with other tools um, such as in-app promotion. So I, I mentioned earlier, allowing you as a business to you know, release discounts or promotions. So you can do it yourself. You go into the back end and create your specials. We also offer you, um, you know, a lot of analytics around who your customers are, customer demographics, conversion rates. We let you know, you know, how transactions are doing, how promotions are doing and provide you for a deeper breakdown on, you know, what customers are doing at your business. In terms of our pricing model on the merchant payment processing, we start off at 2.75% and 45 cents EC, right? So we, we try to come in very competitive to what merchants are usually used to being in the higher freeze, sometimes falls. So we, we're quite competitive and we're also with volume able to negotiate any rates. For our money transfer service, we do have a 2% sending fee and a 3% withdrawal fee. And making payments to a business does not cost you any, any money. That's generally my summary. Um, I would love to answer any questions and hoping to look to work with any St. Lucian merchants available or St. Lucian customers to get on board the Penny Pinch platform and go cashless. Hi. Yes, Martin, thanks for the, the, the presentation. We will open the floor for any questions and comments on the Penny Pinch presentation. Uh, there is a question regarding the um, expanding outside of St. Lucia. So what is the plan for that? So it's only been four months since um, launching in St. Lucia. So we're quite new to the market. However, we do plan on scaling throughout the region, you know, through channel partners and through major players who'd like to offer their own solutions. But we do plan on throughout the year, scaling throughout the OECS and hopefully to other territories. There's also another one in the chat. If you can see who exactly are the money transfer fees applicable to and how does that process work? So regarding the money transfer fees, if you'd like to send money to someone, you pay a 2% fee of the total amount that you'd like to send. And the receiver does not pay any fees for receiving those funds. Once the, the receiver receives those funds, they can either use those funds to make payments to businesses that we've partnered with 
and we've partnered with over 110 merchants so far within four months and you know we're currently pending 200 applications that we're trying to go through and get as many businesses set up as possible and if you'd like to you know withdraw those funds to your local bank account there is a three percent withdrawal fee uh, to the local bank account and you can expect that to reflect within one business day Okay, I think that's, let's see, there's a question there, but I think that's more for the ECCB. If this platform is proven successful, would ECCB be on board to adapt this? So I think you may not be in a position to answer that. That might be, yeah. be on board. But someone asked, how many merchants and customers do you have? Okay, so um, since the, the launch of in end of November, we currently have over 6,000 accounts created, as well as over 110 active merchants with over 200 that are currently pending. So you know what, we're going through the process with them. So we expect to really bring out those numbers as you know, adoption increases. Uh, thank you, so Chia, that's it in terms of questions for now. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanna. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thanks, Martin, for your presentation. We will now move on to Ms. Cillian Russell, who's the senior manager retail at Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So if Ms. Russell is on, can you please start your presentation? Sure, he's Oh, he's here. Yes, good, good. good afternoon. You hear me clearly? My humblest of apologies. I said Miss Russell. It is, oh. it is Mr. Russell. Mr. Humblest yes. of apologies. No problem. Yeah. You hear me clearly, right? Indeed. Okay, thanks. Yes, yeah, so Bank of St. Vincent and the Grandines in terms of our <clears throat> digital solution, uh, just to just to give a, a back, I understand why this is not moving. Okay, let me see. All right, sorry about that. Okay, national, just a little bit, a brief background. Bank of St. Vincent, formerly the National Commercial Bank, the largest commercial bank in St. Vincent and the Red Dings. We have been operating for over 40 years. We have several branches, or we have seven branches throughout the entire country, including three in the Grenadines, and the bank is now publicly, publicly traded. Now, just to, for, well, instead of spending some time going over what is a digital platform, digital payment based on the conversation, I'll just move right into the types of digital payment solution being offered by Bank of St. Vincent and the Grandings. We have internet banking, mobile banking, cards, cards point of sales, e-commerce, and EFT through the ACH. We have the largest point of sale and ATM network on the island with 19 ATMs strategically located around the island and approximately 400 point of sales along with uh, mobile, mobile point of sales as well. Internet banking, we, we currently provide fund transfers, deposits, online bill payments. Customers can view their the current the the on the online banking their accounts and this service is free but we are in the process which I'll which I'll, I'll speak to later on actually upgrading our internet and online platform but this service is actually free to customers now also in relation to our mobile banking platform we look, we <clears throat> mobile banking on the 
or that refers to the process of carrying out financial transactions. This again, this service is also, this service is free and target the entire customer base. The application process is very simple. In relation to cards, we have, we have cards that are in, in the different categories and we have a proprietary card that currently has been upgraded. We, we have completed all the testing to upgrade it to use it as a local debit card so that if our proprietary card will not only be able to be used at the ATM, but it will also be used at our point of sales. Our international debit card, uh, it's pinned at our ATMs and online. And by May this year, we're going to be rolling out our EMV contactless, uh, EMV contactless card. Currently, well, our sister, our current uh, point of sales there, they'll be upgraded to contactless as well. And uh, we also offer credit card, debit, credit card in terms of gold card, gold and business and uh, the classic through four CU. In relation to our point of sales, our point of sales terminals, we have basically two types. We have the, the standalone, which there is no fee relating to the operation of, of that, apart from the discount rate. And our mobile terminals, there's a, a monthly fee of, of $50. In relation to the discount rate, rate it, it's range, it's negotiate, negotiable, it's not a range between three and a half to four and a half percent generally. Uh, in terms of our process for onboarding the merchants, we have the sign up, then the application, we, we visit the merchant sites to make, and to make sure that we are satisfied with the, the operation. The application is processed and the merchant account is, is added to the network. The POS file is received and uploaded. The merchant is contacted and POS is installed at the merchant location. We, we also ensure that we do training. We send out our staff to do training with the merchants to assist them and aid them in terms of the efficient operation of the system. In the era of e-commerce, this is an area that we are now doing some, some we are pushing. The, we have not had a lot of customers utilizing this service in the past, but thanks to COVID has provided the impetus for us to move in this direction. And the, the, the startup cost, in relation to e-commerce, $680, and the discount range range between four to 6% of the transaction value, value which is negotiable depending on, on the assessment we determine what the range, but it normally range between that, that, that range and the application, the application fee, the application process is rather simplified and the e-commerce, the, this customer sign up, the application is scrutinized and any necessary correction, the, the merchant's website is, sensor, is sanitized and, and check with it's the process involving our provider, which is four season. Application is sent to our processors for review and processing, any necessary testing and so forth are done. And then the merchant website is scanned and so that correct details of the scan that then send on to them so that the merchants could ask and review many corrections before we go live once all the all is satisfied. In relation to 
the ACH and the electronic funds transfer, we, we are seeing a lot more usage of our EFT transactions on the ACH. Uh, checks, are, we have seen a, a, a reduction in checks. But the good thing is that we are seeing our EFT transactions significantly more than, than checks. Uh, our, the, our fees on the ACH is 60 cents per transaction and for, for salaries and for payroll and a dollar for other transaction. In the, uh, in the uh, coming up soon, this year, in the next few months, we're gonna spend our time focusing on rolling out our new online platform, which will provide a lot more options to our customers as it relates to them being able to do wire transfers online, do pay-to-pay -pay transactions and so forth. Because currently our online banking only allow for you to transfer from your account internally. But through the new upgrade, which we're gonna be rolling out soon, customers will be able to do the EFTs and their wire transfers and so forth from online. We're also looking at introducing a new payment system that would help to address some of the major problems that we have in the in our payment environment in apart from risk but also the cost and uh, this would assist us in that area and also we are looking at in terms of our origination of accounts and loans to to put in a new upgrade that would allow for the the origination of these things to be done digital onboarding when we onboarding all right so basically in short, that is our presentation. Any questions that you will that you have, you could ask. Now I'm willing to answer your question. Hello. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. And we will now open the floor for questions or comments. Okay, I do not see um, any questions in the chat at the moment. Yeah. Um, at this stage, just now, would Mr. Russell expand or expound a bit about the $680 for the e-commerce? Yes, that, that is in relation to the cost that uh, mainly to cover costs relating to, to our, our providers in terms of some of the requirements that they have. Okay, thanks. If there are no further questions, we will move on to the next presentation, which should be delivered by the CEO of First Atlantic Commerce, Mr. Chris Burns, but I'm not sure that Mr. Burns is actually in the Zoom chat. No, he's not, so we'll move on to IBIS. IBIS, IBIS. No, so we will move on to Mr. sorry sorry no that was that was my mistake that was my mistake i was looking i was looking lower down um yes ibis management associates presentation is next mr morales Esejas. yes thank you mr budu um i think so early on sharing please All right, thank you. Let's see my uh, my screen. 
Yes. Yes, we can. And hear me loud and clear, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, all, uh, all participants. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to commend the organization for, um, for you know, setting up this uh, Digital Payments Expo. It's a very good and nice platform for, um, you know, we always welcome these platforms where we can actually not only share knowledge, but showcase actually talent, um, resources and knowledge that is that we have available within our uh, beautiful Caribbean region. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Okay, kicking off um, just as a um, as a form of introduction, um, IBIS Management Associates. For those that uh, don't know us yet, basically we started off in, uh, last year with our uh, 20 plus anniversary celebrations which means that uh, um, we, we are headquartered in Curacao as of uh, 2000, as being the trusted advisors to financial institutions, as well as um, software development in terms of uh, best in class, innovative financial industry solutions, right? So we have a, a very heavy footprint in the region, uh, servicing a lot of uh, clients. I was happy to, uh, to hear a number of our client banks and see uh, their presentations and even questions. So um, yeah, basically we, uh, um, we have that track re record and servicing approximately 90% of um, the OEC OECS banks um, while um, bringing operational excellence. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, what we do for these banks is uh, mainly focusing on uh, operational excellence in the areas of um, SWIFT in terms of onboarding and connectivity, um, straight through processing in terms of payment processing, being um, taken care of the back, of back office automation as well as the uh, full systems integration. Um, we also cover AML and, um, AML and CFT compliance in terms of screening, profiling, monitoring, but also um, on the level of e-learning, e-learning platforms. Next to that, um, we also, as you could see, have a number of solid partnerships through which we uh, also offer partner solutions or being the Caribbean representatives uh, for these solutions. For instance, like uh, the Antrust in terms of uh, combating cybersecurity, as well as uh, um, Finastra. Um, in terms of trusted identities and secure transactions going through, uh, um, through Antrust, we focus on uh, the cybersecurity and the multi-factor authentication part. Um, but next to that, uh, we also have partnerships that will deal with, um, you know, combating and uh, assessing and analyzing cyber risk, resilience, as well as due diligence services in terms of data network and application security. Um, last but not least, also in terms of uh, regulatory and financial reporting, which are proprietary solutions built in-house um, in Curacao. Next to that, we uh, are also the founding member of the Curacao Tech Export Association, which basically focuses on um, promoting and expediting basically the, um, um, the huge uptake and number of, uh, um, let's say, tech competence and tech export that takes place out of um, Curacao, while um, having that being an agenda point on, um, you know, gov for the government as to, to see that as a fourth pillar of uh, economic income for the island. All right, so uh, as already alluded, um, through the partnership, uh, um, we have solid partnerships, and as you could see, this uh, presentation goes, um, um, will provide a uh, insight in the solution uh, through a partnership with, uh, with Island Pay. Yeah, and through that partnership, we are actually bringing um, together, we bring 80 plus years of combined experience in the areas of not only payment system implementations and FinTech product uh, development, but also in terms of compliance and risk management, um, IT support, cybersecurity, as well as uh, telco. Okay. Um, in terms of expertise, we uh, focus on uh, um, payments. Yeah? So in terms of international banking and cross-border payments, um, we are experts in bank connectivities as well as uh, SWIFT solutions and, and other connectivities, um, like for instance, um, uh, Ripple, uh, all geared towards uh, cross-border payments. Uh, very strong in-house development team who are responsible for our um, uh, proprietary solutions in terms of building it, uh, maintaining it, and upgrading it. 
uh, as I already mentioned earlier on, a heavy focus on the operational excellence and efficiency within the payment processing chain. And next to that, um, you know, we have an um, um, advisory services business unit that takes care of uh, business process redesign uh, program as well as project management, change management, test management, and so on. Okay. So, um, and next to that, we also have a, a division that um, handles and takes care on in terms of blockchain research development and project management in that uh, in, in in that aspect. Right. Um, so, as you could see on the sheet, that's just a snapshot of some of our clients in the region. And as I said, we cover the entire Caribbean from uh, the northern part, coming all the way down from uh, uh, up from the Bahamas down to all the way down south and covering Suriname and uh, Guyana, as well as, um, as well as Belize. Referencing back to, um, um, to the partnership, um, I referenced to uh, Island Pay. So um, as a solid partnership with Island Pay, Island Pay was actually founded in 2018 um, in the Bahamas. Um, they're currently a licensed uh, payment service provider and electronic uh, money institute, which basically makes them an authorized financial institution um, in the Bahamas, um, yeah, where they have, uh, are actually licensed with the Central Bank of the Bahamas. Um, um, earlier on in uh, earlier presentations, I think also by the, governor, the deputy governor, uh, uh, Mr. Trevor Bradway, he also alluded already towards uh, the sand dollar um, um, implementation and launch. Um, and Island Pay is actually an authorized uh, financial institution for sand dollar settlement in the Bahamas, and therefore is also first to market in creating usability as well as functionality for, um, uh, for the sand dollar, which is basically a CBDC, also known as a central bank digital currency. Next to uh, that, um, Island Pay also is, um, um, has a principal MasterCard membership um, under which they can offer cards program for uh, um, um, cards program sponsorships to financial institutions. Yeah, um, need to be noted that uh, uh, Island Pay has live operations um, um, in the Bahamas, and uh, also recently launched in Barbados as well as Cayman. Okay, so um, and the expectation is for this this uh, third quarter this year. To, uh, um, to be able to launch in, uh, within the OECS as well as in, in Jamaica. So if you look at the mission there is basically to provide easy access to, uh, um, to financial, uh, financial services, I should say, um, mainly geared towards unbanked and underserved segments as actually the objective was of this platform. Um, and the population that basically has been largely excluded from traditional banking and uh, general financial services. Um, so um, yeah, so it, it, it is a, a very interesting partnership that, uh, um, um, that actually brings to the table that we are able to offer a platform um, that covers the full spectrum of um, um, basically the indicated by the, by the commission indicated products and capabilities uh, such as e-commerce, point of sales, um, mobile point of sale, mobile wallets, um, card capabilities, um, central bank digital currencies, but even um, ATM smart kiosks for uh, loading of wallets, paying of bills, and other services for um, actually those, let's say, less tech savvy uh, um, um, customers or consumers that don't um, um, necessarily have access to a, uh, um, what do you call that, um, um, all these um, uh, wallet services uh, as such, right? So they could uh, basically also take part. Um, if we look at this, uh, um, 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 this snapshot, you basically see um, a bit of the landscape and ecosystem uh, combined together, where you see that um, um, basically centralized island pay has, in this case, integrated the Bahamas um, um, central bank digital currency called the sand dollar into uh, its platform. And that is basically for easy exchange and settlement for both um, consumer, but also merchant clients. Um, there's the um, integration with, uh, with their um, uh, MasterCard uh, product, basically, so that in this case, the uh, a sand dollar or any um, central bank digital currency can basically be used as a funding source to load funds onto that card, or basically the card could be used to, uh, um, um, in reverse to first um, um, to fund the wallet, okay? 
Um, next to that, uh, we already said um, um, licensed, but um, um, based on the partnership with um, uh, not only IBIS, but other partnerships, um, they're able to uh, um, provide regional settlement in terms of uh, banking partnerships. And through our flagship uh, platform, which is called the Alchemy uh, Payment Processing Suite, um, um, it, it, um, users and uh, are actually able to tap into uh, the local clearing, easily tap into the local clearing networks or, or even uh, fund the wallet uh, straight from, uh, from an account um, and so on, right? So that is then where the payment gateway comes in as well as the bank integration. So um, other than, um, you know, the, the, the regular, um, what you call it, functionalities as we earlier uh, saw already, uh, in addition to that, I think it's uh, um, um, the core of this is that there's a gateway that is really critical, ob ob obviously, for uh, customized reporting for merchants, but also for other banking partners and regulators. And um, um, the integrations into, uh, into the different payment networks, right? I think that's, uh, that's of uh, very much uh, importance. Um, owns uh, basically also a KYC engine, which is integrated and the integration in there. Um, can go many ways of that with that. And um, yeah, basically a number of options in terms of uh, the deployment from a, a more conceptual uh, perspective. So what I'm going to do now is actually show you a live uh, demo, product demo of a, a live uh, um, product. So this video that I'm going to show will basically look at the uh, prepaid product as, as it is now, as it is used live in the Bahamas and how uh, the integration into the wallet basically works. So this, the same of that could be imagined for uh, um, other corporate branded versions. Like if, if this is up, uh, you know, acquired by a financial institution and branded, so um, that could be imagined as such of the wallet and uh, basically also include the sponsored card program from a, uh, a bank or another financial institution's perspective. So uh, good to know that Island Pay currently is live and operational and currently serving approximately uh, 20,000 Bahamian customers. Uh, um, while supporting with their payments and supporting social welfare, welfare payments into uh, um, in collaboration with with uh, with the government, so the the, the video takes a, a couple of minutes and covers the four areas being and oh, you see the overview of the wallet, um, basically logging in, uh, basic features and so on. Uh, you'll see the virtual um, the Island Pay prepaid card, which is actually a virtual card. You see the um, um, CBDC integration, in this case, the sand dollar, as well as the e-commerce e uh, um, um, integration. So um, let me start this. Welcome to Island Pay. Here's the login and home screen. On the card button to allow for the application of the balance. Let's let me show details to raise the hunt for the account number as well as the senior and the shopper. By clicking the exchange Thank you. 
Simple transactions is the simple transaction history view of all activity on the site. I will not perform an e-commerce transaction from one of IOK's connected partners. Lastly, I will use the mobile top-up feature to purchase minutes for my phone. Welcome to Island Tech. Here's the login. Excuse me. So I believe there was a, a problem with the with the sound earlier on. Um, and I also believe that I'm over time here. So um, So Ms. Morales, um, thank you. I think we probably should take some questions now. If you just one minute for you to wrap up. Um, in wrapping up, I think what is important to know is that um, with the uh, payment platform already provided and um, used by the local banks, the OECS banks, um, you know, where um, they also use for the uh, clearing network, that that full integration can be established um, by extending all of this and um, basically the compliance part as well, uh, being making the service uh, uh, available and accessible across the entire ECCU. Um, and basically we're able to support basically large payments processing and distribution like payroll, corporate batches and so on um, um, through, this, um, through this as well. Um, so that's the, the takeaway here. Um, so yeah, um, um, in terms of uh, we will provide the presentation, so um, um, that will be provided and distributed. But in any case, um, you know, we, um, um, the procedure for accessing the service is very simple. Um, you could just drop me an email or a call or through WhatsApp um, in terms of customer service, excellent customer service available with, it, with the 24 seven online help desk portal and hotline. And um, as you are used to, we have very short direct lines to our senior executives, as well as the leadership team for, um, uh, for escalations. So uh, we're here to serve and, uh, and um, you know, um, fire up the uh, the region. So I'll take some questions if uh, if time permits. Yes, there's one question. There's another question in the Q and A. Why two to five days for? Why two to five days for money transfer? That question is directed to me. Yes. Mm. Not too sure where, where, where that comes from, but uh, in terms of two to five days, yes. the money transfer. I, that is something that was typed in the chat room. How long does money transfer take? A money transfer is instant. Instant, okay. Yes. But I think um, 
I think someone someone may have confused your presentation with someone else's. Okay. Right. Yes. There, yeah. There's a question here. Um, and I think that's where it is. Where do you download Island Pay from? And to which devices that might have been in your presentation? Can you link existing bank accounts to Island Pay? Do you have an API? Yeah, so um, for, I'll start with the last. Um, APIs are uh, are available and, and are um, basically also developable on based on the, the concept and the type of integration that is required. Um, the other question was in terms of um, um, bank accounts, right? If you can access bank accounts. Is that correct? Yes, can you link existing bank accounts to Island Pay? Yes. So um, um, under the assumption that it would be one of our client banks using our Alchemy payment processing suite, um, utilizing the already established integration with the core banking, uh, seamless integration with the core banking solution, um, it will just be an add-on uh, channel where they will, will be able to um, um, initiate from a bank account or access a bank account. So the, the uh, fund wallets or re, um, um, reprocess back to uh, bank accounts, those will be uh, possible. Okay, any more, any further questions, Ricardo? Um, yes, I think there's, a, I guess, a question on um, Island Pay um, meant, um, you know, seems to be, uh, linked to the sun dollar and integrated with it um, maybe some clarity on um, the position in the OECS um, given that you're presenting to the OECS and therefore your, your services um, would be available in the OECS um, could you just expand just a little bit more um, on the availability from my understanding from what I'm seeing um, part of the your your, your you really would work with the banks as well. So the banks would also be sort of your clients. So you would be um, engaging in discussions with the commercial banks to sort of facilitate the availability of your service in the OECS. Is that correct? Um, that's correct. So um, just to come back to the initial part, what we done here is basically showed you a live demo of something that is live and active, available and used today, right? So where you see that um, through Island Pay, um, basically the first to bring um, um, usability to a central bank um, um, digital currency into, uh, into the market. Um, so that's what we show here. Basically the same that has been done in the Bahamas is um, easily applicable within the OECS and easily to mimic um, in relation to um, what the ECCB is uh, doing now with their launch tomorrow with Dcash. Right, for instance, so instead, instead of the sand dollar, we could see their Dcash. Um, um, the benefit of this partnership basically is that the majority of the indigenous banks, if not all, are using um, our Alchemy Payments platform, which makes it easy to use ex um, um, the existing infrastructure and existing uh, um, technical infrastructure and the security, as well as the integrations that are already in place. Um, to for this bank to easily onboard a solution which they can integrate and utilize um, their established, their already established comply KYC and compliance levels and integration with um, 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 with their uh, through this STP payment processing platform with their core banking solution. So meaning that you know enhanced KYC, but also initiating uh, uh, funding of wallets and so on through uh, through the bank account. Right, and there's a last question. How can IBIS help fintechs? How can IBIS help fintechs? Um, well, I think that's another uh, another discussion, maybe not for this platform, but in, in terms of fintechs, IBIS is always uh, open for uh, different collaborations, especially when it comes to regional, uh, regional fintechs or uh, regional services. So um, uh, we have a number of collaborations and strategic partnerships where, um, you know, in line with, for the benefit of our uh, uh, regional clients, our banking clients, and in extension to uh, our regional uh, customers, their regional customers, um, for whichever, whatever works and is to the benefit of this, we are very interested in collaborating to make, uh, make this work and, and be able to create a platform and provide 
um, um, you know, compelling and, and integrated solutions to our, uh, to our clients. So if it is that a fintech has a, uh, um, a complementary um, 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 component or something that could make this a more compelling and a more complete um, offering, then um, um, there's always ears and, and, and open doors for that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I will hand it over to Ricardo James, who yes, will thank you. will give some further updates on the program. And I think we may be breaking for lunch. Ricardo. Thank you very much, Judy. And let me just thank you and all the um, financial institutions and the fintech companies for their excellent I believe um, they really did provide um, a snapshot of the kind of digital payment solutions that are available in the OECS, including, you know, from the banks, from the fintech companies, but even broader from the last presentation that we had, um, you know, a solution that involves um, working with the banks and bringing a, a sort of a broader um, architectural um, framework or solution. Um, for the region. So let me just thank you all. And also, Judy, let me thank you as well um, for uh, moderating this session. Um, we are going to take a break, and I would invite, I will ask my colleague, Chrissy, to really come on and to give further clarification um, on when we will be starting. Um, we had broken off, um, ended the, the fireside chat. I do not know at this point, briefly, if any of our panelists um, who were on the fireside chat may want to um, have any comments from what they have seen um, from the presentations um, up to this point. I see Mr. Um, Fontenelle is still on, Ms. Um, Rene is also still on. Um, so I don't know if you have any comments um, or questions, but if you are going to be on this afternoon, that opportunity is also there as well. Um, so we are going to continue after a short break because we have um, additional, at least about four um, presentations in the afternoon um, from NNB Technologies, from SSID Financial Limited, from MCAT Innovations and MP um, as well um, this afternoon. Um, we, we expect that they would be equally um, informative um, in terms of what we have played this afternoon, this morning. So let us start. Chrissy, can you um, advise, please? Okay, thanks, Ricardo. Um, and thank you very much to everyone who, um, who has been on this morning and um, participated in the discussions. Um, we are just going to take a break now. So essentially what we'll do is um, we just wanted to open the floor for any questions before we took a break, um, give the opportunity to any of the panelists or participants who wanted to, um, to speak um, or raise any issues before we um, took a break. So we will take a break, um, essentially a 40 minute break and we would come back um, at at um at about five past one essentially and uh, once we come back we'll begin with the um with the other presentations um so right after um the break we we'll have mr anthony barker who represents nnb technologies so that's five past two please. sorry sorry five past two yeah Okay, so thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, and see you um, right back at five past two, where we will continue with the digital payment solutions presentations. And after that, we will close off because we also want to give um, some information of where we go from here. So we have um, a couple of presentations from the OECS Commission um, on two projects um, that, um, is, that is ongoing um 
in terms of um, further developments, particularly um, in the area of providing support and assistance in one area to the MSMEs um, in terms of onboarding some of the digital payment solutions um, that you have heard of today. So we're going to come back to hear from that because we do have a project for providing some technical assistance and capacity building to MSMEs um, to give you further information about what you heard today um, and what are some of the steps you would need to go through to onboard digital payment solutions. And for some of those, um, for, for a selected number of MSMEs, direct hands-on on training and capacity building to do so. So see you back in about 40 minutes um, at five past two for the, for the next um, set of presentations. Um, thank you very much to everyone.
Okay, good afternoon to everyone and uh, welcome back from lunch. I hope you did have um, an enjoyable lunch. It was a short one if you were with us um, for the break. Um, but we thank you for being here with us still. We are, sorry, let me just um, address the noise issue. So we're going to resume our presentations of uh, the digital payment solutions that are available in the OECS or are soon to be available in the OECS from financial institutions and financial technology um, companies, fintech companies. Before the break, we had um, presentations from two banks and three fintech um, companies. And if you were there, I'm sure you found that the presentation were very um, useful, very informative. So now we're going to continue with our presentation from NNBT Technologies, NNB Technologies, Mr. Anthony Barker. Um, and he's going to take us through. Just to remind that we presentations will be 10 minutes approximately and that after which we will have questions and answers. Um, please um, use the Q&A to post your questions. Um, if you choose to, you may um, place it in the chat and we would still get attention to it so that we can, um, Mr. Barker, um, while he's presenting normally, he's sharing his screen and his full screen, he probably won't be able to access the chat. So we will point out the questions to him after these presentations. So again, so thank you very much. Um, today has gone pretty well, I think, and we thank those who are still with us. And so now, Mr. Baka, the floor is yours to present your digital payment solutions um, as it is available. Um, you may also want to tell us where you are located, where your business is, because that might give some interesting insights into um, um, the solutions that are available and where they can be originated from. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me as well? and see my uh, presentation. We can see the presentation. And okay, fine. You can see me as well. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anthony Barker. I'm currently based in Barbados and currently the UK as well. Um, my firm is NMB Technologies. We are an e-commerce. Our mission basically is to provide robust e-commerce services um, to both of our clients and e-commerce infrastructure uh, within specifically for the Caribbean. Um, we have been operating basically for roughly about 15 years now. And our services include mobile applications, uh, e-commerce uh, software as a service development, uh, payment gateway development, and also e-commerce POS integration. Now our e-commerce SAS integration, sorry, as software as a service uh, development um, criteria involves developing um, web-based application platforms for various small and medium-sized businesses. Now, our payment gateway development um, allows us to develop um, APIs which are provided by our payment service providers, uh, which will allow us to provide connection into our platform uh, for various clients as well. Now, we also provide e-commerce POS integration services, uh, mainly for QuickBooks POS and also for accounting as well for Saj and also NCR um, integration as well for POS services as well. So there's a quite a bit of things that we do um, in addition to just providing a, just a mobile, sorry, a, mo sorry, a mobile and web-based e-commerce application for our clients. Now, Right. Well, hold on a second. Oh, shoot. Too fast. All right, hold, hold on a second. Uh, right. I think I've gone a bit too far ahead of my presentation. Just give me a second, please. Let me just correct. Okay. All right, hold on. All right, hold on. Uh, slide show from the beginning. Good. All right. So basically, what we are, as we are full tech, um, We'll full stop fintech development consortium with local, regional, and international clients. And basically, we provide technical, technological efficient solutions that provide significant value added to business operations. Now, our mission basically 
um, is to provide in the price e-commerce, as I said before, um, content management structure, content management system infrastructure solutions, uh, specific, specifically for the Caribbean. Because what we have realized is that based on our conversation with our clients, and also Caribbean merchants as well, um, payment solutions technically are a problem. I mean, we are doing extremely good work based on what I'm seeing here this afternoon, um, getting this, getting this um, pushed. So I'm very happy with what I'm also seeing as well. And that's who we work with. Now we work with development institutions um, like the Caribbean Development Bank and certain NGO organizations that are in Barbados as well as within the Caribbean as well. Also small to medium companies. Um, we've also developed API, um, using their APIs like for BIT and their uh, money program here in Barbados. Uh, we developed a module which basically will allow any uh, merchant to connect via M money, which is basically like a mobile wallet, like most of the guys here were presented this afternoon into their e-commerce platform. So that will allow them to receive their money um, directly from the person that's making a payment for, the, for their goods or services. And that money is deposited within their account, uh, within, a, within a very fast time frame. And as I said before, uh, the e-commerce integration, of, uh, POS integration with providers such as QuickBooks and NCR Counterpoint, um, what we realized here was that Although most there are some merchants that do have an e-commerce system, um, especially the medium to large ones, but the issue was that they were be selling a product online and then certain customers will buy the product and then they realize that they're out of stock, but the system does not tell them that they're out of stock. So the, what we develop, what we um what we develop is uh, modules which allow um, this type of integration technically to occur within our CMS um, e-commerce e-commerce platform as well. Now. Introducing our mail platform as a product, as I said, is available on nmbtechnologies.net. Um, what this basically does is that this will provide a scalable one-stop technical solution that integrates with Caribbean payment gateway providers uh, to solve the, per the, solve the problem of merchant settlement. Now, um, once a person goes online and purchases our product, they select, they basically select the domain name and what um, e-commerce instance they want to get installed. And once that is done, that is installed on our servers because we actually have developed, um, we have developed and maintained our own server infrastructure as well. Um, we also partner with Google Cloud and um, AWS as well. They provide our, our technical infrastructure on the, on the thing, but we have actually built up the servers which actually, um, which actually provide, provide the services to our customers. And these servers are also, I should put to you, um, they are also compliant, uh, security compliant with the latest, um, with the latest um, releases. So basically, what happens is that the client technically, all they have to do is once they purchase, they just go in and apply their branding and their, their branding, their branding and their the inventory products as well onto the system. But the system comes complete with the shipping, the payment gateway integration, accounting and inventory management tools as well. Also, things like care abandonment, um, we also include. Um, our abandonment and also security solutions within there, which you, which you can use our two factor of authentication for to manage your accounts and everything else as well. So basically, um, what we what we do is that we technically have grown a set of empowered companies that benefits from economies of scale and cost reduction um, using our infrastructure. And the good thing about it is is that they also have full intellectual um, control over the code and also over the website as well, although it's hosted on our server. So technically, um, if, the, if the developer wants to go in or they want us to go in and do anything onto the site itself, we can go in and even make further modifications uh, technically as necessary. Now, our target market, as I said before, uh, small to medium, small businesses to large companies across the Caribbean and any industry. Um, the startup cost range from 750 US dollars. Um, this is a one-time setup fee. And for the pre comp this is if you want to do it yourself or get your developer to do it, or if you want us to do it, uh, we charge you 1500 US for customization and branding. And this is up to 50 items or 500 variants of those 50 items. Uh, the hosting fees are extremely reasonable. Um, we charge roughly, we are recurring and range between 29.95 US dollars a month to 39.95 US, $39 US dollars per month, depending on which package is actually selected. Now, to get on board. Uh, basically what the individual will have to do 
um, is they will have to pre-register with one of their payments, um, their payment providers already, uh, which are included us. Now, in Barbados, we use and money We also use WePay. Um, based on some of the presentations today, we will definitely be looking to integrate with some of the other payment wallet solutions that we've seen um, coming forward within the, care, within the OECS as well. And then after they've done that, then they can register for our e-commerce platform at nmbtechnologies.net. So once they do that, they select the package, uh, make their payment via credit card, then they receive the emails, um, which will allow them to start configuring their system. And once that is done, then they can apply their branding and their, their product range. And then they're ready to sell regionally or internationally as well. So there's no restriction on the platform itself for where the customer can actually sell. They can sell technically almost anywhere worldwide or, <clears throat> excuse me, within the actual Caribbean, if actually within the actual Caribbean as well. So, um, basically our, our platform uh, based on proven a CMS infrastructure, um, which powers 60% of the world's website. So basically what we do is that we give you a platform that's easy to use and it's easy to understand. So we're not going to lose a platform technically like Magento, uh, which has a, a far steeper learning curve as far as the ability to for individual or even a developer um, outside of ourselves to, to manage. So basically a person can learn to manage the platform. That's how they can manage, they can manage a Shopify platform and everything else as well. So basically what happens is that they will select their domain name, uh, use their existing domain name, uh, and select the e-commerce solutions and options they need, register the information, and as I said before, make payment. Now, the pre-configured e-commerce instance is then deployed within six minutes. So this comes with everything, as I said before, shipping, care abandonment, uh, the payment gateways um, already pre-configured inside of there, and any other payment gateways that are not there, we can technically configure um, them to work as well with the platform in, in, a, fair, in a fairly quick time, provided we, once we can get the API from the various payment providers. And also the client is able to access the administrative backend and manage the entire instance via the client account interface. So basically before interface ourselves, which we have developed, uh, basically, the, the client can go in, access the backend directly from their client account. They can go in, uh, even install security certificates if they want to, um, do backups, everything on, on the account. So they actually they have full they have full control um, of their of their of their e-commerce or e-commerce platform. Um, yes, this is as I said. Some just uh, one thing I would like to add as well. Um, we provide 24 seven client support uh, for the platform. Um, it's compatible on all mobile devices. Um, and also, as I said, they also have their, they have full control over the intellectual property of the investment unlike other platforms. And that is what we provide as actual um, as well. Also, uh, what we are able to do now is that in addition to launching the actual uh, web-based platform, we also launch uh, mobile platform which is fully comp uh, which is fully which can be downloaded from either the android or ios um stores as well which complements which complements your existing e-commerce platform as well and also um once you update the web-based platform then those changes are propagated onto the mobile platform as well so both are updated in real time okay um to get in contact with us some more contact details. Now, what I'm going to do is that I am going to show you how the basically the system works. So let's go to that. All right. So basically, uh, this is our main. This is our main uh, website. Let's reset it back from the beginning. Um, so basically, what the client does is that they will go into. They will go into. They can get started from here. So they, so they can um, they can go and select the package that they want, uh, which is these two packages here. So a custom a custom website in the sense that they can go in and do what they want themselves, or if they want us to do it, they can go in and select what they they can select this product. So if we select this here now. So basically what will happen here at this case now, you can go in and type in your, your domain name, or if you already purchased one already from another provider, we can we can just link it to our servers and 
that's that's basically we take it and we handle it from there so basically what will happen then is that in our emails we will provide you with the necessary server information that would um, allow allow your developer or yourself to configure um, your your servers or if you have any issues with it we can start it for you as well so basically we can go ahead and use that so basically now um, this will show us what the available options are on the platform so we can have we can add the um, the woocommerce online integration which will also um, manage your inventory and also update your accounts as well. Um, as I said before, the monthly setup fee is $39.95 um, US dollars. So basically um, that is recurring every month. The, the $1,500 fee is a one-time setup fee. Once you pay that, that is it. From there, you just pay the 39 US um, from there. And that's basically, and that's basically, as I said, rebillable every month. We also have things like site lock security and uh, professional email as well for you to manage your entire platform as well. And we put right that as actual value added. Now, um, in this case, right. So basically what happened from here is like any other e-commerce uh, platform, you basically going to fill out all your existing customer information and everything as well. And once that is done, then you check out, pay via your, your payment gateway, which are your payment gateway or via your credit card or whatever and you take it from there. So once that is done, in the meantime, when the system is sending you emails, then basically what happens is that the instance is being built behind the scene automatically. Now this instance also automatically updates. So there's no uh, worry about being compliant with the latest security protocols or everything along that line. That is already done by us automatically and our software technically takes care of that on our servers. So basically um, this is what your, this is what one of the uh, finished e-commerce sites technically will look like once it installs. Already a template already included. Um, features like order tracking and everything already included as well. So the customers can use their, can check their status of their orders and everything as well. Now, in this case, I've already pre-configured, um, gone in and done some basic, um, So this one, look into my care, right? So view my care. So basically it works basically like a, just a normal e-commerce platform. So I can proceed to checkout. Now this is where it gets a bit interesting per se. Um, right. Okay. Now in this case, um, for the guys that have um, the payment wallets, what we have technically done, um, we have two options here already pre-installed, uh, more technically coming as we speak. Um, but basically in, in money's case, um, what happens is that in money accepts currency only in Barbados dollars. So basically um, if your payment gateway accepts currency in both EC and US dollars, even better, but in our case, um, and money only accepts in Barbados dollars for now. Um, I suspect that once they release an API for the cash, then we will have a case where technically we can operate both in um, possibly in Barbados dollars, East, East, um, Eastern Caribbean dollars, and eventually US dollars as well. Um, so basically, once you go to the money bit and you place the order, And that seems a bit buggy here. All right, okay, fine, Osho. Um, right. Basically what happens is that once the payment goes through, um, right, so let's take that allows me to go through, I don't think I missed anything. Okay, all right, hold on. Let's give me a couple of seconds, please. All right. What this does is, as I said, it allows your merchants to basically set up their store and then collect via any available payment gateway that is available within the Caribbean itself. Um, this could be any commercial bank and money, uh, even BPay as well, I think, which is available in some countries. And once we can get arrangements for any EC uh, payment provider, wallet provider um, finalized, then we can go in directly into this into this as well. 
So technically what we technically do on this platform is broadening the custom base on as to what we can technically offer, right? These customers, uh, as far as your e-commerce business is concerned. Uh, make sure I got the right number. Okay, so that should take care of that. basically get notification. So in this case, you can pay with money, but any other PMO provider um, will be able to integrate it technically in a, sim in a very similar manner. Now, um, in this case, um, the customer has the option of paying, in this case, with us via the QR code. So basically, once they, they scan this QR code with their phone on their mobile wallet, and that will transfer, and then they approve the payment, and that payment will be sent to, to, my, to my account. And also their account would be um would be debited, sorry, would be credited um with the with the 740 Barbados dollars here in this case. Now, as I said before, if we use a different wallet provided within the Eastern Caribbean, then the dynamics of, of it will technically change. But that's basically how it will work, right? And also um you can go in and also you can also log into your PMO provider account. In this case, um, that you can go in and actually pay. And pay and pay the funds as well. So basically, what we are offering is a fully fledged e-commerce um, instance, installable instance, where basically um, one can go and set up within about six minutes. Of course, the branding and adding the products will take a little more time. Um, also, you have to make sure that you are already uh, pre-registered with uh, an existing payment provider within your respective uh, country. And once we can get the API for it as well. We can develop those modules, but those modules we technically some of them we are developing as we speak, and hopefully they should be ready to roll out within the next one to two weeks. So there's a whole set that we have coming forward as well in the platform. So basically, what we're looking to do is that we're looking to offer a mobile derivative of this and also the web-based derivative of this as well. So the customer can also, um, even if he's on the road, he can manage their e-commerce instance with no with no major issue. Okay. Um, so that's basically that's basically it in a nutshell. Um, what we seek to do is that we seek um, just to supplement because the payment providers are already there. What we do is, as you said, we just provide an integration into their payment into their payment systems, just like how um, Shopify or any other any other uh, big commerce will provide any other type of integration into PayPal or Stripe or Two Checkout or any other um, American-based or English-based payment provider as well. So that's basically in a nutshell, but um, this was developed based on the type of demand that we had for e-commerce services really, uh, because there are some stores that would say, fine, I have products to sell, but I have nobody who technically can receive, can receive the payment on our behalf and the banking system in some cases are giving us a run around as far as the cost and everything um, to commit. So we technically provide a solution that actually solves part of that problem, although technically they still have to, um, to register with the financial institution at the end of the day. Okay, so um, that's basically it from, from my end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Barker, for your presentation. Uh, Thank you as well. I questions from the audience. I don't see any in the chat, but I don't know if any of our panelists um, may have any questions. Well, I think there is one. What experience um, have you had with merchants outside of Barbados? Uh, uh, basically, okay. You can hear me? All right. Basically, um, what I would say is this. Merchants outside of Barbados are like within the States and the UK are far easier to deal with because uh, remember, e-commerce operations in these countries have been operational for over probably about 20 years and the legislative and uh, framework has already been included. So basically there's no, except for just the biggest idea for myself, even the dealing with these merchants is just dealing with the product, the branding and the product, uh, uploading of the products into the system. The e-commerce bit, as far as the ability to, to merge account settlement, is already there. Um, or like the Caribbean, where technically now we are, because of technically COVID has actually forced this process forward um, by a lot, by a fair amount of time. 
that we can actually now get to the point that I can I can tell uh, customers here within Barbados or St. Lucia or Grenada or wherever within the Eastern Caribbean, fine. I could build your e-commerce site and I can also now provide you with the necessary payment gateway integrations that you need to get your own money. Now, of course, some people will deal with National Commercial Bank, some people deal with um, credit unions, some people deal with um, even payment wallets um, to receive their money. So that is the type of integration that technically we're looking for. But the fact of the matter is, is that the overseas customers have a, that's not a better advantage because there's some very good talent I'm seeing coming out of um, the, the, the see today. It's actually very quite surprising, but um, the integration aspect of it, in other words, they're easier to work with than let's say a, a Caribbean merchant who can brand his, brand his store and put his products, but cannot um, access the type of payment gear that he wants without some major headache uh, from the commercial banking system. So this is what technically we are looking at. Um, I think we, based on what I'm seeing there, there's some very good progress coming forward. And even there's some one or two uh, payment wallet providers that presented today that I'm interested in um, approaching to get, do some business with as far as API integration is concerned. That's okay. Okay, um, thank you. Um, there is a question, I'm not sure if it's, well, it says, is there any data to back up the demand for order fulfillment within the Caribbean? Um, that person imagines that most people rather just walk in and drive to the stores themselves rather than to pay a delivery fee. So um, that um, question might be a broader question for everyone concerned. I don't know if you have any perspective on that. Um, on that um, basically, or let me let me let me say this here. Um, the merchant technically has two options. They can depend on if the the product is locally sourced. In other words, if a person is ordering a, a, a product that's available in Saint Lucia within Saint Lucia, um, the merchant technically has two options. In my opinion, um, they can actually price their product that actually includes the delivery fee and don't charge it, or they can charge the price for the product and then add on the delivery fee. Basically. Um, on the product itself. I think that's what the, the question, the person who's asking the question is probably uh, technically wants to know. So basically um, the order fulfillment bit of it um, technically is is plausible. You know, so as I said, once he, it's dependent on how the merchant wants to actually deliver the product to the customer. So whether they use couriers, because basically there's a feature within my platform as well that if you have a product, you can, I can set up, a, courier network in the sense that you can, you have a network of couriers, but once a product is ordered online, they receive a notification and you receive a notification for that product and that product technically has to be delivered. So basically, once if I decide to buy a pair of eyeglasses from a supplier in St. Lucia or St. Vincent or somewhere, then basically what happens is that the, the courier re receives a notification that this product has been purchased. They turn up at, my, at the company for the product and then they deliver the product to the customer. And then once they deliver, the, the owner receives a notification that product has also been delivered as well, right? But of course, there is a, there technically will be an economic cost uh, for that as far as I'm concerned. So either that economic cost can be borne in, um, up front in the cost of the product, or they can put it as, they can, they can separate it into a, a, another variable on the e-commerce platform itself that the customer is informed of that and can make a decision if they want to purchase the product or not based on the delivery price. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Barker. Um, so thank you for this presentation. Um, I don't know if you would be able to make it available to us. Yes, I will. I will. And so that we could share. Yeah, that's fine. I would, I would do that this afternoon. That's fine. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you very much as well. We can now then move on to our next presenter and we will take Mr. Ashton Fieron, CEO and co-owner of um, MCAT Innovations based in Antigua and Barbuda. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <clears throat> um, uh, I think I'm, I can't share until the um, me, um, presentation has stopped. Let me. You may proceed. All right, thank you. 
All right, can you let me know if you're seeing the slides or? Yes, we can see the slide and we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll be presenting on Fruvi, and we are powering the next wave of entrepreneurs, individuals, and small businesses with online payments within the OECS. Uh, but before I get into that, you know, welcome to Antigua. In case you guys didn't know, they're one of those tiny islands over there. I'm not sure who all is in the audience, but um, you know, I just want to make sure you know where we are. All right. <clears throat> and uh, before I get into Fruby, I just want to tell you guys a little bit of a story. And so um, in 2015, uh, if you guys, you know, that was a little while ago, Marshall Montano was sort of partying like a boss. Um, uh, we recognized uh, the need, right, ticketing, uh, recognize the need for a local event solution. A group of young men pioneering the launch of the first digital contactless mobile ticketing and events management platform in the entire Caribbean. Um, and this platform ticketing uh, was, uh, you know, worked with uh, lots of major uh, event hosts, um, not just in Antigua, but in other islands, St. Kitts, St. Lucia, um, on Strat and so on. And we work with some of the largest and most challenging events around the region. Um, you know, this is uh, sort of what we were doing uh, over the last few years. Um, amassing over 14,000 registered users, selling over 78,000 tickets, processing over 2.5 million EC dollars um, in transactions per annum. And then of course, uh, COVID. Right, and we quickly realized that uh, it wasn't just ticketing that was in need of an online payment solution. And many small businesses found that, <clears throat> you know, the challenge, of course, with the lockdowns that came about, um, the social distancing, etc., uh, that they needed a way to get their businesses online as quickly as possible. And some of the main issues. Uh, to be able to do that um, is, of course, not having access to a merchant account at the bank, um, not having the technical expertise, and of course, other services like PayPal and so on that are outside of this region um, present, you know, a cash flow issue because, of course, uh, they they're, they're, they're can take up to thirty days before you actually receive funds in your account. And not to mention the other issues, you know, with connecting our local banks and so on to these types of services. And so Fruby uh, was born and it al allowed us to empower entrepreneurs um, from subscription services like Mind Your Business, um, online fitness classes, skincare products, um, even uh, art lessons and art classes with Rodartly, et cetera, right? And, businesses, small businesses were able to quickly get their products and services online uh, through the Fruby platform. And of course, our impact, you know, not just great customer service, but everyone wants to be able to pay cashless um, in these uh, times, you know, makes it a lot easier and so on. So how does it work? Uh, it's really very simple. We, you know, you get onto fruvipay.com, you sign up, you can quickly create uh, your own Fruby store and you share that secure link to your customers or send a digital invoice and begin accepting payments. And then once those payments are in your Fruby account, you can then withdraw those funds um, by EFT to your um, savings or bank account. Or if you don't have a, a bank account, you can also get those funds via check. So uh, once you signed up, you get a really uh, intuitive, simple dashboard that you can see all of your transactions, get reports on your balance, et cetera. And of course, um, you know, if you are uh, looking to, if you already have your own um, website, you can easily integrate with us through our open 
API, which is available on our site. Um, so why would you want to choose Fruby? I mean, every cent counts, and this is a way for these small and micro businesses to grow their customer base. Um, and I mentioned, you know, the reason why I would have mentioned uh, ticketing earlier is because, you know, with the experience and the, the technology that we have when we build that platform, we, we're, we have the, um, that experience to be able to um, beat fraud uh, and, of course, uh, close more deals, settle faster, uh, as some of the reasons why you want to choose Fruby. Um, our pricing is very straightforward and simple. We charge 4% per successful transaction. And uh, that actually includes the bank's processing fees as well. So there are no other setup fees, no monthly fees, no hidden fees, uh, nothing like that. Um, and of course, for not-for-profits not for uh, or those with a unique business model or that have large volume transactions, we can negotiate, of course, for some special rate pricing. Now, in terms of uh, you know, our, our development milestones, um, we would have launched just you know, the MVP of this around June last year. And I would say our full launch came about in around December. And um, we have a, a lot of things that we're hoping to do in this uh, coming year, including integration with Dcash should an OPI, API become um, readily available. Um, as well as plugins for popular um, sites like WordPress, Shopify, et cetera. Um, and then later down in the year, we're also in conversations with other um, uh, businesses about um, integrating blockchain and uh, cryptocurrencies uh, uh, as well. So these are all tools and features that would make it really easy for um, any small business to quickly get their, their services online and begin accepting payments through not just you know, Visa, debit cards, but we also want to be able to um, transact in these uh, digital currencies. Um, since our launch, you know, we, have over, we have over 60 registered merchants um, that have transacted over 200,000 um, PC dollars uh, with over 700 customers. And you know, we haven't really gotten out there, done much advertisement or anything like that. This is all through word of mouth. And of course, this has been built um, in-house by our, our team. Um, myself, uh, I'm the project manager, and we have a, a great guys in terms of user experience design and software engineer and so on. And we're really aiming to give every business um, in Antigua and Barbuda and the wider OECS the opportunity to take advantage of this new digital economy. Um, that has been thrust upon us by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, signing up is really easy. Just visit our website, frubipay.com. Um, in terms of um, uh, you know your customer and AML type stuff, you know, you're know you going to need to provide some pieces of ID, proof of address, uh, business registration license if you have it, um, of course. And we're available to be contacted via our help desk. Um, or any of our social media links at FrubyPay. Um, so I know it's been a very long day, so I'm not going to take up too much more time, uh, but I'm happy to answer any other questions, and I really appreciate the opportunity uh, for being here today, guys. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for, for this presentation, Mr. Ashton and Fiora. We have a question here, are you regional? So I think that question is, would be, are you um, in um, any of the other OECS territories or do you plan to, to roll out these other territories? Uh, you are muted. Sorry. My apologies. So yes, of course, the nature of um, our business, of course, uh, allows us to work with anyone in the OECS. Um, we're happy to um, discuss with any uh, merchant that wants to be able to get online quickly, uh, how we can, uh, how they can utilize our platform to get their, their business online. Okay, thank you. I see 
um, Mr. Well, um, Armanath Nanduri, do you have a question? Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm here as a um, uh, MP Network with the Terrell Joseph. Hello? Okay. Um, okay, so you don't have a question. I know that you are to be part of the presentation with um, coming up. So I don't see any other, just now let me see in the chat. Um, any considerations around providing QR codes to merchants in similar applications that WeChat does in China? Um, yes, of course. Um, we're not we're not only looking at um, uh, utilizing QR codes. Um, in fact, we have great experience with that with our um, uh, previous business uh, with ticketing, which was a fully mobile uh, and uh, ticketing platform, uh, which utilizes QR codes as the basis of of all of its tickets. So we're not only hoping to introduce that, but also um, as well. We're looking at um, integrating, uh, you know, mobile point of sale terminals uh, into the solution uh, to, to make it easier for, you know, just the, the, the regular um, small micro businesses, you know, the guy selling coconuts on the side of the road to be able to even swipe a card and accept payments uh, through this platform. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe you may have answered that with regards to um, someone was asking about, are you available only, do you plan only to be available in the OCS? Let me rephrase it that way. Um, and um, can you display your contact details again? Because I, I think some may want to see that. And sure. do you pay out to customers. Um, so do we plan to uh, be only within the OECS? Uh, no, I mean, you know, uh, similar to, I think it was um, Mr. Strauss mentioned that, you know, we're not looking to try to cannibalize the entire region because there are a lot of different providers and we're looking to work with, with some of these providers as well. Um, you know, you have we pay out uh, coming out of Trinidad and so on. Um, but yeah, definitely where there is uh, the market available, um, we would definitely want to be working with merchants in those markets and really expanding our service to those persons that need it um, in all of the regions around the Caribbean, um, including Latin America as well. Um, I, well. I'm just looking at the questions here in the chat. Can, can we pay out to customers? Um, so I know we spoke a lot about, um, you know, like a lot of the services on here today were wallet services. And uh, we're, we're not specifically that, um, but of course, utilizing our platform, you can pay out to any entity that you wish um, via EFT or, uh, um, or, or, or via check. And so, you know, we can look at how we can integrate with Dcash in terms of the wallet service that they're providing. And, you know, we're hoping that we'll be able to utilize that as a, a, a service uh, within our platform to be able to make peer-to-peer uh, -peer transactions uh, much easier. Um, you know, we don't wanna duplicate uh, that kind of service as you know, we see so many others doing so um, already. Um, but Fubi is really about um, getting, you know, as many businesses online and being able to accept you know, the, the major payment um, services like Visa, MasterCard, et cetera. Um, and we see, you know, um, Dcash uh, and, and these other wallet type services as, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as another service that can be utilized to accept and, and, and transfer monies and so on. And so we see that as part of the whole system um, rather than a separate thing. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Fieron. I, if you can just put your contact details in the chat, um, because I think some of our participants um, who went, did not catch it the first time. So thank you for your presentation. Um, and again, if you are able to share it with us, um, and if we can share it onwards, please let us know. It will be useful for 
um, our participants as well. Okay? Sure, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So we can then now move to um, the presentation from MP, hailing from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and we have Miss Terrell Joseph. I believe she's also accompanied by a colleague. Um, yes. She can do that. Um, Miss, Miss uh, An Amanath um, Nandari. Nandari. So yes. you have Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Allow me to share my screen just one moment. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure being part of this expo. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so welcome to the quick and safe way to pay with MPay. One second. Okay. So what's MPay? MPay is a prepaid digital wallet solution targeting at reducing the amount of cash transactions that's happening throughout the OECS region. Um, and another initiative of MPay is also financial inclusion. MPay will allow for anyone to be part of this network. You don't need a bank account. Um, we are aligned with all AML guidelines as well as KYC guidelines. Our app is solution-based, interactive and simple for both the merchant and the customer. MPay would drive digital transactions across, uh, sorry, digital transactions and payments across the Caribbean, provide a seamless tool for cashless transactions, as well as provide small to medium enterprises the opportunity to elevate their business sales and manage their operation. MPay is, is a registered holding company in Canada and is registered for trade in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The main, the head office of MPay which will service the Caribbean and the OECS is located in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So the journey of MPay. Um, our goal is to provide a low cost solution to customers that are that, so that carrying cash becomes a thing of the past. We were, we were planning on opening or launching last year, but with COVID, we've had a couple of setbacks. Um, but this year we've gotten our bearings together and we will be launching in Q3 of 2021. We're anticipating by late 2021, the MPay debit card and other exciting purchasing items will be available. So what can you do with MPay? You can load funds onto your MPay account into your digital wallet. You can withdraw your funds through any MPay ATM. You can also send money by phone to anyone in St. Vincent or across our regions where there are MPay partners. You can purchase airtime, pay your water bill, your, your um, any service bill that you may have. Um, you can make flat, flat fee transfers across the, the Caribbean as well. As I mentioned, you can pay your bills in store, pay your bills, and you can also pay in store for items with MPay authorized merchants. You can also shop online. We've got that covered as well. MPay provides three cashless solutions. One being the POS merchant, and I'll explain that in greater detail. We have a solution that provides every single merchant, no matter if you're selling like the big stores such as Massey, or if you're a vendor on the side of the road selling your fruits and your vegetables, we have a small device that allows you as a business owner to set up your store in five steps in three minutes. This device, it takes a debit card, you can tap for payment, you can enter your pin for payment, or you can also swipe for payment. And the cost of this small device is pennies per day. We also have a device that's more robust that is available for the corporate clientele. This device allows you as well to go out into the community. Um, for instance, if you're a wholesaler of goods and you've got a client that's in the countryside, you can take this device with you. You can bring it to the store that you're delivering the goods to. The customers can pay by tap, they can pay by swipe, or they can enter their PIN. Everything is also linked to your core inventory. So right away, once items are delivered, it can be reflected right back to your main database. The other cashless solution is providing a prepaid debit card that allows you to shop online, allows you to go into stores to shop and also pay by your debit card or also pay by your MPay account. We are compliant with all KYCs, AMLs, and we are aligned with the FIU. This is our hardware. 
So as I mentioned, this is the corporate device that, that's available. Um, it's available for small enterprises as well as medium enterprises and large enterprises. It's got uh, Wi-Fi. It's got 4G capability. It's a printer. It's also a barcode scanner. So you can scan your inventory before it's delivered to a customer or upon delivery to your customer. It's also a fingerprint reader, which allows for security for certain individuals within a company who would be given permission to do transactions. It's a pin pad for payments and security. It also, you can swipe the magnetic reader to charge the card. It's also a smart card reader. Um, it's got a camera, it's got GPS as well. So you can lock in coordinates if you know, any particular business has deliveries only in a specific area. This device will only work in a specific area based on the settings from the company. It also has a touch screen, touch screen display and a long lasting battery life. You can get about two days of, of uh, transactions um, with this device. Security and peace of mind. MPay is committed to providing peace of mind to both our merchants and our customers. They will be able to access their cash at any time. Customers will be able to access to load their MPay accounts through our MPay kiosks that we will be having across each island. Um, and when I say that, these are going to be kiosks that will be placed in high footfall areas. So your large grocery stores, um, the, the airports, where a lot of customers may be in traffic. And they be able to upload cash into their MPay account, and then they can go and shop online, or they can pay for goods with another organization. Um, not only within St. Vincent, you can purchase from St. Vincent to Grenada, St. Vincent to St. Lucia, St. Vincent to Anguilla, anywhere along the OECS. We will be launching first in the OECS, as it is one currency. Um, we do have plans in rolling out MPay from Jamaica straight down to cover the whole Caribbean, which would be included 21 countries. We will also be having our own ATMs. So we believe that customers at any time, if you want to withdraw your funds, you should be able to go and withdraw your funds. Our business merchants would settle as they usually settle now. At the end of the day, they're free to go into our ATM and withdraw their funds. They're also able to retire those funds to their own personal bank account, to another digital wallet or any other means that they would wish to do. That also, that also applies to our customers. Customers can transfer funds from their bank account to their MPay account. Customers can transfer funds customer to customer um, and funds can be transferred from any loading their funds at any of our MPay partners. We understand that not everyone is familiar and everyone is technically set kiosk. So we will have authorized, you can actually load your accounts and then those customers can go ahead and use their MPay accounts as well. The CEO of MPay is Mr. Karen Abraham. The CTO is Mr. Amar Nanjuri, who's on this call, who can answer mostly all technical inquiries. And I'm Mrs. Terrell Joseph. I'm the marketing director. MPay, as I mentioned, will launch in Q3 of this year in St. Vincent, St. Lucia, and Grenada. We do plan other rollouts across other OECS islands shortly thereafter. I appreciate your time and your attention, and I'm available for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if your colleague wants to add anything. We don't have any questions at this stage from the, from the, um, from the audience. No, I, I, I will be speaking. His connection is not as great. Okay, okay. So can you, um, in terms of the OECS, where are you now? So you are in St. Vincent. Um, we're, we're, we're in St. Vincent. Okay. We're in St. Vincent at the moment. Um, we, we're registered here in St. Vincent. We've gotten some of our technical equipment here in St. Vincent, the rollout, and what we're waiting for basically is our ATMs and our kiosks. Our app will be available in the, in the, in the Google Play as well as the Apple Store. That would be ready by late June. Um, and we are in the process of signing up our business merchants in St. Vincent to get them on board with MPay. Um, for the consumers, 
the MPay charge per transaction will be as low as 25 cents. Um, so which is much cheaper than the current bank banking system right now. We wanna make it available to everyone and anyone. Okay, um, thank you. There are questions there. Um, can MPay be integrated with Etsy or Printify? Can, sorry, I didn't hear you. Can MPay be integrated with? Etsy or Printify. Um, if you can, you can we're looking, that in the we're, actually, we're actually looking into that. We're actually in, in, in preliminary discussions to get um, integrated into Amazon so that customers from the Caribbean who don't have a credit card would be able to load their MPay account and purchase items on Amazon. Oh, okay. Um, what about um, website integration for merchants? Sure. Um, our website is www.mpaynetwork.com. It's in development and it will be live shortly after the long weekend. We also have social media. You can find out more about MPay on Facebook at MPay Network, as well as Instagram, we're at MPay underscore network. Okay, um, I think though the question probably is about website integration, so the integration of merchant websites. Um, oh yes, most definitely, sorry. In our, our the little small device that I mentioned for your for merchants, merchants are able to put their, well, based on their technical ability, um, the most basic, um, as I mentioned, a customer can set up their store and those that are more technically advanced, the integration with websites are definitely possible. Okay. And there's a question about the ATMs. In terms of deploying the ATMs, are there any ECCB requirements for dispensing cash? So that may not, um, that may be a question with regards to um, ECCB. Um, right. We have to take that to them. Mr. Frontinel, Frontinel is, I see, is still here. Um, so that question we have to address later. Uh, but I think the point here is about ATMs that dispense cash, if there are any requirements um, with regards to the ECCB. Um, so we come back to that. Um, okay, and licensed by MasterCard Visa or being sponsored by a bank. So are you licensed by the major credit cards or are you being sponsored by a bank or backed by a bank? We are sponsored by a bank and we are licensed by Visa. My partners, Kurian, Amar, and Nan, um, sorry, Kurian, Abraham, and Amar Nanjuri have years of experience in Latin America as well as the US and Canada in the banking industry. And they've used those strengths and skill sets to bring MPay actions, assist with the birth of businesses such as. Care, Care Bite was here, Care Bites was um, presenting earlier. There's several different businesses that could be birthed out of providing digital transactions. So they came to St. Vincent and saw the need for it. And they've, they're have they bringing over that expertise to provide this great product. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. So I don't see any additional questions for you. Um, so thank you um, again. Thank hopefully you. you can share with us your presentation. And I will. And make it available to participants. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we have we've come to the end of the presentations from the financial institutions and the digital payment solution providers, um, fintech companies, um, as part of the expo. And I, I must say that um, I, for myself, um, have been educated about the, the, the range and the different options of digital payment solutions that are available in the OCS um, for our MSMEs. And I think moving forward, um, in terms of the project that we are working on, terms of providing support to MSMEs to onboard. Um, this is an area that we at the OECS and the ECCB and our other partners will certainly want to be in touch with all of you um, 
um, as we seek to advance digital transformation and um, increasing access to digital financial solutions in the NCS. I note that um, some of our panelists are still on the call. Um, before we move on to the next segment, I don't know if any one of them may have any questions or comments um, based on the presentations and based on where we are so far. Don't want to put anyone on the spot or even any of our presenters um, who are still here, um, feel free for the next couple of minutes to um, just add any additional information or comments um, or reactions. Um, our next session, we'll look at highlights of some of the initiatives and activities that the OECS is currently working on with partners in terms of um, advancing um, the digital financial services um, access and onboarding among OECS member states. So we would have a presentation from the, on the Caribbean Digital Transformation Project, a project that is being um, financed by the World Bank. And we will also be presenting on the technical cooperation agreement that we have with Compit Caribbean and particularly component three. My colleague, Mr. Chrissy Roberts, will be presenting on that. And then we will have a wrap up. Um, today's presentations and today's um, activity, we're very much pleased with um, what we have heard today and the participation and the presentations. As you would have known tomorrow, the ECCB is going to be um, launching the Bcash um, as well tomorrow afternoon. So if there are no um, questions or comments from the panel, um, and I'm seeing none, so then we can now move to the next um, segment, which is highlights of OECS projects to strengthen the digital ecosystem. So, Mr. Imran Williams, um, are you prepared and ready? Very much so. Okay, thank you very much. So you have the floor. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. With the start of this of this presentation, um, I carefully selected about three quotes, I think, that highlight some key areas as it pertains to our move from a lot of the analog and mundane tasks that we execute into a more flexible, a more adaptive and the digital environment. It's been said that at least 40% of all the businesses will die in the next 10 years if they don't figure out a way to change the entire company to accommodate the new technologies. Many times, persons like myself have a bad habit now not working with cash, and then all of a sudden you enter a particular store, you have the items ready to be, ready to pay, they're like, we don't accept cards, only cash. I'm like, oh my God, you have to put it back, probably try to hustle to look for an ATM close by. Those things now might, might cause some serious problems as we more and more divert and evolve into this digital economy. Right. So it says also, and I heard earlier on in the presentation being done by from the CCB, Mr. Fontenelle in particular, saying that with the whole idea of the pilot, it helped person try to start transforming the mind, the way they think about stuff in terms of accepting, trusting, and participating where the digital forms of payment are concerned. And here this quote saying the biggest part of the digital transformation is changing the way we think. Some persons still enjoy going and Imagine you paying your utility bills at the, end of, at the end of the month. You have to go and stand on a line at the water company, the electrical company, the, your internet and, and cable provider. That's at least three different lines you have to stand on. And I remember in the past having those long lines. Now it's literally at, the, at your fingertips, you can, all those payments can be made within two, three minutes, as opposed to taking half your morning to facilitate them. And it says now, going digital is no longer an option for us all for basically for us it's it's a default right now because failure to do so would, you inadvertently would be left behind now one of the things i like to stress on moving there and i like persons to understand i want them to appreciate the concept of what we're trying to achieve with this project if you realize i'm not speaking about the project yet but looking at it from a digital economy perspective 
The reason for it, there's always the, the, the story that goes that a gentleman walked onto a construction site and he met three masons. He asked the first one, what are you doing? He says, I'm laying blocks. He asked the second one, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a wall. He asked the third one, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a cathedral. While technically all of them were correct, but it shows you have to understand that by virtue of what we refer to as the Caribbean Digital Transformation Project, inadvertently what we're doing is laying the foundations of the digital economy. And the foundations of this digital economy entails we have to deal with all and remove all the e-commerce logistics and barriers. Why is it we have so much difficulty for trade within the OECS member territories? Uh, it seemed to, it, it's probably twice as difficult to send something to Grenada or even St. Vincent as it is to probably send something to Miami, for example. Um, those kind of inhibitors, looking at the idea of creating a supportive of macroeconomic business environment, dealing with the fintech type solutions, the very platform uh, items on the platform we're discussing here today. We're looking at, of course, improving the digital policy regulations. Uh, if we now go in digital, we have to find ways to ensure that it's trusted, it's secured, it's robust, it's sufficiently robust that persons themselves can, can trust and utilize it. And if there are any discrepancies, there is some re grievance redress mechanism built into the system. So it's not a case that, you know, I send the top up to the wrong money, I lose the top up and that's it. There is a way to reclaim those issues. Those matters are very important as well. So, and in that, of course, a very key component of any digital economy is increased digital payment usage. Uh, without that, the economy itself fails because that's what moves the economy as, as, as we know by now. We look at one of the very, even more than just the payment itself, is the ecosystem, the infrastructure to facilitate those payments in the event, in the speaking specifically as it relates to having affordable high-speed broadband internet, affordable and reliable. We know sometimes we have issues where internet up, internet down. You're paying for 10 megs, you're probably getting five. And there's no way of measuring the quality. And in the event that you do not get the quality that you're being paid for, that you're actually paying for, that getting some form of redress. And of course, ensuring that the quality you're paying for, even prior to the redress, is being delivered almost say, 95 to 100% of the time. And very more important is are the, digi the digital skills component, strengthening that. So even now that we're moving into these payment type solutions, we have to start thinking, okay, what, what are the inhibitors? Um, do we have the digital skills required to operate at an advanced level? Do we have the digital skills, the basic skills um, re required to understand when we're probably being hacked or when we're having issues with our mobile and how to protect our, our information? All those things are very important. So we realize we have both the infrastructural component as in the physical infrastructure, as in the ability to access it, as well as the skills to be able to harness and use those technology solutions properly. So as we can see in the digital economy, it's all about processes, devices, data, businesses, people. Um, before we had a phone that could have done very little. Now, phones now are, have twice and multiple times in memory and the processor speed of computers 10 years ago. Imagine that the device in your, in your hand. Not too long ago, I walked into a meeting with, 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 um, at a bank. Um, I, I just walked in with my cell phone. And the guy was like, OK, so where are your documents? I'm like, what's your email address? I just forwarded the documents one time. And he started laughing. I said, brother, what are you expecting in this day age? A folder with 20, 30 documents? No, all these things I haven't saw. For me, while he's sitting there, I can forward you to your work number, to your work email address. Um, this is what we're talking about now. Now, this is the whole idea of how we add in value. The, the, whole, the ultimate goal to the top of the, of the, call it the process, is customer, is improving the customer experience as much as possible. So unlike when it had to take me an hour and a half at the water company, an hour at the electricity, and perhaps another hour and a half um, at some other, uh, other service provider, now the four, five hour, activities can be literally be reduced within about say two to five minutes depending on how savvy we are with the technology but again we have to stress we look at the, the we have to create the environment in such a way that we enhancing connectivity we automating the manual tasks as much as possible the product or the service innovation we, we are we fostering and allowing innovation and it's not a case that where we say that well 
The legislation does not allow for that, so we're going to say no, as opposed to recognizing sometimes that the, the dynamic movements in the economy in terms of innovation will always fast outpace the static legislation that we have. So the idea is not because we don't have the existing legislation to supervise, regulate, and control those entities that we should necessarily stifle the innovation, but to recognize we need to have our laws in such a way that we can be very, almost as quickly as, as, as possible, be responsive to those new technologies. Case in point, the FinTech type solution, as it exists in the ECC, the legislation does not, there's no leg legislation to guide it. If the existing MSB Act doesn't cater for it. Certain countries find creative ways of regulating it. Other countries off the bat would just say, hey, no, uh, we don't have the, the legislation for it. We're not, we're not entertaining it. it. This shouldn't happen uh, if we want to push for the digital economy and push for innovation. So jumping into the project quickly, what we're trying to do really and truly where we, where, with regard to the Caribbean Digital Transformation Project is to increase the digital services, the technologies, the skills by the government, the businesses and, individ and for individuals, right? The payment system, we're looking at the, the, the cybersecurity component, we're looking at the, the, the training, we're looking at the telecommunications aspect of it. So we want to ensure basically all individuals and businesses have that power and are empowered by this. With, they have the access to broadband, uh, affordable and reliable broadband internet, and they can actively participate in the digital economy. So as much as possible, you're trying to uh, avoid a situation where you have, even now in our economy, you have a, a significant percentage of the economy that's unbanked. And we spoke about the Dcash project earlier. You recognize that they are both the registered wallets, that's a person who already have a bank account, and there's a value-based wallet, you're going to be able to top up via the agents, where you can still cater for persons who do not have a beta bank or credit union account. There, believe it or not, we still have a significant percentage of the population who's, who's unbanked. Uh, in this particular project, these are the participating governments we have, uh, specifically the Windward Islands. The project is uh, IDA funded, World Bank, but specifically IDA. You would recognize that the other members of the ECCU, um, the other independent members of the OECS for that matter, uh, actually IBRD and not either. So they would come under a different program because of the GDP per capita. So on the regional side of things, we have the OECS Commission, who serves as the technical lead for one of the areas, as well as housing the PIU, the Project Implementation Unit. Uh, that's myself, the Procurement Officer General, the FM Specialist, Scotty. And you have the ECCB, serving as a, a TLA, a technical lead institution as well, together with the ECTEL and CARICOM impacts. So in terms of the scope of the project, I should also stress that this project has two components to it. You have activities that's taking place at the national level where you'll have a, a project implementation unit in each of those four countries that I did mention of, uh, Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Dominica. And you also have activities that's taking place on a regional level. It wouldn't make as much sense in terms of if you're trying to benefit from economies of scale to develop any legislation in one country or each country rather have to go and develop their own piece of legislation for a, a, a factor that's common to, to the entire region. It would be more prudent uh, if, we would, if we decided to take a regional, a pool approach where the resources are concerned and come up with as much as possible harmonized legislation for common areas of interest. So under the digital ecosystem, this is where most of the regional activities will take place. And uh, component two of the project, you're dealing with the digital infrastructure platform services. This is where you'll have a lot of the national activities, the governor-centric activities. So now there they will be covering um, items such as having a unique identifier. As it exists, um, there's no way in the OECS that you have interoperability between all the different forms of ID. So you want your driver's license, you go to one department. You want your ID, you go to one department. You want your NIC or what we call our social security number, that's a different department. You want your passport, that's a different department. But the systems are not necessarily interoperable. There is no code that can say, okay, if you pull up a particular code, um, say R1234, maybe you'll say that's Ricardo, 
And every time you, you pull up this code in the system, it will tell you, okay, this is Ricardo's driver's license, his passport, is this, is that, is whatever. We don't have that, that system. So you, you may have persons having different IDs, different names, um, because we lack interoperability. So with that, a lot of those, those um, issues would be, would be remedied. And of course, on component three, dealing specifically with the advanced digital skills component, uh, that will be on the, both regional and national scene, but the advanced component will be done at the regional level. All right, so what is Ectel doing? Just if I can just run through this quickly, Ectel is going to focus on looking at and, and ensuring there's affordability and quality of service in the region. Um, of course, ensuring that competition um, is, is is, is rife as well because you know as much as possible competition is what often drives the cost down of, of a lot of um of commodities um they would ensure of course in terms of quality how do you know that what you're getting uh what you're paying for is what you're getting and if you don't get it what is the redress so Ectel will come in in that case we'll ensure that we have modern uh, legislation in place to actually give more teeth to the to the entity that you can almost reprimand the service providers if, if needs be, or to take them to task to ensure that what persons are paying for is what is being delivered. Uh, you have the ECCB that are going to be looking at a number of the, or what we refer to as the digital financial services and dealing with a number of interventions, looking at the surveys on what is the case, what is the financial literacy level, what is financial access, what is the access rate like among the, the ECCU members. Um, you're going to look at, of course, a uh, modern framework that they the payment system with the, looking at this, that's the payment system and services act, uh, among some other uh, legislative interventions. Um, again, in the ecosystem, you're looking at impacts. None of this matters if we do not have a robust security system in place to ensure that no one is unduly affected and no one is taken advantage of. So, come to, Put it in the terms of consumer protection, if, if, if you may. Uh, so that is where impacts come in and ensuring that all those interventions we're making while we're fastly transitioning into this digital economy and digitizing a number of the government services, looking at regional interventions, we must ensure we have a robust cybersecurity component in place. We must ensure that our data, privacy, and protection is up to date and no one is taking advantage of our employees, of our citizens. And of course, you, we can't trust uh, the system that, that's, been, that's been presented to us. And in, I mentioned earlier in terms of the advanced digital skills level, looking at some coding, looking at some development uh, in that regard to compete on the regional scale, that's where the commission will come in as a, as a TLI. This slide just gives a quick representation of the structure of the project to ensure as much as possible that we have Everyone is in sync and at the same table. Uh, even myself as a project manager, I report into the Regional Project Oversight Committee, which, which is co-chaired by the Governor of ECCB and the Director General of the OECS, that's Governor Antoine, Director General Dr. Jules. Um, they would co-chair this committee and it would made up of representatives from, uh, from the other regional institutions, the senior reps, as well as the participating government. So as much as possible, we want to ensure that if the OECS, if St. Benson is, is making some particular intervention, that system is interoperable with what's going on in St. Lucia and in the other islands. Yeah, so we didn't consider it before when we were dealing with intervention, but we, we focus highly on interoperability as much as possible with those platforms. So the national, um, the national PIUs are represented as well as the other, the other members of the, 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 what we call the technical lead institutions. So, ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Please place it in the chat. Um, I don't see any question. I just noted a comment in the chat that um, commented that your presentation is exactly what is needed. Um, so thank you very much for that. If not, then we can move on to Mr. Quisi Roberts, uh, my colleague, who is going to present. So thank you very much, from Imran, for that. And we can move to no problem at all. 
to present on the um, OECS's um, work on strengthening the ecosystem for innovation and entrepreneurship, and particularly component three on um, increasing access to digital financial services. Jason. Uh, Chrissy, you're muted, so you're not to study Apologies, yes. Thank you very much, Ricardo. And thank you very much, Imran, for an, an excellent pre presentation that outlines um, a lot of what is going to take place within the ecosystem in regards to supporting digital transformation. Um, what I would do is um, just present a small project, which basically is supported by the Compete Caribbean Partnership Facility but a project that seeks to support MSMEs um, in terms of the onboarding of digital financial solutions. But within the context of that project, and I would just start by indicating that this project falls under the entrepreneurship ecosystem um, development project, which is a technical cooperation agreement that the OECS has signed with Compete Caribbean. Um, that initiative really seeks to strengthen the ecosystem for entrepreneurship development within six OECS member states. And it is a two-year project, essentially. And as I said, it's funded by the Compete Caribbean Partnership Facility. Now, there are three components to that project. So I'll begin speaking and just go straight into speaking about the components for the project. Firstly, we are looking at the incubation and acceleration of um, tech-enabled and tech-supported firms. And we're also looking at increasing the uptake of FinTech services to MSMEs. So my presentation will focus mainly on the third component here today. Um, but just to say that in terms of the main outputs, we are looking at supporting high growth potential startups um, and scaling up firms that are already providing um, technology support and, and solutions within the ecosystem. Now, in terms of the third component, we are looking really primarily at the onboarding of digital payment solutions. So that's the focus of the project. And I know um, Annie Bertrand in her presentation earlier this morning did allude to um, some of the initiatives that will be undertaken um, under this project. Now, the main outcomes that we are looking for re really is employment generation, revenue growth, um, and improved efficiency of the firms. So, I will just tell you a little bit more about that component three project, which um, very soon we will launch um, um, that initiative. So currently we are, are still at the, the development um, stage of that and we'll launch that very soon to start implementing. Now, it looks at technical assistance and capacity building to MSMEs. So some of the issues that we have heard um, in the discussion today we would want to provide more training to a wider um, audience of MSMEs and specific, specifically target to helping the MSMEs to overcome the challenges, fears, and so forth of using and onboarding um, onto technology platforms. Now, we'd also look at, um, apart from the training and capacity building, we're also looking at um, technical assistance um, as well in terms of more handholding um, and providing that direct technical assistance to the MSMEs to help them to utilize the, the solutions that they, they are, that would be introduced to them within their respective um, jurisdictions. Um, and why are we doing this really? Because um, as Annie Bertrand mentioned in our presentation earlier, we identified a number of issues and we've had um, consultations with several financial institutions uh, leading up to this event, in fact, we've had consultations with banks, fintech providers, and you've heard today some of the, the issues that do affect MSMEs in utilizing these technology platforms. So there is that whole aspect of, um, you know, accessibility um, is a major challenge, um, transaction cost. Now, just to say, and you can see these on the screen, but, and the report points to these, these um, areas as well. We're not going to seek to address all of these. Um, some of these areas will be, we, we are looking to address within the project, um, mostly to do with the, um, that, that cash culture, the, the whole lack of trust issue, um, 
the the whole issue of the awareness is a big part of it and and that's kind of like what we focused on and this initiative today is a start in terms of that um that intervention so what are we really going to do as i said before two main activities so the first one um building the capacity of msmes and all that seeks to do in terms of the um you know lower level activities is really workshops um more technical and focused on training and learning you know and practical utilization of tools um, to, to really integrate these technologies within their businesses. So that's what we're going to be focused on with MSMEs. Um, and so the output there really would be the training. Um, the other level is the whole aspect of technical assistance. Um, and this is where we're providing specific technical assistance to, um, to, to selected MSMEs you now to help them to onboard those technologies. Um, and that would involve, you know, conducting an assessment, um, looking at their readiness where they are at currently, and um, developing a technical assistance plan um, to assist them to increase their uptake of these technologies. And the MSMEs that are targeted here are the MSMEs participating in the training. So coming out of the training, we'd expect that would have a select number of MSMEs who would then, you know, receive further technical assistance to really now get down into um, utilizing these technologies. And so the major output really is, is that technical assistance. Um, but as a, in, in terms of the outcomes and what we are looking for in terms of the change, um, that theory of change for this is really looking at the, the increased awareness, yes, um, you know, of the digital payment solutions, the, the also the the increased use of the digital payment solutions um and you know really less dependency on cash on physical cash to to conduct business and to manage business operations so that's that's an important one that we're looking at as a long-term change and also to improve the operational efficiency of of these msmes through this um intervention um so that being said um that would, is an outline of the project initiative that we are about to undertake. But just to mention, and Imran mentioned it before, in terms of the World Bank Digital Transformation Project or the, the Caribbean Digital Transformation Project, um, we, so I wouldn't go into that, but just to say as well that um, in, with, in collaboration with our Geneva mission, we also, and support of the Commonwealth, we're also looking at a regional framework and strategy for e-commerce within um, the OECS region as well. So with, with these initiatives, um, it's about synergizing these activities um, and, also, and, and really looking towards a strengthening of the regional ecosystem for payments, e-commerce, and um, for the digital economy as a whole. So thank you very much um, for your attention. Um, so just wanted to share that project. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Kwesi. Thank you very much, Kwesi, um, for updating us um, again to Imran. Thank you for updating us on some of the initiatives that we are undertaking at the OECS and in collaboration with some of our partners. And I see a question. It is the Compete Caribbean Partnership Facility is the organization that we are collaborating with on this project. OK? Correct. Um, okay, so we have come to the end of our Digital Payments Expo and Webinar Expo. And let me again thank all the presenters, all the panelists um, who helped make this happen. Um, we just want to thank Compete Caribbean um, partnership facility for collaborating with us uh, on this on this initiative, but also on the project that Chrissy just spoke about, and to the ECCB also, um, our sister organization in the OECS in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, on on this as well, we want to thank the ITC and Mr. James Howe for his presentation, um, Annie Bertrand for her presentation. I want to thank Mr. Jody Gudu um, for moderating the session this morning. And we also want to thank all of the financial institutions and the fintech companies 
um, who um, shared and presented their digital payment solutions um, with us. Thank you for sharing your presentations. We will make it available. Um, I believe, in fact, we had um, other, um, Chris, if I noticed in our registration, um, some other digital payment solution providers that came in um, um, later on at the end um, that we were not able to um, put on today, um, but maybe in a future session. Can anybody hear me? I'm seeing Chris is frozen. I hope that's. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. That, you know, we probably at some point in the future have another um, similar activity. Um, but what it does reveal to us is that there's a lot happening um, on the ground. Um, in this afternoon sessions, we, uh, you would note that we did not cover all of the OECS member states. Um, this for various reasons, um, because of timing and because of clashes and other activities that some of them were already undertaken at the time. Um, so we do hope that um, in a future session they will, they will also participate because I believe from our consultations that we had, in um, conceptualizing and developing this expo, we did find and learn that um, all of the member states, um, um, if not all, most of the banks and even credit unions um, are also working on rolling out um, digital payment solutions um, to their members uh, in their territories. So there's a lot that is happening and the goal ultimately um, and with the infrastructure development, with the policy and the legislative and the regulatory framework, as well as the institutional framework that needs to be in place to support it, and the other key players of the ecosystem, uh, we can see um, the OECS being, becoming at the forefront of digital financial services, digital payment solutions, e-commerce, because for our MSMEs, it's important for, you know, we, we have always talked about the fact that we are small island states, small vulnerable economies. Um, our MSMEs need to be able to um, access, interact with and engage clients and consumers, not just in the OECS, CARICOM and in the Western Hemisphere, but globally. And in this current um, digital age, that is possible. And so this is just a small part of what we need to do to, to make, this, um, make this happen. So let me just again thank everyone, um, my colleagues at the, at the Commission, DG, and Ms. Flood, um, Mr. Brathwit, um, for their um, opening remarks at the beginning, and to all the presenters again. So we would come to an end today. Um, we will be sharing the presentations that um, we have received with you. We will also be sending you um, a evaluation form because we would like to hear from you what you thought of this, um, this event um, that can help us to um, prepare better for the next um, future sessions. So we will send you the, I know some of you have also asked about the recordings um, we will possibly get back to you on that because we will have access to the recordings. So it is possible that we can share the recordings um, with you as well. But we will share the presentations and we will send you an evaluation form. It will be an online form for you to complete to give us your feedback to this. So once again, um, it's just my um, pleasure to thank you all again and to say um, and to say thank you and wish you all the best and take care and safe, remain safe. And thank you very much. I don't know if anyone else from our panel has any final words or thoughts they may want to share. Um, this is an opportunity for you to do so. From either ECCB or Complete Caribbean or one of the institutions. So if not, um, thank you very much. And have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bless. Good Sorry, afternoon. Take care. Thanks to everyone for coming. Bye. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mr. James.
Good afternoon, OECSCBU. I see a question about continuing tomorrow. No, the activity doesn't continue tomorrow. Originally, it had possibly would have taken place over two days, but um, it's, it ends today. So thank you very much. Thank you.